Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right, we're here to work. Want to make sure you guys are all ready. Uh, the time is now about 9.20 a.m., so we're running just a couple of minutes late here, uh, but want to go ahead and call this meeting of the California Complete Count Committee to order. Uh, we are just shy of a quorum, but in the interest of time and out of respect for your time, we'll go ahead and get started, uh, but hold off on any formal actions or votes the committee will take until we do establish a quorum. Uh, you all have... Uh, the agenda in front of you, I hope. And so you see we have a full day ahead of us with important information and updates in addition to some formal actions. But before we get started, I uh, wanted to do a couple of things. Uh, let me uh, first call upon our special guest, and we'll be hearing from him later in the agenda, Mr. Alfonso, to uh, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Would you all please rise? Thank you very much. We've, we're, we're now official. Um, before uh, proceeding with the formal items on the agenda, I'm gonna take the liberty of offering some uh, opening remarks. Um, as uh, most of you know by now, on April 30th of this year, I was appointed by Governor Gavin Newsom uh, to chair this complete count committee. Uh, and so in accepting the appointment, I stated that the 2020 census will require an all hands on deck effort to ensure a fair and accurate count in California. Working towards a complete count in California is critical because the stakes are high. As we've all recognized and understand, our 2020 population count will determine California's share of federal funding for the next decade, funding for infrastructure, healthcare, housing, and more. Census data also informs the redistricting process. Literally, our voice in Congress is at stake. Census data also uh, informs, excuse me, the reapportionment process. Our voice in Congress is at stake with the census. Census data also informs the redistricting process. So for anyone who cares about a fair redistricting process and voters' rights, we must commit to counting every Californian. Every 10 years, the task of California completing its part of our national population count is challenging enough. For starters, consider that more than 70% of Californians fall under some hard to count criteria based on income level, age, immigrant status, or some other category. And we recognize full well that there are multiple additional factors that will make the 2020 census an even bigger challenge. There is a significant lack of confidence in the federal government on the part of many of California's diverse communities. The underfunded and understaffed Census Bureau is now working hard to make up for years of the planning and preparation that did not take place in comparison to previous decades. The 2020 Census will ask Americans to go online and submit their information electronically while there still is a digital divide in America both from an access standpoint and a literacy standpoint, and California is no exception. And while the Bureau and the administration's decision to question the citizenship of every person in America has been challenged and is now before the United States Supreme Court, we have no choice but to hope for the best while we prepare for the worst. While we may not know the final disposition of that question, the potential for a citizenship question alone has created reservation or outright fear in many of the diverse communities of California about participating in the census in whole or in part. As a committee, 
we will have to utilize our collective knowledge of California's diverse communities and leverage our respective networks and relationships throughout the state to overcome these challenges and to build a truly comprehensive census outreach plan. As chair of this committee and as secretary of state, I pledge to do my part to reach out to as many Californians as possible to ensure they are counted in the 2020 census. Now 2020 will be a particularly important year for my office as we will be directly communicating with millions of Californians, specifically California voters, leading up to the 2020 election. And given my role as chair of this committee, I pledge to utilize the resources and platforms available to me to amplify the message about the census. I'll give you a couple of examples. The first being the 2020 primary election voter information guide will be sent to more than 13 and a half million households and will be translated, be made available in 10 different languages. We will include a highly visible section of the guide to disseminate important information about census participation. Another example, my office also expects to email elections information to nearly 10 million voters in California that have shared their email address with us. That's nearly one in four residents of the state. So we will seek to utilize this capability to distribute information about census participation as well. As we consider resources and opportunities available to all state departments and agencies, as well as other state constitutional officers, the legislature, and others, we will seek to deploy as many of these opportunities as possible to distribute information about the census. But state government is certainly not alone. As the makeup of this committee and participants demonstrate, we must work with leaders and trusted voices in local government, in the private sector, in organized labor, through the media, community-based organizations, and others to also share census information with every single Californian. While this is my first meeting of the Complete Count Committee, I know that the committee and the staff, I'm gonna give a special nod to staff, have been hard at work for over a year now laying a foundation for outreach and public awareness as the 2020 census approaches. But we have more work to do. And as we will discuss in the uh, report to the governor, uh, the third quarter of 2019 is when the additional work begins of engagement uh, and activation in communities throughout the state. Um, I hope that through this and subsequent meetings as well, we continue to listen to our partner community-based organizations and help identify or address any gaps and challenges that they're facing, whether it's at times just clarity regarding requirements, language access, or connecting them with additional expertise, resources, and partners. One of the immediate items I hope to strengthen is the information sharing across this complete count committee family uh, so that individuals and organizations can learn from others and can share with others the good work that is happening throughout the state by regional program managers and community groups. I also wanna make sure that we leverage technology whether it's uploading into a centralized location, information, flyers, graphics, translations, et cetera, while also utilizing technology to help disseminate information that may be effective in one part of California for use by partners in other uh, areas of the state. Uh, another small example, but I think a powerful one of leveraging technology is the fact that we are live streaming this meeting and we'll live stream future convenings of this committee so that people throughout the state who aren't able to attend in person can follow the uh, proceedings and learn and be empowered through the information and the tools that we will be discussing here today. So while it may sound like a simple use of technology, I do believe it is powerful and can go a long way in keeping us uh, collectively better connected, informed, and organized. Uh, 
Um, and uh, before I, I, I close and we proceed to the agenda, I want to make a special note about the digital element of the 2020 census. Uh, we mentioned earlier the concern about the digital divide, not just across the country, but even right here in the state of California. That's just one component of a challenge that a digital census presents. If I've learned anything in the elections world in the last couple of cycles, concern about cybersecurity is very real, and it now applies to the census as well. And it's not just in the process of individuals transmitting their information to the Census Bureau. It is also, by extension, the storage and the use, the privacy of their data uh, within the Bureau and the Department. Uh, and we will have before us a challenge to counter any disinformation that we see about the census, not just, but especially on social media platforms. So I think as we continue to build on the foundation that's been laid and the strategies that have been identified, we'll have to keep these elements uniquely in mind as well. So with that, uh, let me just say, members of the committee, I look forward to working alongside each and every one of you uh, to develop the plan and to execute the plan with the staff and with our partners throughout the state to ensure as complete a count as possible uh, of every single Californian in 2020. So thank you all for your work today. Thank you for uh, your warm welcome of me. And uh, I guess I'll open it up to other members of the committee for any brief opening remarks before we uh, turn it over to uh, Ditas for our first item. No? Uh, all right, if not, then the last housekeeping item is uh, thank you to the EPA, <laughs> Cal EPA, for their hospitality today and for the use of their facilities. Uh, let's uh, go on to the next agenda item then. We will hold off on approval of the minutes until we've established a quorum. Uh, Let's, uh, let me turn it over to Ditas for item number two, taking suggestions and a vote and on a new name. Excuse me, I, 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 I,
from the last meeting. Do you say anything we should be aware of? Uh, no, I know we have some former convener chairs of those, so I'd love to hear from them uh, any inputs and uh, perhaps to give the chair some um, some notes and viewpoints on those uh, groups. Yeah, absolutely. Good morning, everyone. This is John Bonino speaking. I recommend keeping the name Trust and Confidentiality because it focuses on the primary shared goal of the previous working groups to boost public confidence and the confidentiality of census responses. Uh, this is especially relevant because recent research from the Bureau reveals that the confidentiality concerns that lead residents to conceal members of their household from the census extend beyond immigration status and also include fears about loss of government assistance and interaction with law enforcement should sensitive information be unlawfully shared with various authorities. So I move to name the working group Trust and Confidentiality. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Um, yeah, I think that maybe we should consider uh, trust, confidentiality, and content. I agree that trust and confidentiality are central. I think citizenship it obviously is the elephant in the room, but I think that that goes to trust and confidentiality. It's, it can be subsumed under trust and confidentiality, but content goes a little bit beyond that, and there may be other areas that I think we should be focusing on. I don't know, I'm not suggesting a particular area right now, but I think that you know content is, is significant too. Trust confidentiality. So I would say probably it, uh, uh, trust uh, confidentiality and content. Chair, could Any I just uh, do a point of clarification to make it easier for you if if members have um, uh, questions or comments, if you can go like that, because it makes it easier for the chair to see. Uh, but I did see that Christopher had a comment as well. Uh, my question would be in in terms of content, what would be the purpose of naming it content since we under, in my understanding, we have no control over the content um, of, of the census itself. Mm -hmm. So what will be the purpose in naming the committee, uh, including content in the name of the committee? No, that, that's a good point. I, I guess I, we don't have any say. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think that we, we probably should address content um, in, in getting our messaging out to people. Uh, so we don't, we don't, uh, we, we, it's too late for us to have any say over, over what goes in it. But um, uh, I think just, it, uh, you know, similarly, we can't really, we can't really do anything to, um, uh, you know, in, in, uh, with respect to confidentiality either. You know, I think that's kind of beyond us at this point too. But I think that these are important issues. It's a question of, of messaging. Uh, and I think that's that would be the reason. Okay, Tom. So I think that originally we included content and citizenship to focus on how specific content and in particular citizenship question would impact the folks' responsiveness and and would impact our ability to get a complete count. But I think at this point, trust and confidentiality covers the the issues. I think content issues come up for other working groups as well, where some of our groups may have issues that arise from certain questions about um, household number of members and how that might influence their willingness to fill out the form or not. So I wouldn't want to include content solely with this working group because I think to the extent content affects folks' willingness to fill out the form to complete the census, it's really coming out of all of the different groups that we have. Okay. Others? I mean, if, uh, if I may, I would agree, agree with Tom and with John. I think the bottom line of that subcommittee, the working group, if, if you will, is bottom line trust and confidentiality to the extent that messaging and communications is happening. It's really of the complete count committee as a whole. Uh, so keeping it focused and uh, not specifying citizenship, as I've articulated, I think there's multiple challenges to the trust and confidence uh, that we have to grapple with going into 2020. So I support John's uh, suggestion of the name. Anyone else? All right, we need to take a vote on this. Is there a formal motion? John has moved. I, I move to name the working group. <laughs> All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, without objection, do we need a roll call vote on this? 
No objection. No objection. Okay, unanimous vote. Thank you very much. Takes us to. Are we, take, are we not taking a roll call vote? There was no objection. Unanimous vote. I, my my attorney is telling me we have to take a roll call vote. Okay, let's call the roll. Okay, Secretary Padilla. Uh, yes. Uh, Sewing Bant. Aye. Carolyn Coleman. Yes. Kathleen Domingo. Nicholas Hatton. Yes. Lisa Hershey. Aye. John Donino. Yes. Jesus Martinez. Yes. Gerald McIntyre. Yes. Eloy Oakley. Aye. Tom Sines. Aye. Lee Salter. Aye. Regina Brown Wilson. Yes. Christopher Wilson. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Okay, motion carries. Name is finalized and adopted. We now move on to agenda item number three, a report to the governor's office. Uh, we have uh, itemized on the agenda, not just a presentation of the report, but we can review and discuss the draft before us, which includes some uh, final recommendations. We will uh, vote on the final draft of the report to be submitted. I hope you've all had an opportunity to review the report prior to this morning, so we're not wordsmithing in too much detail in real time, uh, but uh, you know, this is an important element of the work of this committee to give the governor's office and the administration an update on the work of the committee to date uh, and the roadmap for what lies ahead in the next uh, three to six months. So let me turn it over to staff to present. Okay, thank you. Nice to see you all again. Again, by, as a reminder, my name is Dave Sepos. I'm a managing senior mediator with the California State University Sacramento's Consensus and Collaboration Program. And as many of you know, we serve as support staff to you all, and I've worked as a facilitator with, with you all in prior meetings. Nice to, to be back. I um, want to first apologize to the members of the public that I have my back towards you. I apologize for that as, as we go through this. Um, to reiterate, uh, on a, a report like this, I was asked to step back in and sort of facilitate you all through the process uh, of reviewing the document and then ultimately uh, approving it. I want to go through the procedural steps, not only to remind those of you that have, have uh, been down this process before, but knowing that we have some, some new members. Uh, this, uh, like all of your actions, is a Bagley Keen action, so it will ultimately be a roll call vote. Um, what I will do in just a minute is literally direct your attention to the document and I will go section by section. I will not call by page number. I will do section by section and paragraphs that were in since everybody's pagination sometimes changes uh, depending on how they printed it. I will call each section and basically look to you all to open up the floor for any editorial comments that you would like to make on the draft document that we have. I will make notations of it and as I do so, so too will staff including my colleague Alex Cole Weiss from uh, who is waving her hand to who's doing officially note taking for today. We will do uh, edits, however, similar to what uh, your chairman just said. Uh, should we have significant uh, editorial changes, what I will look to do is ensure that we, myself, and, and Alex as the official note taker have captured the, the essence, if you will, of an adjustment, but we'll seek to not have to go truly into word by word, line by line, uh, punctuation by punctuation, wordsmithing. Uh, if it is need be that we do that on a particular item, we'll, uh, we'll call an audible on that when we need to, but otherwise we'll, we'll try to sort of check in and make sure we have the gist of what you're looking for an adjustment and then we'll move on. I'm gonna move at a fairly rapid pace. For those of you that have done this before, you know that, so I'm gonna try to keep us moving at a pretty good clip. On completion of uh, your review of the document, I will check in with you and throughout the process I will call for what is opposition. So for any adjustments, just be aware that I will ask is anybody opposed to a particular change? That way we're ensured that if there is some difference of opinion, we're testing it out based upon opposition rather than me just saying is everybody okay with that? Because everybody okay with that is a little too vague. On completion, I will review all the adjustments and then I will ask for a straw poll and it will be worded essentially, if you were to vote on this right now, would you approve the document as edited and as changed? I'm doing that straw poll first so that when we hand it over to the uh, chairman for final roll call vote, we don't have to interrupt any procedural steps. So just know that I will call a straw poll. It will be non-binding, but that will assess and make sure that we have shared agreement. And after that point, 
I will then turn it over to your chairman, who will then officially and formally call the Bagley Keene vote with assistance from staff. Any questions? All right. <laughs> Thank you, Cam. <laughs> All right. Moving on then. Table of contents. Any edits that anybody would like to make? Hearing none and seeing none. Moving to section one, background. First header, the California Complete Count Committee header. Between that and the next header, so just the California Complete Count Committee section. Are there any adjustments that any members would like to make to that section? Hearing none and seeing none. Next section, committee work program, four goals for 2019. Any adjustments to that section? Hearing none and seeing none. The next section, governor's appointment of new complete count committee chair. Hearing none and seeing none. <laughs> As I absolutely agree with that oh, section. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ms. Wilson. Sorry, my apologies. <laughs> A little too quick of a clip. Uh, just a, a question uh, around uh, committee transitions, if that needs to be noted anywhere, if we had any committee transitions or anticipated transitions um, before the report is submitted. Particularly any uh, chair chairperson changes or just or the- committee members as well, adding- Oh, okay, the additions, yes sir, okay. Anybody opposed to ensuring that we, we include into here language about the new committee adjustments? Okay, we'll make sure that in that section that we've, we've notated. Thank you, thank you, sir. All right, moving on then to uh, section two, committee activities completed. One, one thing also I, I failed to mention, I apologize, is that after we call for the straw poll, I will then open up the floor for public comment, both here and then I will check in with Laura Askins who will be tracking public comment that might be coming in online. Just as a reminder, there's no open phone line so uh, feedback that's coming in online will be brought in through the chat function. So those of you in the web world that are uh, tracking this meeting, watching it online and or participating via web, please know that if you choose to make any public comments on this item, please do so on the chat function. Okay, again, um, committee activities completed, March 2, 2019 quarterly meeting. Any adjustments to that section? And that would bring us all the way a couple pages down to the update. That would be backfilled ultimately after today on today's meeting, uh, which on my page is paginated to page four. But but bottom line is that that's a like a page and a half, two page section. Any adjustments to that, those sections? Hearing none and seeing none, we will have the June 29 quarterly meeting. So there will just be some brief content that will be added to that as the outcomes of today's meeting. Uh, moving on, then quarters one and two, the Get Smart educational webinars, the updates. Any update or any adjustment to that section? Moving on, January 30, 2019, group quarters presentation. Moving on, February 20th, 2019, session that was held. Any updates on that section? Being very accommodating group today. <laughs> All right, uh, moving on to March 1st, 2019. Protecting the confidentiality of 2020 census statistics. Any adjustments to that section? Yes, uh, this section we should add one additional presenter. We also had uh, Stephen Buckner, who's the Assistant Director of Communications at the US Census Bureau. Okay. Do you recall or does staff recall is Stephen with a PH or a V? Or we can look that up. PH. Thank you. Okay, so we'll update that. Moving on to the March 29th event, overview of 2020 census non-English language support. Any adjustments to that section? March 19th. March 19th. I'm sorry, March 19th. What did I say? Well, it doesn't matter what I said. Obviously, I made a mistake. <laughs> March 19th, any adjustments to that section? Uh, okay, moving on to um, April 30, 2019. Uh, there was a note uh, within, within internally that there was a link that we needed to update to a recording that was held on that. So I'm just I'm, I'm letting you know that editorially that that's not showing on the version that we see, but we're we're make sure that we have that link to the recording provided. So any adjustments on the April 30, 2019? Yes, Sewing. So, so it was webinar and it was recorded. So you're talking about a link that if they get to report electronically, they can click on it and it'll take them to the webinar? 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. If that's available for any of the other ones as well, you could do the same. If not, then if, we, if I could ask that we do that in the future so that if folks who want to access and who couldn't can click on it and get it. Laura? Not all of the webinars were recorded. So the, the ones that were recorded, we will provide links in the document. Thank you. And, and I would request if it's possible for, if it's available to be recorded, uh, that we would. On a go forward basis, you're meaning? That is our plan moving forward. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, any other adjustments to the April 30 section? June, July um, uh, message testing webinar, which is a to be determined. Has that date been set, that, set yet then? So, Laura? So. No, it has not. I think, I think we're still working on that one. Okay. Yes. So we'll be, we'll be publishing this more than likely prior to that date being noted. So we'll, that'll remain as a to be determined. Is that correct? I believe that's correct. Okay. So just be aware, those members, when you vote on that, that'll, that'll remain un, undefined. And so uh, if that's the case, I imagine the uh, language would be modified so that it's not past tense, <laughs> but future. Yes. Good point. Thank you. Okay, um, moving on then to the quarter two, document your influence activities, the intended uh, activities for, the, for this quarter, the current quarter that we're in, or any adjustments to that section. There'll be some perhaps minor modifications to that section just based solely on updates from today's actual meeting, but other than that, that should remain intact. All right, moving on to full section three, upcoming committee plans. Sure. Can comment from Lisa? I'm sorry, yes, go ahead, Lisa. I just wanna go back. I am a little uncomfortable with we've documented all of our networks, influencers, and trusted messengers. I believe we still have some more work to do there, so I, in the process of, I would be more comfortable with. Thank you. So that's the line where it says they documented all of the networks. You'd prefer it to something like they documented several networks or something to that effect, or? I'm open to, I just that word all. Just, just yeah. remove the word all. You just, you know, a little where too. It, where it, go ahead, Christopher. It, the language suggests that the work is done mm -hmm. and it's still in process. I think that's what she yes. wants to reflect. Okay. I think if we move towards a, has begun to document, but um, is there a time frame for completion of this effort? Uh, you're speaking still under quarter two, or I, I'm sorry, Secretary, again, tell me where you're pointing to. Yeah, no, I, I'm just listening to the comments that have begun. So mm -hmm. this process has begun, but it's not completed. Right. Right. We know that it's an important part of informing the strategy and the plans. So very appropriate to recognize that it has begun, maybe even by most of the partners and organizations, but it's not completed yet. That's the point. I'm just asking by when we expect this to be completed. Oh, I'm sorry. Didis, would you, do you care to respond? To respond? That? I, you know, I, we committed to completing it uh, by the end of June, and I know this report is supposed to go in at the end of June, uh, so that is our intention. Okay. I'm just a little uncomfortable with that language right now. Um, I think we can phrase it exactly that way, with the goal of completing it by the end of June. Uh, and then we'll stay on staff and others <laughs> to encourage and us. Thank you, Secretary. Yes. completion. Okay, very good. Any further adjustments under that section, the quarter two, documenting your influence section? So what we have is um, striking the word all, we're gonna, I'm gonna suggest we change that to many, just to reflect that, that, that many were done, but it's not all encompassing. There will be language that will be added that this is this remains a work in pro progress, in process, um, it's already started, and that the intention is for um, staff and the committee to complete this work by the end of June 2019. All right. Moving then into section three, upcoming committee plans, uh, quarter three, engage and activate activities. Any adjustments to that section? And then lastly, any adjustments to Appendix A, which is a membership list? Not to Appendix A, sorry, going back to the upcoming committee plans, not a revision quite yet, but a question that might call for a revision. Uh, we make mention of upcoming events, activities, et cetera. Is there a centralized, constantly updated schedule of such meetings, workshops, events, et cetera, 
that we can either add a link to or as an additional appendix as part of this report? Yes, I see staff members shaking their heads yes. Yes, we can add the link um, to the website, which has all the implementation plan workshops on there. Okay, so one centralized, all-inclusive, regularly updated source. Yes, I'd look to my comms team, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I think uh, adding a reference to that would be appropriate. Okay, very good. Christopher? Yeah, I'm sorry, going back to quarter two, document your influence in the last paragraph, it reads, in addition, committee members are helping spread the word about census jobs in order to help recruit enumerators and translators. Uh, can we expand that to help recruit, just to say, to help recruit um, culturally competent uh, and linguistic expertise within the communities targeted? Because we're not just helping recruit enumerators and, and linguistic experts or translators. We're also looking at field managers and regional managers, and, and we're posting all the jobs that come out for the census. So, what age uh, was that? Uh, the, so this, page this, this, we're nine. talking about the, the last paragraph under quarter two, document your influence. Uh, this is a sentence that says, in addition, committee members are helping to spread the word about census jobs in order to help recruit enumerators and translators who are culturally competent and have the linguistic expertise to communicate with specific HTC populations. So you're looking for an adjustment in how? To, uh, well, as written, it limits our postings to enumerators and uh, translators. So we're only helping to recruit enumerators and translators, which is not true. We're helping to recruit into all of the jobs that the census posts in our in our area. So you would you would want that changed? You would want to include enumerators and translators, but then expand it as well as all other census staff, or how do you want that? Expanded? Sure, that that makes sense. I think the the goal is to get culturally competent and linguistic expertise into as many census jobs as possible. So, so me as a, a trusted messenger in my community, I'm not just trying to get people to be an enumerator or, or a, a translator. If, I, if there's someone qualified to be a field manager or a regional manager, I'm trying to get them into those jobs as well. And they bring their language expertise and they bring their cultural competence to those jobs as well. Okay, let me just check with uh, Didis, will it be accurate? I mean, it, I'm not presuming it wouldn't, but, but since we'll be broadening this inquiry to not just enumerators and translators, so we'll be basically lumping all pursuit of all census staff to have these, these ideal you know, qualifications, that will be accurate? Yes, and I have Al here who is very happy that you're helping, <laughs> helping us recruit. Absolutely. And so is he saying that that's the committee's role or we're just kind of helping out? Well, it's saying committee members are helping to spread the word about census jobs, but then I think that what Mr. Olson is saying is that what's then being said is that the definition of the qualifications for those jobs is rather than just enumerators and translators, those categories as well as all census staff are being looked to to bring qualifications regarding cultural competency and, and linguistic skills. Nice. But that's not, that's not the committee's job. Your job is to be spreading that. So the, the, the actionable verb, if you will, is the are helping to spread. No, 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 and I get that. I just, I'm, I'm just wondering if everybody has the capacity to do that in terms of if that's what they do with their day job, in terms of, you know what I mean? Like, I, I get some and then I'll send it out as, as maybe somebody sends me something in Solano County. I'm just wondering, are we saying that we're committing to um, our roles on the board to making sure that we're pushing that message out or is there also an overarching plan that the feds are also responsible for because it's actually a day job for somebody. Mm. It's a marketing job and I don't want to be um, responsible for a word of mouth because then you get a word of mouth pool and when you get a word of mouth pool, you leave out a lot of people. So I just, I mean, I get if we're just saying that we're just doing it as that, but maybe that's a, that's a different conversation but I just want to make sure that the committee members are not the ones that are just responsible. Par partially yes or no. We can have a more detailed conversation with Mr. Fontenot in, in a few minutes. Uh, it is the formal job of the Bureau to recruit, train, retain, et cetera, uh, workers. But if we can supplement the outreach for available uh, jobs, then that certainly is in the interest of this committee and the state. We could, I mean, if I may offer a suggestion is, um, in that paragraph where it says, in addition, 
uh, could be phrased to say, in addition to formal activities by the US, US Census Bureau, committee members are helping. So that would identify that the, re the official responsibility is by the US Census Bureau, but that committee members are helping. If that that's, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is Zoe speaking. When we say uh, translators, I just want to make sure we, translators are usually written form. Do we mean oral form? So you mean interpreters and translators? Like what are the, you guys mean interpreters or translators? As we get into the language program, one thing that would be very helpful is people who can assist in areas where their language isolated, yes. with oral, translation okay Not, and if they're working on our pre guides that we put out they can assist in written but the guides are in the languages so if they can assist people understanding the concepts and understanding it in the communities that's an assist to us yeah, this is so speaking i think we just want to make sure we use the correct terms in the no, I think those terms work oh no I, it was my question I, I think the original question on this whole issue was expanding it beyond just enumerators to other census positions. And I think that was extremely valid right. because we're, we just welcome any guidance, assistance, and, and input that people have that say, here are other people who are available for census jobs, for right. a whole range of census jobs. I want to be in complete support of that, but I want to make sure we use the right word yes. so that the, the interpreter in communities for folks who do interpretation, when you consult and when you contract with people, it's interpreting. And if you consult and contract with them to do translation, you're actually having them translate written words. So I want to make sure that we're using the term. Uh, we are not recruiting translators formally in the community. So translators generally are working out of headquarters to develop the original documentation. So you're correct. Yes. Right. So we, we mean interpretation and translation. Yes. Okay. Would it be helpful? I mean, do we want to get that specific or would it be helpful to just say help recruit uh, census employees who are culturally competent and have the linguistic expertise within the communities targeted to communicate with a specific HTC population. Right back to my that original be, suggestion. That, 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 okay? that would be great. <laughs> Make that statement. Right, because so then if you are going to use it, use both, but if you're not going to use it, then then that, I like that. Okay, I have that written if Alex needs that. Okay, um, Jerry. Uh, can you turn your microphone on, please? I'm sorry. I think it would be good to to actually refer specifically to interpreters because that is needed, and that is something where there could be help, where some people can help, not everybody, but some. Well, some. let me let me double check because we've we've um, gone from splitting to lumping. <laughs> so uh, the the language as as written or spoken to by Director Katagi is just defining it to help recruit census employees writ large, with, and then with the qualifiers of who are culturally competent and have linguistic expertise. So let me go to Mr. Wilson, and then I'm sorry, I cannot read your placard from him. Nicholas. Nicholas. Yeah, I just, I want to be clear. My original point was that we are not just helping to recruit enumerators and translators or interpreters, whichever word. So maybe if we take those two specific job titles out right. and just say we are helping to recruit personnel to U.S. Census jobs, because when, when the regional uh, manager job posting came out, I sent that out to friends and to my network and to colleagues. When the field manager job recently got posted, I sent that out. Those are not enumerators, translators, or interpreters. And so I think we're doing more than just looking for people for those two jobs. We're trying to fill all of the jobs with culturally competent people, with folks who have linguistic expertise, because those are the communities we'll be in and they'll be hard to count. Right. So let me go to Mr. Nichols and then I wanna come back to that sentence and check in with the prior comment as well and see if the more globalizing statement is sufficient. I just have reservations um, with the use of who have um, cultural um, competency because I think of something like um, using proper pronouns which while ideally we will all be on the same page, um, I can't help but think that experts within one community aren't going to be up to speed on something like proper pronouns and that they're need to going to be trained um, to be competent on LGBT plus um, pronouns. And so I would hope that and look forward to discussing with the gentleman what our plan is to make sure um, that across the board, all employees are working on census 
um, are properly trained on LGBT um, competency. So the, 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 again, the specific language as it is is not have but are, who are culturally competent and, and have the linguistic expertise. So is there an adjustment you would want to make to that, Ben? I'm so no, I think the second part of that covers it. Okay. Thank you. So uh, now I want to come back to just the, the lumping or the splitting part. If the statement is, um, I'm just going to read as amended, okay, currently. In addition to formal activities by the United States Census Bureau, Committee members are helping to spread the word about census jobs in order to help recruit census employees who are culturally competent and have the linguistic expertise to communicate with specific HTC populations. Is anybody opposed to that sentence? Okay, hearing none and seeing none, we will move on then. Are there any, before I go back and do a final review of the adjustments made thus far, are there any other adjustments that members would choose to make? Okay, going back to the top then, what I will do is I'll review these comments. I'll call the straw polls I asked. Dave, yes, Ms. Coleman. Dave, before you, before you move forward, just one other. On page 11 with the committee membership, I would just encourage us to add the same correction there that we did earlier if there are new committee members to include them on this list. Thank you. This is so, I'm not sure why, but we're having a hard time hearing each other. So I don't know, it's because we're not speaking in the phone itself. It seems that they can hear us, but I'm having a hard time hearing folks over there. Okay. We're hearing, we're hearing you fine down here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so again, I'm gonna go through the adjustments made, check in with you with a straw poll, then we'll open up the floor for public comment here. We'll check in if there's any public comment online that Laura will read from online. Uh, Mr. Wilson, did you have another comment or is your table tent up? Thank you. All right, we will adjust under the March 1st uh, to add Stephen Buckner. Was it Buckner, John? Was it Stephen Buckner from US, US Census Bureau? That's right. Okay, um, that he was involved. Um, under the April 30th section, and just as going forward, when we if we get a link and we have the link for that recording, we'll add that on a go forward basis. Has been recommended that that such links be provided for all subsequent activities. Uh, for the June July uh, date to be determined, we will not have a date uh, completed or identified before the likely publication of documents. So that will remain to be uh, to be determined, and therefore it'll be written in future tense rather than past tense. Uh, under quarter two, under the first paragraph, um, the sentence they documented will now say they documented many of their networks rather than all. The last paragraph, again, just to reiterate, will be worded in, in addition to formal activities by the U.S. Census Bureau, committee members are helping to spread the word about census jobs in order to help recruit census employees who are culturally competent and have the linguistic expertise to communicate with specific HTC populations. Under uh, that section, it will also be identified that this is a work in progress and that the intention of the committee is to complete this work by the end of June 2019. Under section three, quarter three, we'll make sure that we have added a link uh, regarding scheduling and as per the chairman, it is a link that and scheduling and calendaring that is updated regularly and is sort of a one-stop shopping for all census-related activities under the California Census work so that people can know there's one link to go to for all those. And under Appendix A, we will make sure that we've adjusted new members. And then likewise, I apologize, um, we will do an update uh, on, on, uh, under the governor's appointment back at the top of the document where it identifies the adjustment and uh, change to the new chairmanship. But that will also be uh, reflecting the new committee membership. So are there any members that are opposed, I'm sorry, so I'm just gonna, are there any members that are opposed to those adjustments? If you were to be asked to vote right now on this document as modified, would anybody be uh, voting in opposition to a final approval? Seeing none and hearing none, we'll open up the floor for public comment. Are there any members of the public that would like to step forward and make any comment on this document? Seeing none and hearing none. Laura, are there any comments that have come in on the chat line? None yet, but I will open up, um, I'm, I'm going to unmute. Do, okay, wait, did you you want to go ahead and unmute us? But, but, okay. One moment. Okay. 
I believe she's unmuting the uh, committee members who are joining us by call. Any committee members who are joining us by conference call? I wasn't aware that we had any members in here. Because I don't, I don't believe oh, I don't that it was publicized on the agenda. Yeah. Yeah. If the speaker online right now, folks online. Let me ask people online right now on the phone, please, please do not speak yet. So it was the triple 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 triple
Uh, so from my point of view, obviously, uh, we want to activate and engage the 2.1 million students in the California Community Colleges. We have a uh, reach from Siskiyou's to Chula Vista. Uh, so anything that we can do to engage our student organizations, um, as well as get information to our our um, student um, club advisors, uh, all clubs in all colleges and universities, you know, have part of their charter to engage in volunteer activity. This would be a perfect opportunity, not only for the community colleges, but for every CSU campus, for every UC campus to engage those student networks. So anything we can do to help with that, we're more than happy to. Thank you, and I have my, um, education sector outreach uh, folks up there and they're listening actively. Kathleen? All right. Hold. So. Just one second. Did you want to add something to Eloy's comments? No, or? I want, when, when the time is appropriate, I want to do a point of order regarding completion or next steps regarding the, the meeting summary. I just, we've rectified certain things, so I just want to get I'll defer to Dita that you want to go to the point of order or continue on the dais? Oh, go ahead. Okay, so we, we continue to have audio, um, Issues. So um, this is a general announcement for people that are that have called and are listening in. Uh, in order to ensure that we are compliant with Bagley Keen and getting all the comments, we ask the following: If anybody that is online has a comment that they would like to make about the meeting summary prior to the vote being taken, we ask that you email that to the following: Laura dot Askins. That's A S K I N S, and that's Laura L A U R A dot. A S K I N S at census.ca.gov. We ask that you send those comments in right now. We'll give you all some reasonable amount of time period. And then after we've confirmed that there are no further comments coming in, we can let the chairman know. Or if there are, they'll be read. And then at that point, you should be prepared to um, make adjustments. Any of these comments that are coming from the public will not constitute edits to the document anyway. There'll be further comments for you to be considering before you take formal action. Okay. Any questions? Great. So um, from the Archdiocese of Los Angeles standpoint, we have been working with some uh, folks in our community to reach out to our parishes already. Uh, we know that we have a large community of immigrants, and that's probably the strongest community that we're going to be able to assist in completion of the census. We do sacraments every week in 43 languages in the archdiocese, so um, we know that we have the ability to um, interact with and reach a broad sector of the population. There are five million Catholics that reside within the archdiocese, but we also work with the dioceses up and down the state. So what I'm learning here, I bring to those dioceses, and we are connecting with um, Catholic parishes all throughout California, um, and we have already started working on an education piece and definitely through um, the uh, media that we have. Um, and I think the first step was, is through our Catholic radio stations. We have numerous radio stations in both English and Spanish up and down the state, and we're already connecting with them on outreach. Well, thank you very much. That I'm blown away by 43 different languages. I don't know if anybody else is. Um, and I encourage, and I'm hoping that uh, watching the webcast is our LA uh, administrative CBO as well as LA County, because I know LA County is struggling with their language access plans. Uh, I challenge them to reach out to you as a committee member. Um, and again, blown away, 43 languages is amazing, so thank you. Hello, as the Executive Director for Housing California, we have um, been integrating census into virtually everything we've been doing. Uh, for example, in April, we had a conference with over 2,000 folks from across the state who work on housing and homelessness, and uh, uh, census team, Complete Count Office, worked with us on doing a panel. We're hoping in the third and fourth quarter to integrate similar type panel into all of the regional housing and homelessness conferences that happen across the state to ensure that all of our folks have direct access to and identify ways to connect 
directly with uh, engaging with the outreach and implementation of census. We are also part of a national cohort, political directors cohort, working on preparing California for the 2020 election. And census has come up in that space. And so in California, as part of that national cohort, we're identifying existing community organizing, regional organizing efforts we have to do education and use census as part of the education to engage our communities that are hard to count hard to reach um, in the conversations. And then um, lastly, I'll just note as part of the Census Policy Advocacy Network, we continue to do education and advocacy in the building around the budget and we'll continue to work with legislators uh, throughout the next quarter around engaging um, in information engagement with their own constituencies across California. Hi, Chris Wills with Alliance San Diego. Uh, we are participating in a, a large number of coalitions in locally around um, census efforts, uh, including the, the largest Count Me 2020 coalition in San Diego County, um, which is over 100 organizations working together to ensure the, the most complete count that we can, focusing on hard to count communities, um, which is part of the, the state funded effort um, through the Complete Count Office. We are also um, convening some some census 101 trainings, and we're going to we're currently going door to door, door to door in some of these hard to count communities, just doing some um, early awareness creation. Uh, we'll reach about 10,000 residents over the next three weeks in some of the hardest to count communities in San Diego, uh, just to say, hey, the census is coming, and we're doing these. Um, trainings over the summer, would you be interested in attending a training on the, the U.S. Census, what it means for our communities and how we can be involved? Um, in addition, we are having conversations already about the redistricting process, which will be a result of the, the 2020 Census. Um, the statewide uh, redistricting commission is opening its applications pretty soon, and it's a short filing period, so we're trying to identify members of our communities who could serve as uh, commissioners on that commission. Um, and then lastly, uh, the, the Secretary of State uh, talked about including a message on the census to all of the uh, 10 million, I believe was the number he used, mailings that they will complete. Um, and we've been in conversations with our registrar to include census uh, awareness in the local um, ballot books that are gonna go out to the 1.7 million voters in San Diego County. So Christopher, I just had an additional question. So you said you're doing trainings, and what kind of trainings? And then if you're knocking on doors and asking about general awareness, is that kind of like a before, and then will you do like an after, in terms of like how did you hear about the census? That would be super helpful to measure the efforts. Right, so, so right now we're knocking on doors asking people are they aware that the census is coming and giving them basic information on what the census is, how it's used. It's about a five to 10 minute conversation. Um, and then asking them from that conversation, would they be interested in number one, attending uh, a community training on census and, and uh, the history of the census and how the census is used that goes a little deeper than a 10 minute conversation. And number two, um, talking to them about the the redistricting effort that comes after the census and asking them if they voted in you know the the last two general pre presidential elections uh, which is a basic requirement for the redistricting commission and if so would they be interested in serving on that commission and or attending a training regarding the redistricting commission um, and we're getting about a about a 15 percent yes rate to one of those questions. So 15% of people we're talking to, um, which would be about 1,500 people at the end of this outreach, could potentially either be applicants to the redistricting commission or attend a training on Census 101, just as an early effort. Right, so is it a thought that if they attend that you can also sort of get, I don't know, I'll call them pledge cards to say, would you like reminders or? Um, so what we plan, if they, when they attend, what we plan to do is, uh, it's kind of not going to be secret if I say, <laughs> um, turn them into community leaders, points of focus for community efforts at uh, generating excitement and enthusiasm and activating people around the census uh, when, it, when it comes in April. Like the census ambassadors. Census ambassadors, great word, yes. Yeah. 
Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. And we can do measurements from this. So we can take, you know, a measurement of the general interest from the first ask, uh, see what the turnout is, and see how many people we move to another level from there. Well, I, I think that's important. I mean, you and I had an early conversation about, you know, we have a lot more money than we had last time around or the past two times. And it's really important, and particularly for my contractors that are listening and others that are interested in getting funding, that we be measurable. Uh, and so I really appreciate those efforts to put that forethought into. You're out there, you wanna gather some data, but you also wanna make sure that it's measurable in terms of making a difference. So thank yes, you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. John. And Q3 Advancement Project California will continue to convene the Census Policy Advocacy Network, as Lisa mentioned. Uh, we're still continuing to do budget advocacy. We recently developed a letter to support uh, the Budget Conference Committee's proposal to add an additional 30 million above the main revision level for census outreach uh, and to dedicate 20 million for CBO specifically. And we are also continuing to support uh, outreach in Los Angeles through the Los Angeles Regional Census Table, uh, which recently expanded to uh, six regions across LA County in partnership with the county and city uh, complete count committees as a st stakeholder table for uh, organizations planning to do outreach. Thank you, John. I'll mention that uh, John, Dr. John DeBard of your team, he and I have been talking since 2016 when we weren't even involved about what are we gonna do about census. So uh, you guys have been a very uh, steady and a great partner. So Carolyn. Good morning, good morning. Um, I think as, as you may know, Ditas, um, the League of California Cities and a number of our representatives are looking forward to working more closely with the regional reps for the census in helping get out um, the word. I think we have a lot of city officials who are very interested in being ambassadors uh, for the program. Um, the League is divided into 16 different geographical regions. We have a representative physically located in each region. They have meetings and convenings on a regular basis. And so I hope and, and believe that that is something that the census staff can um, connect into. The league also has five different diversity caucuses, African-American, LGBT, women, um, Asian Pacific, as well as Latino. And again, those groups also have different convenings that I think um, they would welcome additional information uh, from our team. Um, also, um, we'll have our annual conference in October in Long Beach, and the secretary was so gracious to join us last year uh, to speak to um, a, a plenary audience um, at, that, at that conference. And I'm hoping and I'm inviting him to return this year uh, with his, um, also with his census hat on uh, to speak to city officials about the importance of being engaged and aware of what's going on. So I think lots of opportunities uh, to engage with the census on this work. That's fantastic. I hope both my staff as well as our partners that are out across the um, regions will engage with your caucuses that you have out there. Uh, thank you. Well, I mentioned a couple of examples in my opening statement. Uh, a couple of others that I think are worth noting. One, uh, looking at ELO, I'm reminded of the uh, agreements that we have, the MOUs that the Secretary of State's office has entered into with uh, not just other state departments and agencies, but specifically the three segments of higher education. So formal relationships uh, with the UC, with the CSU, and the largest being the uh, Community Colleges of, of California, where we utilize their communication platforms to students, yes, but also to employees uh, and to the surrounding community to disseminate Again, not just nonpartisan voter registration information and don't forget to vote, but now uh, sentence information with repeat reminders on a timely basis around the critical deadlines and time frames. So uh, another example of the partnerships that we're proud of is an initiative that we call Democracy at Work, uh, where we uh, utilize relationships with the employer community, both public and private, but mainly private, uh, Examples have been uh, Starbucks. They've been a great partner with us for several election cycles now uh, where they, and we ha ha can't commit them yet, we gotta make the formal ask, uh, but signage on the uh, what they call the community board, right? That cork board above the cream and sugar. Uh, every company owns Starbucks in California in previous years has added voter registration links and reminders in that space. And uh, I think if we bring our charm, we can uh, convince them to, uh, uh, do the same for census, professional sports teams, banks and movie studios, uh, and others. So uh, any and every chance we get to spread the word, 
uh, we will. And again, I made reference to leveraging other state departments and agencies, of course, uh, local governments. A lot of cities are doing something on their own, counties doing something on their own, but we need everybody to, uh, uh, to be part of this. So thank you, and I just think about Starbucks, and I think, wouldn't it be great to have a census at Starbucks come and get a dollar off of something, a latte, and fill out your form here? If you show, like, hey, on my, because you get a confirmation, right, that you filled it out when you're, when you're filling it out, and you show the Starbucks, and they go, okay, I'll give you a dollar off from something. I don't know, just some ideas. <laughs> yes. So California Black Media, um, what I've done is I've been working with a um, with all the ethnic media, API, Native American that we just brought in and brought into the governor's office um, to have a round table. They had not been officially a part of um, all of the ethnic media group, but we are working in a coalition um, base to make sure that um, API, uh, the Latino media, Native American media, and African American uh, media are um, engaged in um, early education. So we've done a series of articles. I know that I've made a commitment with our um, writers that we use because we produce content that we send out to all of our uh, media outlets statewide that there's always a census, some kind of reference. So no matter what it is, whether no matter what the issue is that we're talking about, I have figured out how to make a census reference um, because as our grant funder, um, you know, I told them that we can't just talk census, census, census. Do you know why it's important? Do you know why it's important? But I'm using that information to really be able to show why it's important and the communities that are impacted and affected. Um, CBM is also um, in the process. We've just finished our Counting Black California report and we commissioned a study that will, or not that will, but that um, has basically identified um, all the lowest, hardest account track um, by block level of African Americans throughout the state. And there's probably over 8,000, I think maybe, eight, I think LA was probably 8,000, I can't remember the total numbers. But um, we have that by county and by region, and um, we are hoping to get that out to the media very, very soon, uh, hopefully by the end of this week. And then um, our folks will be reaching out to your um, staff as well to make sure that we can do a briefing um, on that information. And hopefully what will it will do is guide um, the contractors that are, you know, hired statewide and the local communities to know exactly where people are by block level. And it will also hopefully help inform the media buys as well. Virginia, you said by block group level or by block level? By block level. <laughs> wow, that's, that's some data. <laughs> Thank you. We look forward to hearing about that. And yes, absolutely, our contractors, our subcontractors, that data will be invaluable, um, particularly for that community because they're very dispersed, right? And so very much where so. they are, and that. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Tom. So I, I think um, I've always made clear that confidentiality is a major and even more heightened concern with this census, given the circumstances around a late addition of a citizenship question as well as a deep distrust of the current administration and its willingness to follow the law. So MALDEF has talked about and is now on the hit the ground stage of putting together a nationwide coalition of organizations and individuals, think former elected officials, former cabinet members, who will collectively commit to monitor for violations of census confidentiality and to use all of their available efforts to step in to prevent and the damage from any breach of confidentiality, uh, if not to prevent any further breaches of confidentiality. And the notion of putting together this outside group is to create confidence in an outside group to protect confidentiality because there is simply a abysmally low level of confidence in the federal government to follow confidentiality rules. Now that's a supplement to the work that the state legislature, I believe, is working on here to create state protections against confidentiality breaches, and I have some work to do with them in making sure that I covers what I think it needs to cover in the state. Uh, it's all about ensuring that folks who have reason to lack confidence in this federal government nonetheless can be convinced that the confidentiality of census data will be completely protected. Um, and I'm also just gonna take the opportunity that Didis gave us to 
make a few recommendations, I hope, um, Mr. Secretary, for potential future work of this committee. I, I think it's critical that we make a deep dive into what we're doing with schools, uh, not just community colleges, as Eloy mentioned, but with the digital census, I think middle schoolers and high schoolers may be the ones responsible for filling out household census forms. And the good thing is that they're all in school and we ought to deep dive on what we can do with the schools, not just public, but parochial schools and private schools as well. And not just K through 12, but certainly getting down to parents in Head Start and in preschool about using their being present in a school setting to educate them about the census, um, both its importance, its confidentiality, and how to go about filling out the form. I know Dee has heard me say in another forum, I think it would be wonderful if we had a census day or prior to census day, um, 20 minutes where a message would be broadcast to every school, middle school and high school, certainly in the state, um, with the governor and people besides the governor, perhaps from entertainment, who have a particular influence with middle schoolers and high schoolers who could tell them all at once in this universally broadcast message about the importance of the census. And that idea comes from a few years ago, President Obama made such a message to schools at the beginning of the school year. And the only reason I remember it is that a particularly conservative member of the County Board of Education that I serve on uh, basically blew a gasket about the fact that Obama was being broadcast into classrooms around the country. Um, but here I think it's a statewide effort that could be done with folks who reach that cohort. But I would like to ask that the committee make a deeper dive in what we're doing with schools from pre-K all the way through high school to use the schools to get the message out. Uh, again, I think with a digital census, they may be the ones doing the filling out of the forum for us. Um, second, I know that we understand we have a problem with young children being left out of households. And I think that we ought to look into what can be done with kids being born now to send home with every newborn's parents information about the census and not forgetting to include their newly born child in the census form when it comes to them. I, I think we need to do that right away and work with all of the hospitals to I know new parents get all kinds of literature to take home with them, but having something that says, hopefully glossy and beautiful about the census, don't forget junior, I think could potentially have an impact on the fact that those who are four and younger get left out so often from uh, the census form as we know from the past. I think there is a real danger this year, especially if the citizenship question remains, that it will be older members of the household that get left out of a household listing. Um, and therefore, I think we should talk further about what can be done with senior services uh, and senior programs to make sure that older folks know that they should be included uh, regardless. And I think with a particular focus, if the citizenship question stays, uh, on the limitations of that question that it doesn't ask status and reinforcing the confidentiality issues. Finally, uh, on confidentiality, I, I want, in that webinar that we reported about, one concern that arose and I raised it with the Bureau is I think the Bureau needs to be much more um, direct and clear with hypothetical examples about what the confidentiality guarantee means because the generic language just doesn't reach out to people. And in that webinar, the Bureau seemed reluctant to answer specific hypotheticals. If they're reluctant to do that, then I think California needs to step in and say, this means, for example, if someone from the White House calls the Bureau and says, give me the data on X household, the response by law would be no. And a failure to do that would lead to someone being prosecuted criminally. And I think we just need to get to that level of directness. And I'm just suggesting that the California Complete Count Office can work with the Bureau if the Bureau is still reluctant to be specific that we work on our own messages that are very specific about what confidentiality protection means. So Tom, I just wanna comment on a couple of things. I think you're absolutely right. We've heard across the border that 
uh, regardless of the content or what's gonna be in it, that confidentiality message is so key and it needs to be uh, honed and it needs to be repeated and it needs to be pervasive throughout. And so, although I know MALDEF is a, you know nationwide, I appreciate the work you're doing here with the California legislature and the governor's office here to make sure that California can step forth and say, if they won't do it, we will. We're gonna make sure that your data is confidential. So thank you, and um, we wanna reach out and make sure we do get those examples for messaging. Um, in addition, for our K through 12 and our zero to five, uh, we are working actively with um, K through 12. Certainly there's a lot more that can be done. Um, we are working through kind of top down through the county offices of education. Our curriculum for fifth, eighth, and 11th, 12th is currently being piloted and in being rolled out across the state and we're working with first five. Um, but I think it, we're, we only meet kind of quarterly and we have packed days, so maybe we can figure out a way, maybe to do a call where um, the um, members can hear what we're doing in certain uh, outreach, I'll call them sectors. Would that be helpful? Maybe something, an interim call, and you can log in, and then we can also get that type of feedback of like, oh, you should be looking at this. In terms of that statewide, um, you know, uh, broadcast, I think that's a fantastic idea and would look to uh, the star power that you all have to get the right uh, people and to get Tony Thurmond and, and to really say, hey, schools, you know what, we're gonna do this, period, right? So having the ability for the committee to say, schools, we wanna pick this date, we'll have to work around spring break, you know, next year, that again, that message can be broadcast across the entire state. I think that's a fantastic idea. So any help would be great. So Thanks, Diaz. And the one thing that I would just say, I, I know that there are some concerns within the school sector that the amount of census-related resources that have gone out to the schools is so limited. And, and at a certain level, I do understand that, but I think that perception is one that we really have to work to overcome, uh, whether that's by ensuring that additional resources are made available or that we somehow convince folks this is so important that it's an investment you need to make regardless, but I know that there are issues that have arisen about uh, the amount of resources that have been made available to the schools about census outreach, so. Understood, thank you. Jesus. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the organization that, are, that I represent, the Central Valley Immigrant Integration Collaborative, has been working in different areas related to the census since last year. Uh, since we operate in the Central Valley and our focus has been historically on immigrant communities, uh, one of the things that we began to do last year uh, was to begin to uh, discuss with our partner organizations the situation that we saw in the Central Valley. And uh, what became very evident was that in comparison to the Bay Area, the LA area, among others, uh, in the Central Valley we had a very limited organizational capacity and very limited knowledge, very limited investment on the part of local governments and the census. So right away, one of our priorities in the Central Valley was to try to improve, to enhance the organizational capacity. So in the following months, and up until now, that has been our priority, to try to engage more organizations to improve their capacity to deal with the census. As part of that effort, uh, we began and helped uh, the establishment of several uh, complete count coalitions that most of them became complete count committees, offering training opportunities to them, uh, link, linking them also to broader state and even some national campaigns. That is one area of work that we have continued to do and will continue uh, in the foreseeable future because we've only tapped into a part of the overall uh, number of organizations that can and should be engaged in the census, like the rest of California, obviously. That's one area of work. A second one is because of our work on, on immigrants, uh, we have tried to connect our work dealing with the census to those immigrant rights organizations and networks that we belong to. And as several of our colleagues here pointed out already, uh, the immigrant communities in particular are very wary of the confidentiality, among other things, due to the situation with immigration policy at the federal level. So that has been an ongoing task of ours. A third area of work that we've been engaged in and we should continue in some way or another is to become involved in research uh, projects. So uh, we did a lot of the field work, the field work for a project called the Central Valley Census Research Project that has been shared here with the committee, but also has drawn state and national attention. So that still continues to be something 
that we're involved in, and it has served also to provide information to partner organizations so they can better understand what the situation on the ground is like in the Central Valley to better document how immigrants and other communities are perceiving the 2020 census situation and the citizenship question. And one of the results of that is that we've also been able to um, be part of amicus briefs that have been sent to district and courts and also to the Supreme Court situation that is now being discussed at the federal level. And finally, <clears throat> part of the work that we uh, have also been doing is to try to engage the local governments in the Central Valley. Um, the census in this particular case is far more complicated than in other locations. Uh, and part of our tr struggle has been to try to uh, maintain local level contacts in, in city and county governments um, invol involved and also aware of the changes and the ongoing dynamics in the 2020 census discussions. Uh, because unless you're involved in the census related matters on a full-time basis, there is no way you're gonna be able to keep up with everything. So that's been part of our task as well. So I'll just summarize it with that. Thank you, Jesus. We appreciate your work in the Central Valley. So, Sewing. I'm Sewing with Disability Rights California. Um, just, I think for me personally, just want to make sure that disability is not forgotten. It's part of the conversation. Um, I think maybe I'll just take this time to thank Ditas and your team. With putting on the webinar that we had recently, we not only engage the leadership, I mean, we engage the public and, of course, the CBOs and administrators and the contractors understood kind of the wider, diverse uh, communities of disabilities, but the leaders themselves, from the deaf communities, from deaf hard of hearing, from the blind communities, we had representatives that represented developmental disabilities, uh, disability communities. Uh, so across all the different disability leaderships are, are more engaged now because of that webinar, so that's good. So on kind of, I'm gonna go small and I'm gonna go big. So the small part is I, I oversee our multicultural affairs outreach unit. And as part of that unit, we're very mindful of intersections. So the staff that I, over, I, I help to supervise, they all live within that intersection. They're a person who is African-American, a woman African-American who's deaf and she's signed, so she's ASL. We have a gentleman who's Cantonese speaking, he's blind and um, um, so we, we live in those diversities and those intersections, so we are very mindful of reaching out to those sections that supposedly doubly counted but doubly missed for whatever reason. I, 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 so we're gonna target those particular communities that we feel even with these efforts may be missed. So we're gonna go to Chinese-speaking families with children with developmental disabilities. We're gonna go to the Latino communities uh, uh, who are deaf. We're gonna go to the blind communities who are Chinese. So. Japanese, so the diverse language, ethnic, racial communities with disabilities overlaid is who I think I personally am gonna work with, so that's kind of the ground level. And then um, going a, a, bit, a bit bigger, um, California-wise, just engaging with the leadership and continue with the conversation of how we started, I think, as part of the webinar and then growing that web. Because we've got developmental uh, centers we've got engaged, we've got state hospitals with people with mental health disabilities we've got engaged. Um, uh, we've got just a lot of institutions that are often isolated, not part of the bigger conversations that I fear may not get counted. Um, so I'm gonna work with leaderships across the disabilities to get to make sure that all those communities are counted. And then Disability Rights California is to the California's protection and advocacy, and there's a PNA protection and advocacy in every state and territories. So we're actually California we're ahead of the game as usual. So I'm um, mindful of engaging with our national partners to ensure that uh, nationally, uh, the toolkit that we've been using, the toolkit that was funded by foundation money that speaks about how to connect with disability communities related to the census, we're actually sharing that nationally, so that's got tractions there as well. We're sharing that uh, related to social media, Disability Accounts 2020 is what is tracking, so we're, we're Anywhere we can say it, we tell folks, please use that. Disability Counts 2020, hashtag Disability Counts 2020. So at all levels, we're trying to make sure that people with disabilities are engaged. You know, just kind of piggyback on you, Jesus. There are gonna be certain communities that are gonna be afraid of being counted. So I think it's the owners and all of us to make sure that everybody is counted so that even we lose, you know, some, 
you know, we've, we've, we've captured as much as we can, you know, to give us a little bit more cushion. Um, I think also a part of our responsibilities is to ensure that people connect on a very visceral, on the ground level, why it matters. So for us, we're going to speak about, hey, did you know that, you know, on top of what Secretary Padilla, you mentioned, special education is determined using census data. Uh, we have services for people who are determined using census data. So we're going to go granular in terms of kind of the concrete reasons why um, census matters and why you need to be counted as a person with a disability. And Aditas, maybe on top of what you're suggesting, you know how we got the sticker says I voted? Maybe it says I, I was counted or something and hopefully we'll get the same deal where we go to Starbucks and you get the deal off and you, wherever you go, if you got that little sticker, you get, you know, uh, some, some, uh, some addition to um, maybe the freebies that we can throw around. I think the last thought is um, making sure that accessibility, disability accessibility, because how people with disabilities get information on top of the digital divide, that's assuming you've got a computer, assuming you've got Wi-Fi, assuming you know how to use it. If you have a disability, can you actually access it having all those things? So that's additional layers. So again, I just want to thank you for your leadership on that um, webinar that we did, because it was going to be a challenge for us. We're learning as well. I can speak for a lot of our contractors that when we put in our language uh, and communications access plan, I think they do struggle with how they reach, you know, and provide that equal access. And so I encourage those that are watching um, the web um, to reach out to Sewing, and she's our esteemed CCC member, and she's got a lot of great leaders that are engaged that can help, because I think it's an area that a lot of our counties and a lot of ACBOs, it's new to them. Um, so thank you for your leadership, and you'll probably be getting a lot of calls over the next couple months about how they, you know, use our dollars to make sure that they're reached, so. Thank you. And we welcome it. Thank you, Ditas. Okay. Gerald, we have, so we have three more committee members. I want to make sure we report out. Then we're going to take a short break to deal with some of the technical difficulties, um, and then we'll come back in and hopefully be able to take a vote. Is that okay, Chair? Okay, thank you, Gerald. Yeah, yeah I think I'll pass right now. Thank you, Gerald. So, Nicholas. Man, give me time here to know. <laughs> um, so first I want to acknowledge that it's Pride Month and um, just um, make sure that everyone gets an opportunity to celebrate diversity in our LGBT communities in their own community. Um, it's also an opportunity to reach out um, and I believe in a week or two, uh, we start our big celebrations in San Francisco and LA, um, but that also kickstarts celebrations that continue throughout until October. So for all the ACBOs, make sure um, that you connect um, with the local LGBT communities in your area and make sure that you partner up um, to get our messaging out there. I'm really proud that I was able to partner um, with the California LGBT Healthcare Network in hosting a webinar where we were able to connect um, local LGBT organizations um, with the county um, committees so that they were able to participate in some of the um, RIP applications um, that were submitted. Um, we continue to do that. And on that note, I would be really interested in partnering um, with your department um, to start having conversations about how um, the county committees can be more LGBT culturally competent. Um, we know that in the Central Valley, unfortunately, we don't have um, many agencies that have staff, um, LGBT agencies that have staff. So it's gonna be extremely important that we provide the backbone and the support in those areas, um, in the more rural conservative areas of California um, so that they can, so the staff and also um, the nonprofits that are doing the outreach can be um, culturally competent. Um, I also um, want to acknowledge uh, the importance of, of nonprofit and, and having discussions um, in, in San Joaquin County, um, you know, the nonprofits are concerned that they're being asked um, to do work as a friendly um, gesture. And the reality is, is that our, our nonprofits on the ground um, have stronger access to the communities that we need to target and that we need to touch bases with. Um, and we wanna make sure that when we're drafting our media plans on a county level, um, that that value um, is being considered. I know for my agency, 
you know, when we do our annual Pride Festival, we've paid a lot of money um, to do media outreach. And yet when we look at the data after we hold our event, it's actually our social media, um, which is a heck of a lot cheaper, um, that is the number one outreach tool. Um, and so we know that there's value, there's dollar value to that, and we need to make sure um, that our media contracts and that our county um, funding uh, reflect in that. And then finally, I want to acknowledge that we need to pay special um, attention to our trans siblings right now, because unfortunately, um, in DC, they are receiving the brunt of the attacks when it comes to LGBT rights. And so there's going to more than likely be resistance um, for those individuals um, to complete their census form. So whatever that we can do, um, as far as getting our message out that at least here in California, we value our trans siblings and that them being counted is important, we need to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. And we'll tap in into you in terms of talking about that cultural training competency, how we can do that. So I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So, Lee. Hi. <clears throat> um, well, being from the far north state, um, we have a geographic region larger than the state of South Carolina with approximately a half million people. But uh, Shasta County uh, has just a dynamite uh, designated representative who's about to submit her um, specific plan with a lot of help from Carlos. And uh, I hope to export that to the other rural counties. And uh, it certainly has gotten the attention of Shasta County, which in the 2010 census was undercounted by 23% which is huge. So the Board of Supervisors, they have the message. They want everybody counted, especially the public health and the education. So uh, the foundation uh, plans on convening the various boards, supervisors, city councils, um, and all those other uh, people that uh, are on those uh, county committees. So. Uh, to get the word out, so that's what we're going to be doing. Thank you, Lee. So I think it's really important, um, Chair, as you can see, we have such a diverse and talented and connected uh, complete count committee that we're going to need all of you from the far north, the Central Valley, all the way down to LA and San Diego uh, to engage all of our vulnerable populations. Um, so at this time, it looks like we have some IT help here. Um, if we could take a short break. Sure, members of the committee, let's take a 10 minute recess, stretch the legs, uh, whatever you need to do, check that email, check the voicemail. Uh, we'll reconvene five after the hour and continue with the agenda. To the members of the committee. Hello, hello. Uh, I think we're on the verge of reconvening here. We may also be on the verge of either a solution or a workaround uh, to our public comment technical difficulties. So if we can all begin to uh, take our seats. And uh, as the attorneys huddle, so we're still not quite ready for a vote on the report to the governor yet, but let's at least continue the discussion and updates uh, elements of our agenda. And if we're able to take a formal vote before the lunch break, we will. If not, we'll continue to work on it and uh, do votes after the lunch break. But we do have some important updates from staff. Uh, let's start with um, Sarah. Next on the agenda. Thank you. Well, I'll start off by thanking Secretary of Government Operations Agency, Maribel Badger, and Deputy Secretary of Administration, Justin Howard, for their work on establishing this committee and the infrastructure for the Census Office. 
their vision and leadership have made it easier for me to step into the role of Deputy Secretary of Census 2020, so thank you. And I certainly I want to express our uh, sincere appreciation to Secretary of State Padilla for taking on the role of committee chair and welcome the partnership between both of our offices. And a warm welcome to our new committee members. We look forward to hearing your insight and advice and your participation in our upcoming meetings. Today you will hear from our team on upcoming projects such as our statewide outreach and communication strategy report and regional outreach efforts. We look forward to hearing your advice and your feedback through the lens of your very unique perspectives. I also want to acknowledge the accomplishments of the census team since your last meeting, to name only a few. We had the release of our language access and communication plan, planning of our implementation workshops, which begin tomorrow, Release of statewide outreach and rapid deployment tool, also known as SWORD, that's going to assist in the identification and geomapping of our hardest to count communities. And last, I wanna thank Laura. Thank you so much, Laura, for shepherding us through this, this challenging day. Um, she's managed the change in leadership and is also managing to the best of her ability the technology challenges that we're having today. So thank you, Laura. And on behalf of the Census Office and the California Complete Count Committee, thank you, Mr. Fontenot, for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today and sharing answers to the many questions we have about the implementation of the Census here in California. Next, I'll turn my comments to the May revise. And we'll go ahead and put the slide up. California's leaders have made a sizable investment in the 2020 Census so far already committing more than $100 million over three years to ensure every California resident is counted once and in the right place. Earlier this year, the governor's January budget proposed an additional $54 million for the next fiscal year that begins July 1st. 50 million is proposed to augment contracted outreach partners funding to increase the outreach and public relations or media funding as well. Four million is proposed to fund the California Housing and Population Sample Enumeration, also known as CHIPSI study, which is the California-only survey conducted by the Demographic Research Unit in our Department of Finance. The governor's January budget proposal would bring the total three-year investment here in California for the census to $154.3 million. Last month, on May 9th, the governor released the May revision for the 1920 budget. And this proposal includes $1 million set aside related to the CHIPSI study. And that's more of a technical budget mechanism for the census office to spend a previously approved budget item. $2 million for Native American populations and tribal government outreach. I'm gonna pause for a moment to share some insight into the rationale behind this. For background, the Census Office efforts to date have shown this hard to count population in California faces unique outreach challenges that require a very tailored approach. The funding will be used to implement a comprehensive and tribal specific outreach and media strategy to reach each tribal geographic area that focuses on tribal newsletters, radio, advertising, all with branded collateral. The funding will also be used to assist with monitoring and assessing tribal government needs in real time during the census response period. Additional funds will be allocated to support data needs of our contracted outreach partners with our SWORD, Statewide Outreach and Rapid Deployment Tool. Our contractors need household level data, which is not currently available in the census office. And so in order to perform effective targeted outreach activities, canvassing and phone banking. To address this issue, the Census Office is requesting $750,000 to acquire an account with Political Data Inc, PDI, which is capable of filling this gap. This product is a recognized and familiar tool for many of our contracted partners, legislative offices, and, our, and other campaign staff. Our partners will have access to the mobile and desktop application throughout the statewide contract with PTI. Approximately $180,000 is for one additional position to provide technical support to our office, specifically program evaluation, 
development of projections for program monitoring, and establishing metrics and success criteria. So next, I will shift my discussion to the May revise. The $22.5 million provisional allocation that you see here. The May revise includes this provisional allocation, which would be available for outreach needs with the approval of the Department of Finance. Provisional allocation means that we would not have to go back through the legislature for approval. And it is important to note that there is no specific allocations proposed in this provisional funding. We do not yet have a clear picture of exactly how much is needed or where that funding should be allocated. The expectation is that after our implementation plan workshops this summer, outreach gaps will be identified. And it's at that time that existing funding methodology will be used to allocate funds based on community needs. It is possible that in some regions we may have enough funding or that there would be gaps. It's simply not possible to understand the total funding need at this time. And that is why we have requested the provisional authority so that we can adjust or possibly augment funding in the right way. So in summary, with the governor's May revised proposal, three years of census funding could be as much as $180 million here in California. Now I will share information about where we are in the budget process. So I'll give you a brief overview of the Assembly and Senate um, and their rounds of budget subcommittee hearings. Each side developed their own funding proposals, which are not very different from each other. However, because there are some differences, it will now go to the conference committee, where representatives from both houses will work through the proposals to create a final package for the legislature to vote on over the next week or so. And as a reminder, the deadline for the legislature to complete their budget to the governor is June 15th, and the governor has up to July 1st to sign. The most notable change that the Assembly and Senate made to the May revise and that they agree on is an additional, additional $30 million of outreach needs. This is not provisional, and it would be part of the fiscal year 1920 census budget. The assembly is more detailed in how they will allocate those funds to community-based organizations, counties, and language support services. The Senate, on the other hand, is more general, but it does identify categories for counties, schools, and community-based organizations that should be supported. Both houses have approved the provisional funding opportunity in the governor's May revise. However, the assembly removed the cap and the Senate side kept the $22.5 million ceiling. So the Assembly and the Senate both approved the Governor's May revise, plus $30 million additional for outreach. The details about the amount, how the dollars are allocated, and what requirements or restrictions are in place will be discussed during conference committee. The budget process can also include policy changes related to the funding allocations. The Assembly, and only the Assembly, is recommending two of those policies. The first is to delay the survey time frame for the CHPSI study to the fall, noting that they have concerns over information saturation, workforce depletion, and response fatigue from March primary and the March-April 2020 census. Second, they have placed placeholder language to increase the reporting requirements by the California Complete Count Committee. We are working with the budget consultants to learn more and offer constructive solutions to request for more frequent and more detailed reports from this committee. So that concludes my presentation at this point in time. Great, any uh, questions, Chris? One, a couple of questions. The first is for clarification. You said the assembly approved the governor's May revise. Is that the, the 26.4 million amount? The, the 20, yes. The entire, yes. are you okay. referring to the provisional And allocation? then you said plus 30 million. Mm -hmm. So everything that you see here, the, the 26.4 million that's outlined there, that's been approved. In addition, they want to add $30 million. Okay. Yeah. 
just wanted to make sure I have that clear. Yes. So when I report the that. Money starts to add up quickly. Yeah. Yes. And then um, regarding the PDI access, and this may be a question for DTIS. Um, will groups that use PDI get free accounts? I'm a current PDI user for our outreach, but we pay a yearly fee. Uh, will these groups get access for free to the PDI census um, app? So I'm not sure if Alicia or Jim or Ben are here, but from my understanding, we will have a statewide account, and then you'll have your children, your, your parents, and then you'll have your children, and they will fall underneath that. Now, the functionality, I know we're having that discussion with Paul Mitchell and his team of, um, of what you'll actually get there it might be a stripped down version of what you have, right? Because it needs to all feed in. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, I want to put out there that the data that we're collecting that's going to go up will not have any PII in it, so we won't know household data. Each household will have a unique identifier like they do for voting, and it is not the intent of the state to collect PII with that. So we can get back to you additional details. I'm not that technical, but um, I do know that the functionality is being geared for our efforts, and of course your canvassing efforts are probably a lot more detailed than ours, so. Um, and, and those, uh, sub accounts will be free to end user organizations. Uh, will those end user organizations have to be contracted with an ACBO in order to uh, get a sub account through the state? I believe so, but I will have to like confirm that with you. So, so if I can make a recommendation on that, I, I would recommend a solution to that because many um, organizations that plan to do outreach may not be funded through the ACBO, but may do outreach instead through philanthropic um, uh, funding. And it would be good if they tied into the state's PDI census account, because then you capture that data as well. Great, I appreciate that. I think it's a great line of questioning, and I think PDI is potentially a powerful tool in this enormous effort. Mm -hmm. But clearly we need both protocols of who has access and what degrees of access to what functionality uh, of the system, uh, protocols for what information is being inputted, how we're utilizing, et cetera, and the training required. There may be some folks who, oh, I know PDI, but a lot of people who may not because they don't have maybe a political campaign experience with PDI or, or elsewhere. So there's probably going to be some training involved to maximize the tool um, at some point. Uh, so Joe? I'd like to add, um, perhaps we can, I guess our next quarterly meeting, maybe um, we'll be far enough along to have a, a deeper discussion with more details. Yeah, yeah. If, depending on when, we, when it is, maybe sooner rather than later. We've got to finalize this budget first, so let's yes. do first things first. Uh, and at some point, maybe a, a webinar or workshop or combination uh, to a broader group. Uh, Joe and then uh, Tom. So it's it's sewing like sewing machine. It's a weird name. It's written nothing like it sounds. Oh, yeah. so so sorry. Been, like sewing. Case, it's like yeah. sewing. It's an odd name. Well, I was just going to ask for the data. Is there? Uh, <coughs> is it printed out as well? I don't know. I was trying to digest all the numbers. Say that one more time. Is that produced <coughs> in paper form? Oh, yes, yes. I don't so think we, we have a copy. Apologize. Yes, we will get you a copy of you this. Have, okay, great. Yes. I actually took a picture, so I'm, I'm good, but yeah, thank you. Tom. So I, I think my question relates to the provisional allocation, which I, I understand to be addressed at outreach gaps. But I guess I want to ask about other contingency planning. Maybe Ditas can shed some light on this as well. But I'm, if something were to happen that has a statewide impact, and I will just suggest that this is one of every other census occurs during the presidential campaign. And in California, we've got a primary in March, and then the census right after. And that presents opportunities as the secretary uh, described in, in his opening remarks, but it also presents peril because we have a candidate running for re-election who uh, number one hates immigrants and number two hates the state of California and will be presumably on the primary ballot in March and may be tweeting here specifically or tweeting nationwide 
um, to try to discourage certain groups from participating in the census. Now that's not an outreach gap, right? That's not a specific community. That's a contingency that has a statewide impact. Is there available resources to address those kinds of unanticipated contingencies? The answer to that is yes. So through our um, request for proposal for our outreach and media vendor, um, we we have been um, we put in there misinformation specialist. You know we are focusing in on putting resources in to be able to identify those type of situations and really stop them before they blow out of proportion. Um, so yes, to your point, we are we will have dedicated resources to misinformation. Um, and strategies to be able to constantly monitor what's going on and be able to address it. Um, so, Right, and so that, that's question. available even if we can't anticipate it. I mean, it could be something else. Like there, there may be a major consumer data breach that leads to confidence levels in digital confidentiality plummeting, you know, right before. So we're, we're set to have the resources to develop the messaging, even if it's totally unanticipated, very good, okay, thank you. Yes, and, and we've emphasized that our, our contractors need to pivot quickly because there will be misinformation, there's gonna be things that happen that we didn't anticipate, um, but I'm, I'm confident that we will have the team in place to be able to address those issues as they emerge. Okay, other questions, comments for item number five of our agenda? Seeing none, no action required. This is simply an update, so thank you very much, Sarah. We'll do a quick technology check-in. How are we doing? I think we're okay. Think we're okay? So should we try to go back and do redo our votes at this time, or should we give it another few minutes? Sure, I'm, I can make a couple of announcements on how we'll handle the public comment. Portion. Okay. Okay. So first of all, uh, for those listening, we apologize for our technical um, difficulties that we're having. But can we I ask you to have... speak closer into the microphone? <laughs> I apologize for our technical difficulties that we're having. We, we think we have resolved them. However, we will not be able to unmute the lines to take verbal public comment. If you wish to make public comment, you may do so through the chat feature on the webcast, or you may email me at Flora. Dot askins, that's L A U R A dot askins, A S K I N S, at census dot C A dot gov, or at info at census dot C A dot gov, I N F O at census dot C A dot gov. Um, and now I'll turn it back over to Secretary Padilla. Thank you. Okay, and is it uh, your preference that we uh, proceed with looking for public comment on agenda items and voting now? <laughs> Or should we go to the next report, give folks 15 minutes or so to... Let's go back to the to the item two on the agenda, the trust and confidentiality. Okay. And we need to open that up for public comment and then take another vote. Okay, but okay. I guess my question is, you wanna give it a minute and if we get comments, great. If not, go ahead and vote or do you wanna give them about 15 minutes to chime in? We can give them about 10 minutes to vote. So I mean, let's to remind China anybody China. listening or watching or smoke signaling or whatever. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, we're going to move on to agenda item number six, okay. uh, which is the director's report. After agenda item number six, we'll come back to the items earlier in the agenda that require a vote. Correct. We'll take public comment first on those items. So item, does that include item number two, the name change? The name change and then the governor's report. The governor's report number three. Uh, and Another. then uh, if there's public comment, we'll take it at that time. Correct. Then we'll vote. If not, we'll proceed with votes. Correct. And then at that point, I think we'll be ready for a lunch break. <laughs> and then when we come back from lunch, we'll uh, take up the balance of the agenda. Everybody got that? All right. Titus, take it away. Great. Thank you, Chair. So I just wanted to say again, thank you all members in the chair for um, being here and to thank Sarah for joining the team. Um, the team has been together for about a year, but I've been at this uh, officially for about two years, uh, April of 2017, sitting all by myself at Department of Finance. So I am so excited to have everyone here. And Tom and I uh, served on the National Advisory Committee to the U.S. Census Bureau, uh, advising Al and his team, um, gosh, for the last six years. Um, so I passed my hat on, and um, I like to say I aged out of that committee. <laughs> so, um, but... We are so excited um, 
the rubber's hitting the road. I mean, even like a year ago, it was still kind of off in the distance, and I feel the engagement. I feel that, like, I don't want to say like normal people, not nerdy census people like me, but normal people are talking about the census. And so it's really um, being covered. I wanted to do a little TBT, it's not Thursday, but a throwback Tuesday, um, because a couple of people said, hey, you didn't talk about state agencies. So I said, well, as a director, I'm gonna, you know, I'll throw it in there if the, um, my lawyer doesn't yell at me for not doing it. But in June of 2009, so let's go 10 years back, we had no money, like zero money. And we were really dependent on those foundations who I wanna call out right now to say thank you. I know they stand ready to fill gaps. Um, they really did the heavy lifting in 2010. But also uh, sort of unsung heroes of 2010 census was our state agencies who really stepped up. That's all we had here at the state. Right, so June 2009, we were heading, it was myself and Regina was on my team and three other sort of volunteers that we grabbed from other agencies and we went and did these regional convenings to kind of shake the bushes to make sure people knew how important it was, that's all we had and then the state agencies really stepped up and said, hey, you know what, this is important, we know you don't have any money, we're gonna reach out to all the folks that we know we already reach out to. And the chair alluded to the fact that the Secretary of State's office does a lot of outreach already, but I just wanted to say, and it'll be in the report, um, it goes, to the, um, goes out publicly um, later in the, the summer, is that we kicked off our state agency outreach uh, in May 17th, but we've been working with them uh, for the last year, just kind of talking and planting those seeds like we've been doing all across the state. We had about 40 state departments show up, um, and they're very excited. Uh, the next step was we're sending out this, we sent out an asset survey, which is really like, what do you got? Do you got rooms? Do you reach out? Do you have, um, you know, festivals that you go to? Do you already reach out to, you know, seniors against investment fraud? What kinds of things do you already do that we can take advantage of? And the next week, uh, Alana Golden, who is heading our state agency outreach, she's gonna do individual meetings. I call it like speed dating, and like, what do you got? What are you doing? So we're gonna really get an idea of what all the state agencies agencies can do and we're gonna continue uh, that conversations, we're gonna provide training for our state agencies, partnering with everything that the Secretary of State and other uh, constitutional offices are doing. We're gonna provide call center scripts because if you've ever been on hold the DMV or any other state agency, you'll get the census messaging. So we're doing quite a bit there in terms of state agency, but I wanted to call that out because they're really our unsung heroes as well as our foundations that stand ready to fund. Uh, and they'll be a big part of what we're doing this summer to fill gaps. But I'll go back to my slide, because I know people are very interested uh, in hearing about our outreach and public relations request for proposal. Uh, and again, I look at my attorney, I can only say certain things, because we're in the midst of this competitive bid. We did receive seven proposals. We evaluated five, two were received after the deadline, and so uh, they were not evaluated as sticking to the rules to, to, at RFP. Uh, oral interviews uh, were held, um, and the expected award date, although our original notice uh, for intent of, uh, was for yesterday, we have really um, wanted, our evaluation team has wanted to take the time to really dig in, uh, considering a lot of other stuff that's going on. Um, so we are estimating that uh, we'll award uh, later this month, and of course, the uh, following that would be the expected contract start date, hopefully, fingers crossed, um, with all contract stuff by the end of June. Um, but of course, per the RFP, as I'm told to say, these dates are subject to change. So unfortunately, I can't really answer any specific questions uh, on this publicly until we finish. Um, I was not part of the evaluation team, so I've, you know, um, that's what I could say about that. So let's go on to the next slide. So we're talking about um, what you can do for quarter three. And I, was, I loved hearing all the things that you're doing. What you can do um, for my team and me and for our contractors, we have this upcoming 26, maybe even 27, maybe even more workshops coming up. So last year we did the uh, statewide readiness convenings. There's about 24, 25 of them across the state. And that was really trying to get early adopters, finding those leaders. And we promised back then that we're gonna come back out to see what you've been doing over the last year in terms of all those communities. So um, the purpose of those is really for us to take our contractors, well it's twofold, we're bifurcating the day. In the morning we'll do the uh, sort of the convening, 
We'll have folks be able to, you know, leaders in the community come talk about the importance of census, and we'll level set about what our contractors and partners are already doing in those areas. So I thought it was important to do both because we've got the early adopters who are really a lot of our contractors and people that are already there, and then we've got people that are just coming to the, like, what's census? And so we wanted to make sure that they had a forum in the morning to learn and engage, um, and so that's in the morning session, and so we would love to have all of you at those, and we'll all have you arrange with Laura to which ones you wanna come to. Um, but then in the afternoon, so we'll let all the sort of general public go, in the afternoon, that's where our contractors really come together, and they talk about uh, looking at gaps. So the latter half of the morning is where we'll level set. So all of our contractors will kind of give the general public, a, here's where we are with our strategic plans, here's what we're looking at, here's some gaps that we might need filled, um, and then uh, then we'll you know adjourn that session. And then in the afternoon, where I'd like to see all of you guys is I'd love for you guys to open up the afternoon sessions in certain regions that you're at, like in San Diego. Um, and then to give those contractors, who a lot of you are already working that, with them, kind of that energy that they've got to really hash through and not be afraid to say what their gaps are. I think it's really important to understand that our contractors, they've got a big, you know, a big thing on their shoulders to A, identify where their hard to count are, figure out strategies, put them into an implementation plan, and identify gaps. And I think we also want to make sure that what they're identifying in terms of what they're implementing in outreach activities and education activities is measurable. Um, and so we're gonna, I'm gonna continue to really say, I can't approve strategic plans, I can't approve implementation plans for you to get paid unless we really have concrete things that they're gonna do and that are measurable. So um, would love for you to also carry that message as we head into those. Um, the outcomes, uh, since they're really starting tomorrow and they go all the way through end of September, is that they have to, these contractors have to create their implementation plans in order to get their installments. And of course you guys all know that the contracts are deliverables based. They get a certain amount percentage for their strategic plan, a certain amount for their quarterly plans, and these all have to be approved. And when we come to this fall, we want those implementation plans to be coordinated across sectors, whether you're funded by the state or not, whether you're a county, whether you're an administrative CBO, we wanna avoid duplication, although some duplication is okay because we know that our hard to count populations need to be reached multiple times. We, we don't wanna duplicate gaps. And so that's really what we're pushing for um, through the summer and then when we get to the end of September to have all those implementation plans in place so that we can have a statewide view of what we're gonna be doing and what we're gonna, when we hit the ground running um, in January. So that, um, I think the next slide just shows some of the upcoming ones. And again, on our website, we do have all of them listed. Some of the locations are still to be determined. I uh, would ask that you work with your regional program managers, many of them are here, to, and to work with Laura uh, to really coordinate your attendance. Uh, tomorrow we're in Palm Desert, next Wednesday Riverside, um, and San Bernardino on the 14th, that's our Region 7, and Quintilia, to raise your hand here, um, she's in charge of those. And then we're back here in Sacramento on Monday the 17th, um, I expect that to be uh, pretty well attended for, and all those that are here based here, you're welcome to come, just let us know so we can make sure we can recognize you. And then on the 19th, we'll be in Richmond, Alameda County. I know Casey is out there. Um, and then we'll be up uh, towards Lee Salter, Red Bluff, and then uh, down in Redwood City um, on the 26th. Those are kind of the ones that are coming up in June. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them on any topic. Christopher. <laughs> I would get chewed out if I went back to San Diego without saying this. I see that on the schedule there's one day for San Diego and it's in the south part of the county. Um, it would be great if you could add a date or a couple of days for San Diego because we have a pretty expensive county. North County is hard to get to an event in South County um, and we do have some North County organizations in our coalition who would love to attend this in their region so they can turn out their constituencies. Uh, and then East County also might need a day of their own for the same reason. So if you could add days for San Diego County, that would be greatly appreciated. So Christopher, I don't know if we have the budget for that, but I will say this. Um, I recently met with Philanthropy California, 
and told them what some of our needs were, and they do have a, a bucket of money, and uh, one of the big needs was for coordinating, additional coordinating. A lot of people are having these educational convenings, but there's very little coordinating convenings, which is really what this is, mm -hmm. so maybe we can um, lean on them to meet some of those needs. Let me know how it can help. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Regina. I just wanted to ask a quick question about the releasing of the dollars. I think just, I know that people have been meeting for a year and I had a, a great opportunity to bring um, some um, African American organizations together. Um, Judy Robinson, who's sitting back there, uh, was so gracious to help host, to get people connected that just weren't connected. And I'm wondering, do we have that list of the complete count committees, the ACBOs, like when they're meeting, because one of the things that I think we determined in that particular meeting, I think it was about a week ago, was that this board or this body is um, bound by Bagley Keene. And so we have to have our meetings and we have to be public. We have then pushed dollars out to these folks and they don't actually have to have that same type of transparency. And so we don't, so what happened is, it's not that it's intentional, I just think that people are just kind of doing the work and some people may be doing the work in silos and so when you're talking about those coordination dollars, that's where I see a huge miss, um, possibly down in those, those areas where, um, I don't know if they're meeting like how we're meeting, where there's somebody who has that opportunity. So do you know if that's what's happening around the state, like with the, CCCs and the ACBOs, where they're bringing people together and kind of have to say, hey, come to the meeting so that you can join and be a part. So uh, later this afternoon, our regional um, program leads are gonna kind of give a state of the region. Um, and so I think they could probably comment to that. Um, I will say that in our contracts, it's sort of, we do have forced coordination and we will be calling folks out. I recently had a call with a large county and um, was encouraging them to meet with their ACBO. Um, and even though they're like, yeah, we're gonna meet, I'm like, mm, not, from what you said, I can tell you guys haven't been meeting. So, I mean, it's, it behooves my um, program leads that are out there to continue to push. And as I told Christopher, if I need to come down to San Diego to get people all in a room, I will do that. But I really wanna empower my regional program leads to be able to kind of crack that whip and get people in the room. Okay, and I, and I want to say that, like LA, I think that they're probably doing a really phenomenal job. Um, Sacramento, I think that you know, it's just been the coordination part. But I think also the one of the um, things that I also heard was that the dollars aren't being released out to them to be able to do the work. So I know that they had implementation plans that were developed or do what on the thirty first. Strategic plans. The strategic mm -hmm. plans on the thirty first. So that was going to do the first trigger of dollars. So I think that there's something, I think they were very anxious to talk about the fact that they need these dollars to kind of come a little bit faster because you're, they're dealing with certain smaller organizations underneath them and they've kind of been doing this work for a year or 18 months or so and they feel like, okay, we, so we know that you guys have to have certain controls in place, yes. but they're, they're looking at this, you know, the rollout of the funding to, I think it's starting to hamper things maybe. I understand, and we, you know, we want to be totally transparent. And so, um, you know, when people ask, well, "Dias, why didn't you approve this plan or that plan?" Um, I'll show you the plan, <laughs> and I'll tell you why I didn't approve it, because uh, I want to be transparent about it. And then we have the process through, of course, the state controller's office um, and the state contracting process. So we are uh, committed to getting those dollars as out as soon as possible, uh, and also being transparent, and then holding them accountable. Right. It's a tough balancing act at times, but yes. I've heard the uh, the cash flow pinch uh, as well in my in my travels, um, especially because if you look at again where the work is needed the most, the hard to count communities are hard to count for a variety of reasons, right? The social infrastructure mm -hmm. in those regions are strained as it is, and now we're asking them to do more, and hopefully, maybe, probably, you know, fingers crossed, the money will come eventually, and. Yeah, they're, they're being strained. Uh, Tom. I just so, wanted to just add to that, Secretary Vidya, just know that agency is, is taking a look at this um, issue very seriously. So we are working with State Controller's Office and others involved to see if there's any way possible to be able to shorten that time frame of getting um, the funds out. So, Ditas, if you just share a word or two about how we're making sure that contractors 
are addressing household underreporting as well as household non-response, just given how important that may be in this particular census? So, and just for folks to repeating the question, so household underreporting is when you relook at the complex households that are out there in California and perhaps there's multiple families living in there and you get one postcard, right? And you have an opportunity to go online once to fill it out, but perhaps I fill it out for my daughter and I and you know, auntie's living in the other room, and I'm like, oh, well, she's like another, you know, she's not part of my house, so she's like my family, and I don't report. So I think partly that comes to, I need to be educated if I'm not, I mean, obviously I know to do that, but our on the ground efforts, they need to be able to say, you need to report Tita and Tito and Abuelita, you know, who are living in that household, because you're gonna get that one chance. Um, I know that one of the questions we had for Al later is, what happens if we have a renter and then the the person who's the primary household doesn't report them? Does that renter have an opportunity to report uh, separately and will you guys match that up or will it be seen as a mismatch? I mean, is that a fair question? I'd have to ask Al. You want me to respond now? Uh, yes, they would have an opportunity to respond. This census, we're not requiring people to use the pre assigned census ID code that we give them. And so we match it up later on the back end. So if you have two household, two families living in the same address, each one of them could respond, one using the code that they received in the mail, the other using a non-coded response, and we'd be able to match that up, yes. We realize that that's an issue, and by being able to use non-coded responses, we feel that we'll catch many more people uh, who otherwise wouldn't be able to respond to the census. But it's, so, uh, it behooves us to educate. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I think it, it's necessary that we make sure that people are aware of that, because if you send out a code number, unfortunately, some people are gonna think, oh, I have to have a code number. And of course, the Bureau will be doing messaging about it, but our outreach contractors need to know that piece as well. But also under reporting, as you know, comes from leaving out the zero to four. It may come from leaving out other household members who want to avoid a particular question. So I, I, you emphasize appropriately measures, and I think it's easier to do measures about household non-response. We talk to X number of people, right? right? But making sure that the message is also getting out, you have to include every member of the household is so critical, I think, given what we know about zero to four from last decade and given what we can anticipate if the question remains about this decade. So I just wanna make sure, and I know that you are, but I wanna make sure that we're making sure the contractors are addressing both issues. If we get a bunch of responses, but they're incomplete, it does as much damage, obviously, to the state as non-responding households. And in fact, it could be even more pernicious, as you know, because yeah. the Bureau is unable to do non-response follow-up when they get something that lists four members of a five-person household or something like that. So. Right, so I appreciate that. And just for additional clarity, the. Uh, a ability for a second entity to respond to the same household with or without the code. That's across platforms, uh, online, submittal, yes, phone, transmittal, et cetera. Respond paper, phone, or electronically. Okay, because that, that will be an important part of our messaging Absolutely. and education. So. So, so in details, um, you mentioned how many State Departments again that that came to this initial meeting, 40. Yeah. 40? And we're continuing to reach out tomorrow. Do you know if uh, Department of Developmental Services, Department of State Hospitals, and Department of Rehab were part of those 40s? Uh, I'd have to ask uh, Alana. She's back from the back. Yeah, Alana, why don't you come forward? Uh, so Wing's question was uh, Department of Rehab. Department of Developmental Services and Department of State Hospitals? It's, yeah because they're often individuals that may not be able to advocate for themselves to be counted. So I wanna make sure they're at the table. Right. I mean, I, think I did think point. of that because it was clear in my mind um, because we had the recent disability awareness webinar and um, some of them were on that webinar. So yes, they have been invited. All the state departments have been invited and that includes the cabinet level um, state departments, boards, and commissions, so the ones that um, you mentioned and many, many others. There were 40 at the first meeting in the governor's office because that was a smaller group 
really focusing on the cabinet level, who will take that message down to the departments that they were they oversee, and then we'll activate those departments. Okay. And then we are working um, with some departments already directly, just because they were such important partners in 2000 and 2010, like Didis was saying, they really came through when we didn't have resources. So we've been working with them already. Right. So it sounds like they're at the table. They are at of the, the table. Far. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Chris. Sorry. Um, so, Ditas, um, let me know if this is, uh, I have a couple of questions from some of our partners in San Diego, most of them around the contracting with ACBOs, um, and there's a lot of confusion around um, the, the organizations that will contract with the ACBO if they have to meet the same requirements minus the budget requirements as the ACBO in order to, to, to get that contract. Um, I feel like that wasn't clear. So the ACBOs had requirements to contract with the state. Correct. Um, and there's confusion around whether uh, nonprofit organizations will have to meet those same requirements minus the budget requirement um, to contract with the ACBO. So for instance, can a 501c4 contract with the ACBO? So I'm just looking at my legal counsel, um, Christy. Um, so I know that ACBOs we had uh, because of the role that they're playing. I mean, we had some like financial levels that we wouldn't expect them to reach. Um, but one of his questions is, can a 501c4 subcontract to an ACBO? And do they have, I think they're different because again, we want them to contract with the smaller CBOs. But that's a, a very specific question about the 501c4s. Question is, can a 501c4 contract with one of our ACBOs? Right, as a subcon, can a 501c4 be a subcontractor to the ACBO? I think that's a question that they are going to need to pick up with their ACBO legal. Uh, we don't have. Thank you, ladies in the audience. <laughs> um, from our lawyer so in the audience. We heard, we heard from committee staff in the audience. Yes, with certain conditions, it'd be great if the committee can get that in writing and or you can point to where on the website that information can be found so that it's clear, not just to us, but to everybody. Because right. the 25% relates to, if you have an ACBO and you're, um, that you get, say you're just getting a million dollars for this ACBO and you're subcontracting more than 25%, so you're subcontracting 40% of your contract, that particular subcontractor does need to meet pretty certain because you're kind of just passing through mm -hmm. but if it's less than 25 percent there's a, a there's a different threshold uh, but to my lawyer's uh, thing I think she wants to just make sure so we're not committing to it and we'll put it that's a very good question we'll make sure we get an FAQ so, on that and get that out so I understand your response they have to they have to discuss that with the ACBO but I guess is there any state prohibition against that well, for, the for the for the purposes of this contract the only prohibition would be the 25 percent okay. so that they they would need to meet all the requirements that our prime subcontractors would need to meet mm -hmm. um, but we don't know what kind of prohibitions that the acbos may have you know themselves so that's why i would recommend that they speak with our own counsel on that Right, and then well, if you look at the ACBO budgets, it's not limited to just subcontracting to CBO. Some of them might do some media, some of them might do, you know, for profit. So I think. Okay, yeah, that was just an example of some. So if there, I think the, the secretary pointed to a, a, a broader, a better uh, answer for me, which is, is, is it possible to point out those requirements somewhere on the website or send a link that we can share so that the organization seeking a contract as well as the ACBOs understand what those relationships are and that they are different than the state's relationship to the ACBO. Right, you know one of the things I do want to do to get feedback from our, CB, our ACBOs is to have those conversations so they say hey, here's the questions that are coming up, we can research them and we can put them out on our frequently asked questions so everybody has access. So um, hearing from them directly. Regina, sure. okay. Regina. Can we, in our next meeting maybe, I don't know if it's gonna to be too late or not, but is there a way to get them to come or a session that we're able to have yes. with the ACBOs? Yes, I think so. So we're keeping track of a lot of the topics that we'd like to, to cover in future meetings, so. Okay. 
Lisa. On a related note, I was wondering, since all this great intel will be gathered on the, the local level, essentially, will there be a mechanism to hear the, what's shared, what's learned locally, and connect those dots? And I think what Regina just proposed is one idea or a webinar or whatever conversation I know we need to share globally, but I think a lot of richness and places for um, shared tools or strategies, communication is essential, right, as we think about how to do our work most effectively and evaluate it for impact. So I would also say the IPWs, you can see it on the ground real time, right? So if you're able to attend one of those afternoon sessions, I think you'll get a real good feel for it, but I hear you in terms of being able to roll that up. IPWs meaning the Implementation, oh, the implementation plan, plan Workshop. workshop. Yeah, so sorry about that. Not to, not to get ahead of ourselves, but I yes. think that the general dynamic I've heard prior to today and clearly here right now is that information sharing I referenced earlier. So it could be through these workshops, it could be frankly through future committee meetings, uh, so this being the venue, and not just here in Sacramento, but maybe taking the show on the road, folks, uh, and or maybe subgroups of us can have at the regional level meetings with the ACBOs to have that deeper dive conversation, and then utilizing, again, the website, the serves, constant, con you know, all of our tools for that best practices and information sharing. I'll just make a comment about the um, attending the implementation plan workshops. You have to coordinate with Laura because we want to make sure that you're not Bagley Keen. Right. If we're hitting a quorum, yeah. red flag. <laughs> so do you stand on that side of the room and you stand on that side of the room. So. Okay, any other questions? Any other questions? Okay. If not, I'll offer one, uh, one final. Going back to the budget and cash flow, uh, and this is state government weeds here, so I'm hoping it's not an issue, but one question to ask of the controller's office is if the recent implementation of FISCAL uh, will contribute to any delays in payments or reimbursement, and if, if FISCAL is not a, a factor here, great. If it is, what can we do to cut through some of that red tape? I understand the question. Thank you. <laughs> and just a side note to that. Oops, let me make sure you recognize me. Okay. Um, because I believe last year, right, in the $90 million, I think in the last, the trailer bill language said that, um, there was trailer, trailer bill budget language that said that we were suspending contract rules around the 90.3 million. I don't know if that happens again or what have you, but does that allow us to be able to set our own rules? Um, around this funding conversation and, and, and frankly, co contracting just in general. So, so, so I'll have our legal I'm sorry, person I, respond I to this. I received a question from our staff while you were talking. I'm sorry. What is no, it's okay. So, she's, she's, so I was basically saying that I don't think you were actually on board whenever this happened, um, but the la last um, budget cycle, there was language inserted into trailer bill language that um, I guess was supposed to help this process, but basically suspended contra state contracting rules around the 90.3 million. It was very specific about that. So what I'm wondering is if that was the case, I mean, it didn't say anything else other than that. Does that give us the ability to be able to actually set our own rules within parameters? So let me, let me jump in. <laughs> the answer is we can't make up our own rules. I think what you're referring to is the fact that we have contract exemption. So normally in the state process, we would have to be very um, transparent and competitive in who we contract with. And so those provisions that you're referring to, I believe, um, were specifically in reference to the fact that we do not have to go through that competitive bidding process. So it gave us a lot of flexibility in terms of who we could contract with and shortening of the time frames in which we could enter into those agreements. However, we still are under the state administrative manual processing rules related to, and maybe you can, it, and talk a little bit about that. Um, right, we do, um, we're trying to follow the public contract process as much as possible, even though we're not technically bound by competitive bidding rules. Um, so it, um, we also are following the state, um, a DGS, um, state administrative um, manuals and contract um, policies. So we're trying to follow um, prescribed rules as much as possible and go out of process only um, when there's a clear need to that would 
benefit the state and the effort. So um, those decisions are made internally and, um, and very thoroughly vetted. Um, it would, a, a decision to go out of process and, and, and use the exemption um, would be made on a case by case basis. Right, it was, the exemption was there to allow us when, you know, Tom's asking about what happens when, you know, something you didn't expect contingency wise, if we had to put a, pro a process into place, we'd never be able to meet that, those, uh, that emergency situation. So it can allow us to like, hey, quickly amend or maybe we need a special person to do, uh, you know, crisis management that is above and beyond the contract that we have in place. We gotta bring that person on in a day or two right, to deal with, you know, perceived data breach or whatever it is. So we are, as Chrissy said, we're following the process as much as possible. We're not trying to skirt the process, but where things can be unwieldy, that's where, and we need to respond quickly, that's where we would use our exemption. Right, and so I guess that's what I'm, I guess I'm asking, because I know that it was just one sentence. So, and I know this was underneath the last administration. Um, and I guess as our chair has kind of said, knowing that our organizations, you know, we trust the ACBOs because we know that they've handled money. We trust them almost like we trust the state. They didn't really have to, well, I guess they had to go through a kind of a competitive process, but we trust them. Um, but these smaller CBOs that they're working with just don't have the cash flow. So I'm just, I'm saying that maybe you guys are able to internally look at that. And I'm not sure if that's the case. I'm just saying, I'm looking at that language being there for a reason, and I don't know if that falls within that. So that's all I was asking. I think the cash flow is a, a function of the state controller's office and getting tax cut, um, which is outside of the contracting process. So are, are the ACBOs uh, um, contracts reimbursable in nature? They're deliverable based. Wow, okay. Chris. Um, just continuing to con I, this has been one of the most difficult conversations in our ACBO meetings is, and, and I've had to do a lot of reminding people that these are contracts, not grants, and that they have metrics and deliverables required, um, and covering our ACBO because people were asking to get the money up front. We had to explain what the state's payment and contracting process is, which is a 30-20-20-20 deal, um, which does make it hard for some of the smaller uh, community-based organizations. We're hoping that philanthropy, in San Diego County, we're hoping that philanthropy will come through, which has different requirements um, to kind of relieve the pain of the cash flow. Um, and, and whatever, you know, uh, I think we have to be more vocal to philanthropy saying, we need the money earlier, not later. Um, and we need it with less requirements than the state has for this money. But uh, even so with that challenge, with what's going on with the controller as a small organization that's being impacted, I mean, there have been some of my sister agencies have gone six months without being reimbursed because of the challenges that they're having. So I think we need to be totally transparent um, with our partners with the reality that they're going to be looking at over the next who knows how long. I appreciate the uh, message to philanthropy suggestion that's been made because I know there's conversations happening in that sector as we speak. So, any other questions on the director's report? Nick, was there anything else? No. Just anything else? All right. <laughs> if not, thank you very much. To be continued, uh, let's now uh, come back to the uh, agenda items that require the vote, uh, beginning with item number two, right? There was no issue with the adoption of the minutes earlier? There was no issue with the adoption of the minutes. Okay. We received no public comment on the name change, and so my legal counsel says our vote can stand. Okay, thank you for that clarification on the record. Then we go to agenda item number three. We which do was the report to the governor's office. We had a good, healthy substance discussion, uh, some additional drafting and final language uh, to reflect the input from the committee will be added. Um, I do have one question from a member of the public. Um, does the draft of the report to the governor include an education section update? Will the public be able to see the draft or only after publication? The draft is actually available online on our website. 
okay. as as we speak now, and they'll see it after publication. As for the education update, so the education update we did have one in our last um, meeting, and then our report. Um, Actually, the report to the legislature has an update of what's going on uh, on the education side of things. And what is the deadline for the report to the legislature? Um, Dorothy, when's the next report to the legislature? July 1st. July 1st. All right. So that'll be coming out and that'll be public. Stay tuned. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Tom. So I'm sorry for a question that may be dense, but our agenda says, quote unquote, final recommendations, capital F, capital R. Um, I didn't know what that was referring to. I didn't see any recommendations in the draft report that we've been given. Didn't know if the committee was supposed to have recommendations as a part of its report to the governor or whether that's just a reference to recommendations about revisions or I'm, it's just, it was capital F, capital R, so I wasn't clear. I believe it's recommendations about changes to the report. Is that correct? Okay. Right. Right. The substance so, of so our report is not supposed to have recommendations from the committee. Not, not this one, not this particular one. Okay. All right. Any other questions, comments? If not, I believe we're ready for a vote, and I would imagine you would prefer a roll call vote. That is correct. Do we have a, do we have a motion? So let's call the roll on the uh, revised report do to we the have government. have a motion to accept? Is there a motion? We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Let's please call the roll. All right. Secretary Padilla. Aye. Sewing Van. Aye. Carolyn Coleman. Aye. Kathleen Domingo. Aye. Nicholas Hatton. Lisa Hershey. Aye. John Jonino. Aye. Jesus Martinez. Aye. Gerald McIntyre. Aye. Eloy Ortiz Oakley. Aye. Tom Sines. Aye. Lee Salter. Aye. Regina Brown Wilson. I mean, I was about to say present, sorry. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> Christopher Wilson. Aye. Thank you, sir. Okay, that uh, item is approved. Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, I think now would be a good time for a lunch break uh, for all of us. The agenda has a schedule for a lunch break from 12 to one, it is now 12.15. Let me take the temperature of the committee. Do you all want the full hour and reconvene at 1.15 or would you feel comfortable reconvening at one o'clock? Uh, full hour, okay. <laughs> All right, so yes, and we're, we've already taken a, up a few items that were slated for the afternoon. So 1.15, we will reconvene and continue with um, outreach update and hearing from uh, Mr. Fontenot of the Census Bureau. We stand in recess. Welcome back, everybody. Let's take uh, the next minute to settle back in and uh, reconvene. Let's call this session back, this meeting back into uh, order. Welcome back from the lunch break. Members of the committee making their way back to the dais. Thank you all very much. So not quite uh, exactly one hour, but pretty darn close. So. Thank you all for your focus and your discipline so we can reconvene and uh, take up the items for this afternoon's part of today's meeting. Uh, where we left off, we completed item number six. Members of the committee, if you're keeping track, uh, we're picking up now with agenda item number seven, an outreach update. We have a healthy amount of time allotted for both reports as well as questions, discussion, and recommendations to make to the team here. Let me turn it over to Adriana Martinez, Deputy Director of Outreach and Tribal Liaison. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, 
members of the committee. Hope everyone enjoyed their lunch. Thank you so much. Uh, today I am here, and again, my name is Adriana Martinez, Deputy Director of Outreach and Tribal Liaison for the California Complete Count Campaign. Today I'm gonna cover um, an outreach update, which includes the statewide outreach and communication strategy, otherwise known as SOX, and I'll refer to it as SOX uh, here forward. Not the SOX you wear, but SOX as in statewide outreach and communication strategy followed by an update on language and communication access plan. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to our lead regional program managers who help me cover and oversee the entire state of California. And they're over here to my left. And then finally, we'll cap it off with a sector outreach uh, update. And that is non-education sectors that we're focusing on. So with that, At the last quarterly meeting on March 12th, you all uh, committee members provided us with great feedback and input on how we might um, further engage community members, collaborators, et cetera. Uh, we broke out into sessions, breakout sessions. You all participated in breakout sessions which are reflected um, before you in the presentation and that was uh, outreach, meaning the ground game, outreach and public relations, um, casually referred to as comms or, or media, uh, and that's the air game, uh, education and schools engagement, and finally, language and communication access plan. At the time, if you recall, we put before you, shared with you a draft of the interim socks, and with this feedback here, um, we had great conversation in the afternoon during those breakout sessions. We have uh, incorporated that feedback into the current draft that we are working on the, of the SOX, which will be released publicly um, by the end of this month of June, the interim uh, SOX, that is. As you know, the SOX reflects a comprehensive community engagement campaign utilizing trusted community messengers in trusted places. This is based on learnings from 2000 and 2010 here in California. We have built upon that, um, confronting, as we've heard all morning, new challenges, of course, with the online response, as well as a different political climate. Um, the SOX also, also reflects uh, requirements for contractors to collaborate and coordinate so that we make most efficient use of public tax dollars that are invested in this campaign, so that's very important. And then finally, um, the campaign that we have here in California that we're investing in is additive. It is supplemental to what the U.S. Census Bureau operation is. They own the operation, the enumeration process. What we are doing is an added value to that. And as you all know, the SOX, our strategy, which will be reflected on paper in the interim draft uh, released by the end of this month and then later in the year, the final SOX, it's really about focusing on our hard to count populations, vulnerable populations. More, more recently, we refer to them um, as hardest to count. And it's really a process where we are reaching um, those individuals and communities um, in a geographic-based uh, approach, meaning you know, by regions, we have the 10 regions across California. It's very local uh, because that's where the expertise, the knowledge is you know, with, within our partners and our regional program managers as well and all the collaborators. Um, and then it also reflects um, who the hard to count are, 15 demographic populations that we have been focusing on from the beginning as part of this campaign. And um, with the sector-based uh, approach, that's really about going north to south across our state to supplement what is being done locally and regionally um, through a sector-based approach and also through partnerships with our statewide community-based organizations, which I'll mention in a, in a second. The SOX, of course, has a timeline. We have a timeline as part of this campaign. This is a very high-level timeline. 
It is discussed in the SOX. Uh, right now, we are in phase two, very actively so in phase two, and you will hear from our regional program manager leads momentarily on how, what that really looks like on the ground uh, across our regions and communities uh, across the state. Um, but this is a high level um, timeline, and we also have a very detailed timeline uh, of the entire operation uh, within our campaign. Um, but the SOX is really a phased approach that will uh, culminate in um, the deployment, counting and assessment, and then of course the NERFU process, which we will hear more about also from the Census Bureau. Just an update on the ground game, as I said, we're in phase two, which is really, it's really the, the calendar year 2019 and into um, 2020. And we have made a lot of progress and just in the past couple of months um, since your last meeting, the committee's last quarterly meeting. And um, we have continued to build on this ground game that you see before you. It's really about building a strong base of trusted community voices, very important. I mean, that is the hallmark of the campaign is to get folks who are trusted to then motivate, ultimately get folks who are hardest to count and vulnerable to trust in the process and fill out that form. Uh, we are looking at allowing for increased in-person impressions in hard to count communities, addressing language and communication access barriers for non-English speaking individuals and people with developmental disabilities. And that is reflected in the lockup, which I will discuss uh, momentarily. And a lot of you have talked about this also is our campaign is very much also about getting ahead of misinformation about the census. Um, there's definitely a um, big component within our campaign to address that. And really about executing an effective program that allows for rapid response and deployment of resources through the use of technology. And that in large part is SWORD, you know, the statewide uh, rapid deployment tool, uh, but other tools, um, that's really the backbone though. It's the sole, sole source of truth as our GIS and data team like to call it, because it is through that use of technology that we will also be able to document how effective this campaign has been for the next um, decennial in 2030. This uh, information is, is new to many of you. It, um, this is a list of our statewide community-based organizations that are helping us to approach um, outreach to our hard to count populations on a statewide level, so north to south, as I mentioned earlier, which supplements, adds to the local regional approach um, by our counties, our administrative CBOs, their subcontractors, and, and schools and other partners. So the statewide CBOs before you were announced. Uh, they were awarded on March 22nd, a week after the regional ACBOs, which were DDoS announced at the last quarterly meeting on um, the week of March uh, 12th. So these are our partners. We're very proud to be working with them. They're very effective uh, and, and just have a lot of uh, track record. And I'll leave it, I'll leave it there. Um, but we are getting some really great uh, plans that will become implementation plans from these partners to supplement the work that's being done locally. The air game, which refers again to our public relations uh, upcoming contractor. It's really about integrating with what's going on in the ground. It's really about this hand in glove approach of the air game or PR efforts, really supporting what's going on um, as part of the ground game and vice versa. So it's an integrated approach. Once the PR contractor is selected, there will be a lot more information in terms of for the local partners and vice versa to further address where needs may exist, you know, the gap analysis, more information to complement really each other's work and coordinate um, locally. Any questions on, on that part? We wanted to provide the committee members with uh, an opportunity for any questions or input on any of that. Just a quick question regarding the state uh, partners that were funded or are going to be funded. Can you give us an idea of the amounts that they're going to be receiving just in 
uh, a wide range because I see some of those organizations, they're very well known, they're large, like Latino Community Foundation has, but there are also some smaller ones. So I imagine also that the fund distribution is also going to be varying quite a bit. Yes, you know, as part of the competitive process, it was a competitive RFP process for the statewide, just like uh, it was for the regional ACBOs. Um, we, they were asked to submit tiered proposals, so specifically for a budget of 100,000 at the minimum level, uh, followed by 250,000, uh, and the third tier was 400,000. And basically it was, a, it was a process by which the selection committee looked at uh, which of those tiered proposals was the most cost effective, was the best bang for the buck, you know, was the best added value. And so th th that was how the selection happened, but th those were the ranges. And that's why there, there's a variance in, uh, you know, certain statewide CBOs are at 400,000, others are at 100, and it also has to do with the need, you know, the, the, the data in terms of number of hard to count for that particular demographic. Um, so looking at the need and then also the competitiveness of the proposals at each of those tiered levels. Uh, yeah. Chris. Use your mic, use your mic. If you could talk to the, um, so in targeting the, the hard to count communities and organizations that could do communications to those communities, um, I'm wondering how you, how you see these organizations. So I see organizations represent the Latino community, um, the API community, not so much the African American community, but maybe you can point out which of these organizations have that expertise or that niche that's gonna help us hit that community and several of the other hard to count communities, such as the, the disabled, the um, hearing impaired, and so forth. So there are a couple of questions in there. So we, we received bids for most of our 15 demographic um, hard to count populations. Um, there were five for which we did not receive bids, but for the African American communities across California, Cal, uh, California Calls is the chosen contractor they were actually the only bidder. I think I can say that. They were. And, and, and also remember that these statewide CBOs are supplemental, they're additive to the work being done locally, regionally. Each of our local uh, contractors must, I mean, it's fundamental, focus on all 15 hard to count demographics within their local jurisdiction. Did I answer all your, all your questions? Uh, I, I think you answered them. Um, I'm, I, I, I'm concerned that, um, I mean, I know California calls really well. I have no concern about their ability to, to hit the hard to count communities in the areas they're in, but California, <clears throat> California calls is only working in 12 counties in the state. And so my concern is for African-American populations that fall outside of those 12 counties, what is the plan um, through the statewide outreach and communication strategy to hit those gaps. So I don't expect an answer today right now, but just expressing a concern. No, I appreciate that. And, and one of the ways that we are going to address and really look at those types of gaps, if we want to call them that, or areas where we will need additional um, support and collaboration is through the upcoming implementation plan workshops. So that's, um, that's one uh, forum, one way uh, where we will start to really come together, you know, all the contractors, including the statewides, uh, to address where those gaps do exist, because that is absolutely the goal, is to look at where those gaps do exist, whether it's a particular demographic or whether it's um, a, ge a geographic um, area. Um, and then you had another question about um, the, the people with developmental disabilities. Um, we're also looking well, at addressing- Disabilities in, in general. Disabilities in general, yes. People with disabilities, which is one of our 15 hard to count. Uh, veterans, uh, homeless, we're in the process of, of, of looking at how we're going to address 
the fact that we did not receive bids for those um, demographics. Can you share which five you didn't receive bids for? Yes, it was people with disabilities, veterans, homeless individuals and families, um, awesome. Middle Eastern, North African, MENA, and the fifth was seniors or older adults, and children ages zero to five. Thank you. Well, Chris, I, I take and your actually, point. if sorry, if, if you all have suggestions, and I, I know we asked that at the previous meeting, uh, ways or resources, um, definitely let us know. Yeah. And no, just one, no, one last ahead, follow up. Is there a plan to um, reopen uh, the RFP process for organizations who could fill the, the gap, the five um, that did not receive a bid? Also, we, because of time constraints, we currently are not looking at opening up a competitive process. And Didas may correct me if I'm wrong, but that is. So we, we are doing a pretty comprehensive gap analysis on this, and um, Marcy will talk to our sector outreach and some approaches. Because we are exempt, we are um, talking to folks that do will fill those gaps and figuring out doing our due diligence about who they are capacity and figuring out how we can you know engage them um but uh we definitely uh if we needed to do an expedited one to go out there we could but i think that i'm pretty confident that we can identify uh particularly folks in the children zero to five who we've been working with um ways to get them quickly aboard um, with, uh, we gave out our current four million, and so it's really July one. Um, should the budget pass, that we'll have additional about six million for the statewide CBOs. So, Chris, I appreciate you saying that you understand the response that's been given, but does it mean it's satisfactory necessarily to the committee? Uh, so, by the next meeting, or in all likelihood sooner, a supplemental plan for how we can fill fill these statewide. CBO gaps, and it's probably helpful now that we know specifically where the areas are that you didn't receive bids for, uh, so we can focus our thinking and maybe our outreach uh, as a committee to the folks who are experts and have experience in, in these specific areas. And I know part of the filling in the the gap plan is to, you know, for you mentioned California calls has a good uh, coverage in 12 counties, but what does it mean for the other 46? Uh, so the ACBOs and the CBOs and those 46, at least for the time being, are they being told, hey, we don't have a statewide CBO for this hard to count demographic, so we're gonna need you to up your game on this until we figure out a statewide way to, to supplement. Does that make sense? So it's not neither or, it's, it's a combination. Regina. Yeah, well, I think Sewing was first. If you okay. wanna go first, so, you can go first. This is a simple question. Um, the implementation, implementation plan, it's when all the CBOs they come together and so they can talk and that was what the foundation was gonna help fund or is this something separate and different? And is there a role for the commission to sit on and listen and give input? Is there, are we built into that um, structure? And regarding the implementation plan workshops, yes, as Zita's mentioned in her earlier presentation, absolutely, we would love for the committee members to and, and the schedule is um, posted on our website, and of course our regional program managers can provide you with that information as well for particular regions, the 26 across the state. We would love for you to actually help uh, during the workshop part, which is right after lunch, and you know specific roles and things like that. Um, um, we, we have a, a design, if you will, of the day and, and where we would love to see you plug in. So yes, definitely. Ooh, okay, because then we can help maybe fill in some of those gaps right. ourselves. So, so unless you tell us otherwise, it, I take it that we're all encouraged and invited to attend yes. and participate. I would and love help, it if all and, of you would and, go to and our help, 26. <laughs> and help move issue. people. Except for the and, farm issue. And, right, and oh, help right, move okay. people to attend and participate as well with the one caveat being, please advise the staff if you're coming so we can keep track if there's a quorum present, there are certain notice obligations this committee would have. Actually, it's not even quorum, it's three's a crowd. Three's a crowd. And I remember my Bagley Keen training, so no more than two members at each site. Okay. So, so, through Laura. All right. I don't want to so see that, any of y'all in San Diego. 
<laughs> Let the team know. That, that's an important point, yes, very important. And the schedule is in your packets. Okay. I just wanted to, okay. Regina and then Tom. Yeah, I just wanted to thank Chris for actually bringing that up. I know that I've gotten several, several calls about it. Um, and I think at our last meeting in March, um, there, the AKAs, um, did come and they talked about just not knowing. And I know that um, my big, I'll get on my soapbox when I talk about public notice in government, <laughs> people just don't know. It's great we put things on websites, but if we don't push it out to the people, they just don't know. And so um, it's something that I'm just fighting for government just to be better at um, in general in my day job um, is to make sure that we're making sure that people know they just don't have the information and just putting it on a website just doesn't do it. And so um, I'm happy to hear that there's that opportunity to be able to go back out because I do believe that BWAPA also did apply at the state level, their African American woman ran organization. So I do believe that they applied, but I think we need to talk a little bit about um, also the contracting rules because I believe that most of the statewide African American organizations didn't have the capacity, they could not say that they could apply by saying that you had five or more employees. And so the reality is if we know the deficits um, that many organizations are struggling to um, just make it in California, then we need to make sure that we have language that's inviting to allow them to come. Many people couldn't compete. And so I think we have to look at that on all levels. So they may not have known about it and then they couldn't compete. So maybe there's some kind of way to look at, since we have flexible contracting rules, there's some way to look at how to cater to you know, that audience so that you can get them to apply. Tom. So thank you very much for the presentation and, and thank you for letting us know that you're doing a gap analysis. I, 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 I don't need an answer now, but in that gap analysis, I'd like to learn more about how we're making sure that we're reaching youth and young adults, by which I mean younger millennials and Gen Z who may be in single person or dual person households. Um, these are some very venerable and very accomplished organizations um, that I have complete confidence in being able to reach out to older by which I mean 30 and above members of the different communities, but I'm not necessarily convinced that if I think about Gen Z members of the different hard to count communities, that these organizations are going to be the ones to do it. And that's not meant to diminish any of them, but I do wanna make sure that we're attending to that cohort of youth and young adults. So I hope to hear more about that. Thank you. I'll just say that we absolutely are, and it's through various ways, through our sector work, which you'll hear a little bit more on. Tech and innovation was deliberate as a sector because, because of the explosion of social media and the millennial awakening or reawakening, you know, politically, civically, um, and also because of the expected online response. So for those reasons, and also through our schools, uh, you know, Mignon, Pollard, um, um, Lucky is, is working on that, uh, education and higher ed and involving um, our younger millennials and, and others, um, knowing that young folks are trusted messengers within their households. So it's, really uh, it's all terrific, I appreciate that, and I just wanted to add, and I know you know this, but I'm particularly interested in how we're going to be able to utilize the immigrant youth organizations that have been very successful in organizing around all kinds of issues, but in some ways have really developed their identity somewhat in opposition to the established uh, immigrant and Latino organizations, and they're out there and we need to find the best way to use them, and I know you know this, but. Thank you. Another potential resource uh, for you to consider, uh, I know that both the State Assembly and the State Senate have established select committees on the census, and they have hearings and help distribute information as well, but the legislative caucuses can sometimes be a resource for, you know, whether it's, you know, outreach folks, local leaders, uh, media organizations, and otherwise. So the African American, the Black Caucus, the Latino Caucus, API Caucus, Women's Caucus, uh, LGBTQ Caucus, et cetera. 
Okay. Other uh, questions, comments on this section of the outreach report? If not, let's go ahead uh, to the next section. Okay. As most of you know, the language and communication access plan was released on May 17th. At the previous uh, quarterly committee meeting, we shared with you a draft um, of that, of that uh, plan, which it was really geared predominantly, primarily um, at contractors to provide them with requirements and guidance on how to make sure that we are providing equal and meaningful access for limited English proficient individuals and people with disabilities. And this is the definition that um, we hold uh, very seriously um, in their primary language in accessible formats. Um, and so the lockup was, was released uh, following months of a lot of research, a lot of uh, input, uh, talking with easily over 20 uh, organizations, uh, and including at that quarterly meeting, we, we also heard, and through uh, legislative hearings and other forums, we've heard a lot of uh, input, questions, uh, suggestions, and we've taken all of that over the past few months and um, produced the, the final uh, plan, the, the lockup, which was released, released on May 17th. Uh, which includes uh, requirements and guidance for our contractors. And we arrived at a central goal, which is to ensure that we reach a median of 91.3% of limited English proficient individuals in each um, county with, with this uh, approach, which is reflected in the, um, in the document, in the lockup. And I just kind of wanted to focus uh, a little bit on, on this, which is really at the heart of what the lockup is, the document, um, and you know, ultimately the requirements for our contractors. And um, the methodology was really, um, and, and thanks to our GIS and data team on, on our California Complete Count team and office um, for, the, for the data, because this is very much data-driven. And we arrived at a methodology to identify languages that contractors need to support when conducting outreach activities. And the methodology also incorporates a median limited English proficient um, population count and resulting in what we, we, we came up with 41 geographic data areas, which includes all 58 counties. Um, uh, excluding LA County, which was in its own category because of its unique population size and dynamics. And, um, and the lockup ensures that, again, a minimum of 91% of the statewide LEP population will be reached by this approach. And um, just a couple of requirements, and again, the lockup really goes um, deep into these three um, areas, but all geographic areas, regardless of LEP population, are required to provide language support activities in English and Spanish. So that's for everyone, regardless of region. Um, the geographic areas with total LEP populations below 54,000, the median, uh, are required to provide language support activities for any single language spoken by more than 1,500 people. And uh, for most of the uh, local jurisdictions, this is no more than two languages. And the lockup, the document clearly lists uh, the counties that fall under this category. And then the, the next category is geographic areas with total LEP populations equal to or greater than 54,000. Uh, those jurisdictions are required to provide language support activities for any single language that, meet, that meets one of the following criteria, either 3% of the total LEP population or 3,000 um, LEP individuals, whichever yields the greatest number of LEPs. And the lockup uh, includes the list of geographies that are included in that category. And then finally, LA County is its own category. And um, due to the size of its LEP population, and also because it is, and again, all data-driven, hardest to count includes hardest to count city and the whole country, not just in the whole state. So we 
uh, looked at that and then given the, the standards and, and the goals that we were trying to achieve through our entire lang language and communication access approach uh, statewide, LA County um, is in a category on its own and is required to provide language support activities in the top 12 non-English languages in LA County. Um, and this actually will provide support to more than 95% of the LEP population in LA County. And the document goes into um, other more specific uh, requirements and also good practices or recommendations for how to implement um, some of those outreach activities in language. And of course, the document uh, reflects equal emphasis on providing access to people with disabilities. And now, at this point, I'll turn it over to our regional program manager, Leeds. Before we do that, can we see if there's questions or input on the language access parts of this report? I know I have one. If we can go back to the previous slide. Okay. Uh, under LA County, you don't just say top 12 languages, but you name them. Uh, I see Tagalog and I see Filipino. Right. It's Are they different? <laughs> I'm These not are langui languages and language groups. It's yeah. it's a data yeah. question. It's Tagalog. I I don't know if you there's language and there's I've been language. A, I've groups. been asked the question, so I want to yeah. know what the answer is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. I mean, it, to the feds, it's Tagalog, and I mean, I know I'm Filipino. I don't know if my other Filipino peeps are here, but um, the same with the question being Chinese Mandarin, right. simplified Chinese. So it, it's just a a slice and dice of uh, the way we collected the data. Ah, gotcha. Yeah, so the there's so there's 15 named, but those 15 truly are 12. They're just known as different if we bunch them. All right. Maybe for clarity, we can do Tagalog slash Filipino, so we know it's they go together: Chinese, Mandarin, mm -hmm. etc. Cantonese. Chris, My colleague is struggling, so I will speak up for him, and he can chime in when he gets together. Um, so <laughs> I, I would I would advise not to do a slash because there are other um, Filipinos do speak other languages than Tagalog. There are other dialects, just like with Chinese, Mandarin is a dialect and so is um, um, Cantonese. And, and so don't, I would suggest not to do a slash just to list what other languages it might be in. Would you maybe put them together like in the same row? Well, oh. I mean, you could put them in the same row, but you don't have Chinese and Mandarin in this. Well, that's what I'm saying. They should probably put them kind of connected together. No? No, no yeah. Well, yeah, John. Yeah, the Filipino, <laughs> yeah, uh, Filipino is derivative of Tagalog, um, but they are not, they're, they're similar, but they're not the same. Um, so there wouldn't be a, a slash Filipino and Tagalog. Uh, whether they're in the same row, I'm, I'm indifferent to, but uh, they are different languages, and as such, should be, should be listed separately. Okay. Fair. No slash. <laughs> uh, other questions, comments? So. Yeah, I was actually gonna just take this opportunity to share about the Chinese and the Mandarin. So Chinese, Mandarin is a spoken language, which is Chinese. Cantonese is Chinese, Fukunese is Chinese, Hakanese is Chinese, Fujianese is Chinese. They're all Chinese. So, ch so Mandarin is a subset of Chinese. Now, when you speak about simplified versus traditional, those are written Chinese forms. So Mandarin, Cantonese are spoken forms. So I think we should know all that in the room here. We should know that. So when we share the information out, so in the written form, like the census data, it looks like they've identified that the simplified form which is post-communist China, has the broader reach than the traditional, which is pre-communist China. And I think there's probably some truth to that. So when we have printed materials that we tell the CBOs, or the ACBOs or CBOs or the statewide to print, checking in whether it should be in traditional simplified Chinese. Now if it's oral, if it's spoken, then depending on the region in, the U in, in California, there's gonna be pockets that are more Cantonese speak, pockets are more Taiwanese speaking, pockets that are more Mandarin speaking. So to share that awareness with the, the folks who have received contracts so that they don't spend resources on a 
you know, on a Chinese spoken that is different than what the region calls for or, or the written form that may be different than what the communities read? The other question I had was more of a, of a functional question. You know, you said all geographic areas will be required to cover English and Spanish. Additional languages beyond that will vary sort of region by region, county by county. You may have some counties that have a you know, specific language that they'll be um, translating materials, written, you know, visual, et cetera, in. I got to believe that there's other counties that may not have the population threshold to, to require them, but would still benefit from access to those uh, translated materials. So what systems are in place for content sharing across counties, number one, and number two, how are our ACBOs, CBOs, and other partners uh, informed of the availability of all this? Yes, there is. Uh, that's one of the fundamental parts of the operation, and it is um, discussed in the lockup in the document. There will be a clearinghouse um, managed um, by our office. Um, part of that, in large part, will be our PR contractor. We'll have um, um, a lot of that, um, some of that responsibility, I should say, for example, a public facing uh, website um, that will include information available in California's top 12 languages. Not that the website will be translated into 12 languages, but it, the website, through the website, there will be material available in California's top 12 languages, and that's discussed in the, in the lockup. And the regional program managers are a, a key. They're uh, absolute, your best friend when it comes to being able to access these types of resources. A couple of our, at least a couple of our statewide CBOs, Asian Americans Advancing Justice and MICOP, uh, which is Mixteco Indigena uh, Collaboration Project, they are the, the meatiest part of what they're gonna do is really in language support for those particular, in, in the case of um, Advancing Justice, API uh, languages. Not all of them, but a lot of them, and so that information will be shared. It will be available through our clearinghouse and also uh, our regional program managers will be great facilitators to that information. And then in the case of MICOP in indigenous languages, which are clustered in certain parts of the state, including non-written languages, like Zapoteco, Triqui, and other languages. Um, and again, you know, with the IPW's implementation plan workshops coming up, we will be sharing a lot more information with each other, the co contractors, to understand what additional resources exist in certain parts of the state that, again, can be um, then shared with other parts of the state through our RPMs and other, and other ways and identifying gaps that still exist, it's particularly in this section of lockup, language access and communication access, that 9% that that um, is not addressed, you know, in our in our in our approach. What, gap is that analysis is a big what part does of that clearinghouse you keep referencing look like, or what will it look like? Is it a section on the web page with downloadable flyers and graphics for social media, et cetera? Or? Yes, yes, it'll be online resources. Um, for example, um, te templates to meeting agendas. Um, that are kind of you know generic, but then can be customized depending on what community across California for for which target audience, which of the 15 hard to count, and what language, and then it can be um, customized or tailored to um, that particular um, jurisdiction and that particular audience. So it'll be an online resource facilitated and managed through our Complete Count office. Okay. This is. Thank you. Just to follow up on this question of um, language access and information for specific um, communities, um, in the Central Valley, as you know, and you just touched upon it briefly with the reference to Mico, we have a lot of indigenous immigrants from Oaxaca, Guerrero, and other parts uh, of Mexico. 
Um, and these languages and the immigrants themselves, the, well, the immigrants in particular, uh, tend to have low literacy levels and also high percentage of people who have never gone to school. So for them, written materials are not gonna be, even in their indigenous languages, are not going to be feasible. So we need to develop other sources of information, video or what have you, that are gonna be appropriate for them. So I don't know to what extent the MECO proposal that was submitted is going to be included the development of such materials, but I would also, um, ask you if, if there are other partners that are being funded or even ACBOs throughout the state that might be able to have that capacity to also develop materials. And more recently also, and I'm sure it's not the only part of the state that is um, seeing this taking place, on Friday when we had the meeting of the Fresno Complete Count Committee, one of the persons in attendance there was the principal of Fresno Adult School who uh, requested our assistance because she was getting, well, adult schools throughout the state receive huge number of immigrants from all over uh, the world. But in particular, one of the needs that she said that was urgent right now because there is a, an, uh, an increasing arrival of them uh, was of indigenous immigrants from Guatemala who speak another set of languages. So there in Fresno, we couldn't think of any single organization or agency or in the Central Valley as a whole that actually would have that type of capacity. So we have to look elsewhere to even have someone who would be competent in those specific languages. Uh, we need to begin to take that into account uh, and go beyond the uh, Oaxaca and Guerrero languages that we know are very significant in the Central Valley and other parts of California, but also see how we can address the needs of these new immigrants that may be coming in from Guatemala or elsewhere. Definitely appreciate the point. Gerald, and then uh, back to Chris. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Jesus. Can you turn your mic on, please? Uh, thank you, Jesus. I was just going to raise this issue of, of Guatemalan uh, immigrants who speak indigenous languages, uh, which are not in written form. And there's a, there's a particular issue there, which is that they're coming in large numbers, as Jesus says, but they have been coming actually for uh, about uh, 20 years or so uh, in significant numbers. and. Uh, they're not just in the Central Valley, they are also in LA um, and in the Bay Area. And uh, the other problem is that hardly any of these people have legal status. So there is a special impact of you know, the citizenship question and the general fear. Uh, you know, they're coming from a country where they have fear of the government too, and then they come here and there's additional reason to have fear. So. Uh, and I think that just those challenges are, make this an extraordinarily hard to count group. Chris. Uh, yeah, I, I was gonna ask how, how, um, how are you tracking where uh, these contractors would need to be placed or where are you finding, how are you finding a limited English profici proficiency populations? Through data, so thanks to our GIS and data team, um, we have that information. Um, and for limited English proficient, where they're clustered, so that's uh, available through the Hard to Count Index map. It's one of the indicators, so that we have that information and we see where they are. And that's, that's based on past census data? Yes, um, yes. Just a suggestion, if they're GIS, they, they should be able to to do an overlay of the schools, um, the state's public education, limited English proficiency data, where you find limited English proficiency students, you're gonna find parents, and that might be more up to date than the last um, census data. Yes, ACS data and the micro, what is it? I always forget, it's a footnote. And Elsa, it's microphones data and it's ACS data, that's where we did our, which I think is yes. 2007. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're at least a couple of, Sorry. they did a great job, I must say. Our GIS and data folks working with, you know, Department of Finance, they, because, you know, we kept challenging them on, we get the best data, the most updated, California specific, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it was literally a month long process of, going back and forth on the data to get the best, most updated, more most California-centric data that we could find. So, and I appreciate your, 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 your comment, and um, we'll, we'll look at the, the education. I think, oh, I think it we haven't looked good. at that, but I'll, we'll double check. Yeah. 
right. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if this is appropriate, but I would wonder if you're investing correctly, if your contractors are working on languages that we're providing full internet accessibility, because in the top 12 languages that we have full internet translation, and our census questionnaire assistance centers have verbal language translators, we really need to help beyond those places. I think those places are pretty well covered, and if your contractors are investing time there, it may be kind of spending your money where we're already spending ours. And I would just throw that out. Well, we'll get to that. So coordination and collaboration of federal and state strategies and resources uh, in a minute, but that's a, a point well, well taken. Uh, so, um, in speaking with the leadership from the deaf community, it's almost the ones that are hard to count are the ones don't exist in data also because they're not captured. So then it's like a this vicious loop where you're undercounted because you're not counted, you're not counted, so you're not <laughs> counted additionally. So I, I I know that you're looking at speakers of a language that's 1500 versus you know more or less. I know in speaking with her, uh, Sherry, I'm talking about Sherry Farina, she was one of the speakers uh, at the webinar. She had shared that they had to extrapolate, statistically figure out something because there's not data collected. So falling in line with the Guatemalan groups, there's probably subpopulations that their numbers don't exist. So I just, just be mindful that the hard accounts may be the ones that are, you know, not counted for data to be even used. Yes, we 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 uh, found that to be the case, and that's one of that's one of the areas where we do have a gap, and uh, we want to address that. Starting with the implementation plan workshops, and see how we can address that particular challenge. Great. Other questions, comments? All right. Thank you for your work in this section. I know we have regional updates next, so let's uh, move on. Yes, so I'm gonna hand it over now to the three regional program manager leads who uh, cover the entire state of California, uh, south, north, central. Each of them oversee at least three regions in addition to managing their own region. So Quintilia, we'll start with you. She uh, covers oversees Southern California and also uh, oversees or manages the Inland Empire. Thank you, Adriana. Thank you, Secretary of State and uh, committee members for being here. It's an honor to present to you. My name is Quintilia Avila. I'm the Regional Program Manager in the Southern California lead. So I oversee the regions uh, eight, thank you, seven, eight, and nine. Seven is the uh, San Bernardino and Riverside counties, make up region seven. Region eight is Los Angeles County. We have three regional program managers with Los Angeles County. Region nine is Orange County. And region 10 is Imperial County and San Diego County. They are both they both form region region 10. So that's the vast uh, Southern California area that I cover. Thank you, and this is the uh, estimated hard to count population per region, 1.2 in region seven, 4.1 in region eight, over 700,000 in region nine and almost uh, 800,000 in region 10. These are our contracting partners for Region 7, Riverside and San Bernardino counties. We have the Community Foundation who's been selected as the ACBO for Region 8 in Los Angeles County. We have the California Community Foundation. Region 9 for Orange County, we have Charitable Ventures of Orange County. And for Region 10 for San Diego and Imperial counties, we have the United Way of San Diego. So 
So looking ahead, we have a, a couple of implementation plan workshops for region seven, eight, and nine, and 10. All th first three implementation plan workshops or IPWs will be starting one tomorrow. So I will be in Palm Desert tomorrow at UC Riverside Palm Desert campus. June 12th, Wednesday at UC Riverside, and June 14th, San Bernardino Valley College. I believe I was checked in with Laura, and there's no CCCC member out in Region 7, but I welcome you to come to any Region 7 IPWs. You can see for Region 8, we have, we have several IPWs that will be coming from Long Beach, Huntington Park. These are broken up by the regions of how the Community Foundation has also broken up Los Angeles County. And we'll have a last one in Los Angeles, gonna do a, what we call a super convening. Region 9 will have one in August 23rd in the county office in the city of Orange, in the county of Orange. And we have two dates in Region 10, Imperial and San Diego counties. Would you like to stop for questions or do we just go on to the next? Uh, why don't we continue with each of the regions and then we'll ask questions collectively. Thank you. Thank you so much. <coughs> My name is Emilio Vaca, uh, Honorable Chair and Distinguished um, Committee members. Um, my my role is I help represent the Central California region, uh, looking at, oh yeah, I have control. Woohoo. Um, so I, I get to oversee regions four, five, and six. Um, in regions four, that's the northern San Joaquin Valley. Uh, region five is the central coast. Um, and region six is the south um, San Joaquin Valley. And the estimated uh, hard to count populations, and the reason why we included these slides was to provide a, a, a clear idea of where we're targeting our, our efforts with our partners with the ACBOs and the counties and also uh, to give a glimpse of what we're looking at on the ground. So for region four, uh, there's an estimated 541,000 hard to count. Region five has roughly the same 525. And region six is uh, estimated at a 1.1 million. For <clears throat> our contracting partners in regions four, um, we have Calaveras County, Madera, Mariposa, Merced, San Isabel, Tuolumne County. Opted out um, or didn't participate was Alpine, Amador, San Joaquin, and Mono. One distinction I wanna make on San Joaquin, even though they did not uh, fully participate, they did uh, designate the city of Stockton to take their portion of the funding to, to do that as well. And so the question that we always get, at, always get asked is what happens to those counties that are not participating? What we did internally is we um, provided the allocated funding that would have gone to those counties to the administrative uh, regional ACBOs. So they would, on top of what they were already expected to do with their ACBO dollars, we uh, adjusted and allocated additional funding to cover the rest of the county. Um, and some of these counties, we're not looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars, we're looking at $25,000. So um, maybe it's a couple more uh, questionnaire assistance centers that we'll be able to put there. Uh, for the administrative CBO for region four, it's Faith in Action Network. In region five, we have San Benito, uh, San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, Santa Cruz, Monterrey, and Ventura County. Uh, there were none that uh, didn't want to participate. They all wanted to participate, which is great. Uh, the ACBO for, for that region is Ventura County Community Foundation. In Region 6, we have all of them, which is Fresno, Inyo, Kern, Kings, and Tulare County. Uh, all opting in. Uh, we also have for the ACBO the Sierra Health Foundation, the Center for Health Project Management. And one of the things that um, you've heard throughout today as far as a common theme is what are we doing with our contractors? We're really focusing on them to one, uh, the ACBOs have been on this fast track to provide a strategic plan. Uh, two, we've also encouraged them to work closely with their local complete count committees. Um, and 
the other part of that is also working closely with their counties. Uh, one of the things that we've, at least in these three regions, that's come out of uh, their eagerness as the ACBOs are, um, they are also looking at some uh, projected uh, gap analysis prior to the implementation plan workshops as a way to give us an idea of what that will look like for the, the central California regions. Um, and looking ahead, we have in Region 4, um, August 5th at UC Merced, our um, IPW there, or Implementation Plan Workshop there. The county's representative, representative that will be there will be Merced, San Estlas, Mariposa, Madera, and Mono. Uh, we don't have a date yet selected for Stockton, um, and the reason being is that it's technically our ACBO and the city of Stockton and one more county participating. So we're just trying to negotiate and see if it's easier just to have one, to have them go down to Merced, or we will carve out a special date in, Aug in August for, for them to participate in the city of Stockton. For Region 5, we have uh, July 17th in the city of Salinas. Uh, we have the counties of Monterey, San Benito, Santa Cruz. Uh, July 18th, uh, we'll be down in San Luis Obispo. Um, and those two counties represented there will be the uh, San Luis Obispo County and Santa Barbara. And August 8th will be Oxnard uh, with Ventura County. For Region 6, August 6, uh, DDIS will be busy uh, as well as our staff for that first week of August. We'll be down in Fresno uh, where we'll have Fresno, Kings, and Tulare participating in that implementation plan workshop. Uh, August 7th uh, will be in Bakersfield and that will be Kern and Inyo. And I'll just turn it over to our northern lead, uh, Yumi. So good afternoon, my name is Yumi Sarah. I'm the Northern California Lead Regional Program Manager. It's a vast area as you can see from the map, both geographically, uh, starting from the Bay Area all the way to the Oregon border. Um, vast in terms of geography, but also in terms of, of um, the hard to count population. So in, in the Region 1 area, we've got an estimated hard to count population of 619,000. Uh, this is the region encompassing uh, Sacramento um, and North. And in the Region 2 area, we've got an estimated uh, population of, of about 131,000. This is um, the wine country area plus um, uh, up north all the way to Humboldt and, and Trinity. Region three is the estimated, hard, we've got an estimated hard to count population of 1.4 million, and this is the urban areas of the Bay Area. The contracting partners that we have in terms of the counties in region one, so just by the, by the um, names of these counties, you can see how, how different and vast these, these, um, uh, these counties are. So in region one, we've got Placer, Shasta, Tehama, Yuba, Sutter, Modoc, Calusa, Sacramento, Yolo, and Nevada. Um, and we have several who have opted out. El Dorado, Sierra, Siskiyou, Plumas, Lassen, Glen, and Butte. And our ACBO, the Sacramento Region Community Foundation, is, is um, supporting all of Region 1, including the opt-out counties. In Region 2, we've got Sonoma, Lake, Napa, Mendocino, Del Norte, and Humboldt with the opted out county of uh, Trinity. And the United, um, so Trinity is being uh, supported by the California Rural Policy, California Center for Rural Policy, which is also working with Del Norte and Humboldt. And the ACBO there um, is United Way of the Wine Country. In Region 3, we've got Alameda, Contra Costa, Marin, Solano, San Mateo, Santa Clara, San Francisco, and the United Way of the Bay Area is supporting, um, supporting this region uh, as, the, as the ACBO. So looking ahead, we've got a um, Region 1 um, implementation plan workshop coming up in Sacramento, and I've already um, put check marks after your names of those of you who uh, who are in Sacramento. Uh, it'll be at the um, at Sac State Alumni Center, 
And the counties that will be participating is El Dorado, Sacramento, and Yolo. On June 24th, we'll be in Red Bluff, and we've got the more rural counties up north um, at, at this uh, implementation plan workshop. So these will look a little bit different. We're tailoring each of these workshops um, according to the participants. Uh, so we've got the northern counties um, going to the Red Bluff um, on June 24th. In region, tw in region two, um, in Ju on July 31st, we'll be up in Arcata uh, with Humboldt, Del Norte, Trini Trinity, and Mendocino. And because this is a very rural area, part of this will be webcast, um, so more people can participate from the uh, northern counties. On August 2nd, we'll be Santa Rosa. And we've got Sonoma, Lake, Napa, and Mendocino participating in those. In Region 3, we've got um, also coming up is June 19th in Richmond. And we've got a cluster of counties there, Alameda, Marin, Solano, and Contra Costa. Uh, and June 26th, we've got Redwood City with San Mateo and Santa Clara. And July 10th, we've got San Francisco um, with a, a place to be determined. Okay, so in terms of how you can help, um, how the committee can help, is to support us by attending the implementation plan workshop. Join our Speakers Bureau, and I think um, most of you have heard about our Speakers Bureau, but to be sort of the ambassadors um, uh, around the census. And then three is to advise on areas of expertise that you might have that um, could f help us fill some of our gaps. So thank you. Let's open up to questions for uh, all of them. Regina? So my first question is, how will people know about all of these great <laughs> events? How will people know about these events? Are we going to be using maybe um, from the last 24 convenings? I'm assuming that's going to be probably part of this list. But I was asking how are, like who's supposed to attend and how are they supposed to know about it? So those folks that we haven't yet figured out how to engage or, or you know, just learning about the process, what are you doing to make sure that, they're, that people know about it? Well, I can speak generally on that. So the, the main purpose of the implementation plan workshops is for the contractors and collaborators, um, other partners, for example, that are not uh, under contract with us to to work now toward the implementation plans which are due in the fall. So they, you know, having just submitted the strategic plan. So that's the main thrust behind the IPWs, the purpose why, for which we coordinated 26 of them across the, the state. Again, to coordinate, identify where there are still needs that need to be addressed, thus the gap analysis. And it's really the RPMs, you know, the regional program managers are one of the main ways that Certainly the contractors know about them. The uh, regional program managers have uh, been putting together and working with what we call planning committees that includes the contractors, counties, ACBOs, statewide CBOs, uh, staff from um, legis legislative offices, staff from congressional offices, um, local complete count committee um, leaders and, and partner cities within the counties, like in LA, there are over 90 cities. So it's a, it's a process by which the regional program managers, um, since you know they, they've been on board early this year, is pulling in these, uh, these collaborators, these individuals to help, you know, because it is a, a huge team effort, you know, a village effort. You've heard Dita's mention it takes many villages because it does. So the RPMs are really pushing out the information, including these IPWs, but it also takes the help, and so they have been reaching out to these um, entities that I just mentioned, um, and the LCCCs across the state have been really instrumental. They've been a focal point for us. For example, the leads just mentioned the opt-outs. Those are counties that chose not to be a fiscal agent, but they are fully engaged in the census outreach effort through uh, their local complete count committees or working with uh, the ACBOs. Uh, you know, it, it looks very different in any of the 10 regions um, that you choose, but the point being that it's really on the ground that 
all these partners do know about what's going on. And if they don't, please let us know because again, the RPMs will definitely help facilitate bringing people who do need to be there or need to be at the table to the table. So if I could just Look. summarize a little bit. So the morning session, there will be media advisory. Um, and so that we would expect um, the, the leaders that are coming to have media availability. Um, and then um, the afternoon session, as she said, will be with contractors, but we are inviting from the 24, we, and uh, we've collected all the folks yeah, that attended because we did promise last time around that we would come back. In addition, we have, it's under constant contact right now, not to get mm -hmm. too technical, uh, but through our website, we've collected people who are interested and want to know, and they've checked where they want to know, so that's also being pushed out. Um, but we can also provide something language to all the members here that if you guys wanted to push out uh, to your networks as well. Thanks. So, so, so yes to, to all of that. But just to be clear, and I apologize if y'all have discussed this in prior meetings, this is my first. The objective of these workshops, my sense is it's not just folks who are already contractors. Right? There's room for others who are not contractors, community leaders in some way, shape, or form to come in, get an update, and help further inform the plans and the strategy going forward, yes or no? Yes, okay. absolutely. So, but so it I is think required for the contractors. But yes, it is required for the contractors, but yes, absolutely, because it is through these uh, potentially new, uh, let's say, new subcontractors or new collaborators that the the um, addressing of those gaps will happen. Because right. again, just from so a process standpoint, if all we're doing is talking to each other still, there's no new information that comes in and there's no growth, uh, you know, more to, more to be learned to inform our strategy going next year. So I guess I think it's incumbent upon all of us to help spread the word. Our PMs are supposed to be doing their job. <laughs> uh, but, you know, they definitely need our help. Uh, let's go to Nick. So what are we doing um, to make sure that our ACBOs um, are honoring um, you know, the good faith intention that they're going to be collaborating um, with CCCs and with CBOs, or um, yeah, with CBOs within their area? Because I'll tell you right now, it's not happening. Um, and so while, yes, it's important that we have our ears on the ground and communicate that to you, I don't think that we're gonna cover the entire state. So I'd like to hear um, from the three of you, what questions are you asking? What are you doing to make sure um, that they're collaborating like they say they're, they're doing? So I, I cover Southern California and I personally oversee Region 7, so it's San Bernardino and Riverside counties. And I know that the, both the, the chair, the two, we have two co-chairs, one from San Bernardino, a supervisor from San Bernardino and a supervisor from Riverside County, who they're the co-chairs of the steering committee. And then we have our main contact, Dr. Karthik Rama, Ramakrishnan, thank you. I just call him Dr. Karthik. Uh, he is kind of the brain behind a lot of the uh, Complete Count Committee, the Implement, uh, Inland Empire Complete Count Committee. And they are, we have formed a stakeholders strategy group. So we have the ACBO in the room, the counties in the room, uh, the subcontractors in the room, and some co Complete Count Committee members as well. So there's a lot of collabor collaboration, if I can speak of directly, for Region 7. And for the other regions that I have uh, oversee, uh, we will soon, if not already, some have been meeting together. The ACBOs and the counties have been meeting face-to-face, -face, or it will be happening next week or the following week. So uh, the RPMs are pushing out that we need to have our contractors meeting face-to-face -face and also collaborating with the complete count committees and attending those meetings and subcommittee meetings. So? Um, I'll, I'll add to that as well. Um, okay. I saw you looking at me, that's why. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I felt your energy on that one. So for the regions four and specifically region six, um, the, the ACBOs have, uh, one of the things that, uh, another question was asked uh, as we prepared for, for our presentation, where were some of those challenges? 
And so some of the challenges that we've addressed, at least for those two specific regions, is that those are the, the three regions that were up, up, up last. Right, we finally had a lead in that re in that central uh, central California. We actually had a regional uh, program manager in Fresno added to the team. Um, so it was one of the last three regions in the state to come up. What's happened with that is we we've had our uh, U.S. Census Bureau partners uh, getting on the local level folks to start their own local complete count committees, and so we have on one track local complete count committees where the counties nor the ACBOs were part of originally, and now part of our challenge is as the, the leads and the RPMs is to move them over and say, let's not recreate the wheel, uh, let's have you participate on what's already been happening. And so those are some of the things that we've noticed, at least in regions four and six, as in region five as well, is that some of these specific counties and their local complete count committees are way far ahead than when we decided to uh, contract uh, our specific partners. And so they, uh, we're just trying to get them back to the table. And the other thing that we are ensuring, and, and when you asked uh, specifically what questions are we asking them, is how, how have they reached out to the local Clipion committee when we're looking at their strategic plans? Do you have any reference to participate in this many uh, and so those, and in that we, I know personally that I, I interact with my ACBO, um, and if they're listening on, on the, on, on the, uh, in the, on the computer uh, or here in person, they know that I'm on them every week, um, asking them questions or they're asking me questions. And the same thing with our counties. Uh, we do have some counties that, uh, even though they did decide to participate, they came at you know a, a, a month after I started or in between that. And so getting, make, making sure that their pro, uh, paperwork is all processed and they're good to go. So we do have those unique challenges. Um, and I think within that, I'll take um, uh, uh, one of the questions that was asked earlier in the day from uh, Regina Brown Wilson is, um, how can folks participate uh, in ensuring that the ACBOs uh, and community-based organizations and the counties in the way that we viewed our work and the way that we've talked with our partners is participate at the local level. And that's where we're getting the counties and the ACBOs to come and be part of those conversations because there's some great conversations happening that if the ACBO or the, one of their representatives are not part of, they're missing out some you know, amazing conversation and strategies that they might have might have left out. I'd like to just add um, one recommendation on a question, and that is who and what level are they at within your organization? Um, I've been a lot. I've been a part of a lot of collaborations where a nonprofit will send somebody who's you know entry level, and that person's knowledge of the plan or how the plan's going to be executed is totally different um, than somebody who's in a managerial position, and because time is so limited. Um, and because we have to get running now, um, I just think it's really important that we stress to the ACBOs that you gotta be sitting your top people who can walk into these counties and just start making decisions immediately. Thank you. Okay. So, yes, thank you. Um, I, you know, thinking of what Chris is saying earlier, Regina, I'm, I almost am a little worried that we are in so much into the weeds if we get the bigger groups, African Americans. And another group, uh, I had lunch with Lee that I, I'm a little worried about is also the, the rural whites. And they have, I mean, not to, to be, more, I mean, some of the individuals in that particular communities have a different relationship with government as well and that may not welcome answering census. I'm a little concerned the Shasta County, the last time around, 23% undercount. So we haven't talked about this particular population a lot and I'm wondering if you folks, I'm sure, have been thinking about it and have given it some great thoughts. I'm just curious, since that's not been really part of the conversation. Go ahead, Yumi. And rural is one of the areas. No, go ahead, Yumi. But I, I was just going to say rural is definitely one of the sectors, and we'd love your feedback or suggestions. Actually, um, because a lot of our counties are, are rural, and I've gone to some of the local complete count committee meetings in the rural areas, there's, there's a lot of similarities in terms of um, mistrust of government uh, in ter and, and for different reasons, um, uh, the low broadband access. So there's, there's a lot of similarities that I'm seeing. 
So I don't have answers for your questions right now about the rural population, but it is high on my own radar of trying to figure out, and I've had some discussions also with um, Assemblywoman uh, Cece Aguiar-Curry around, uh, uh, her staffers around this, of how really to, um, to do the outreach in a different way to rural areas. And I think my Red Bluff um, implementation plan workshop is purposely um, gathering the counties who are much more rural and who, who have voiced some of these concerns. So we'll be addressing some of those concerns. Um, and hopefully some of the, uh, I was, thank you for that question. <laughs> Let me uh, follow up to this. Uh, otherwise I have Jesus, Kathleen, oh, yeah. and then Regina. A comment um, and sort of a question for all three of you regional leads. Uh, I think that you three are uh, in very strategic positions. Uh, you're gonna be and are developing a bird's eye view of these regions that you represent. You're gonna be able to analyze, interpret what is taking place on the ground and compare what's taking place across the, the, river, the different regions that you're also covering as part of your position. So. Um, I think those insights that you may be able to generate can be very valuable to us as well to help understand more clearly what is taking place on the ground because you are gonna have that both bird's eye view but also comparing the different regions in terms of capacity, best practices, so on and so forth. Um, you're gonna have that you know, much more clear probably than, it, than the rest of us here. So I would ask you to uh, consider for follow-up meetings that we have to be able to provide a more in-depth analysis, perhaps, of what's taking place in each region. And in particular, what concerns me a lot is um, how is the capacity building process taking place? Um, what is working, what is not working in the different regions? What can we learn from the different areas? Um, you know, what, are, what is taking place that can shed light on us that we're actually following the right road towards a complete count or whether there has to be a number of changes that we have to make that's why I think your position is going to be very essential for this process as a whole. Okay. Kathleen. Um, hi, so I just had a couple of questions about LA County, which was the giant uh, swatch of the map. And the number that was given for the hard to reach population was, I think it was 4.1 million, is that correct? Um, so I just wondered if there was any additional information that could be given in terms of a breakdown of that. So um, what that number represents, um, where those communities reside specifically. So I'm looking at um, the workshops coming up and hoping, first of all, that we'll um, have access to that information and those dates so that we can share that. Um, but also thinking about there are a number of workshops in LA County, I think it would be helpful if we're going to do a gap analysis there at those workshops to know in those particular regions, what is maybe um, you know two or three of the more difficult to reach communities or populations in those specific locations so we can send the right people to those workshops to know how best to meet the gaps. We have that data. I don't have it in front of me, but we can certainly provide it for you, unless you mean here my colleague can quickly find it and give you the breakdown for and how it cor correlates to each of the IPWs in LA County. A later time would be perfect, as long as we just had it in enough advance notice to be able to invite the right people to those meetings. Thank you for Thanks. that question. Mm -hmm. Let's go with Chris next, then Carolyn, then Regina. I, have, I guess I have more of a comment than a question, and because it's the, the leads here, um, I'm just not diplomatic at all. Um, I, I, I wonder how, how closely you're working with and communicating with the ACBOs. Um, and I, are you getting to the truth of what they need and how they're struggling? Um, and I say that because a lot of people that I've talked to across the state, this is their first time at doing anything like this. And it is a huge undertaking. Um, in San Diego County, our target is 700,000. It is a huge undertaking and it's severely underfunded. 
and it is a contract that they have with you, and you as a contractor, um, if I report deficiencies to you, you may have a duty to take, right? Or, or an action that you have to take. And, and so I wonder what ways you're, what methods are you using, what conversations are you having to get to the truth of the struggle of the enormous task that these ACBOs have taken on um, with an understanding that, that failure results in funding sure. potentially being cut or taken away. Is that, is that clear? Absolutely clear. Um, I have a conversation with my ACBO, who's also in the room here, um, members of the ACBO, um, probably at least once a day. I'm very informed, and I think I can also speak for my other RPM colleagues in my region and also statewide that we're. Um, we, 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 in a way, we're, we're doing, you're right, it's a balancing act of being a state representative and making sure that we are accountable to the public trust, as well as supporting and facilitating success for our ACBOs, who are our gateway to the community. So it's, it's just working very closely with them, answering the questions that may have, providing whatever support that we can offer from our office, whether it be meeting one-on-one -on -one with our contracts folks, whether it be, you know, in an earlier discussion here, whether it be trying to figure out when is our payment coming. Um, so I, I think we're very well aware of some of those struggles and then bringing it up also to our own team as to how we can work through some of those, um, some of those challenges of trying to reach the hard to count with the limited resources that we have. I can speak on the ACBOs that I get to oversee and, and work with. Um, several of the things that have come up as far as how do we start these conversations early and not have this conversation in January of 2020 is really looking at what are you really realistically gonna be able to cover, right? So we, we started a conversation now on let's manage realistic expectations here. We know there's gonna be gaps. We know that there's, you know, it's a great investment that's happened from the state. Is it enough? Time will tell, right? But what we do know is, in talking to the ACBO, is just saying, okay, so if we look at your region specifically, where are the hardest to hard, hard to count uh, census tracts? If you have five, are you realistically able to hit all five? And if not, which ones will be left? And where do we supplement that with either our statewide or our media or whatever other way we can look at touches? And so in regions four, five, and six, that conversation's happening now. So we, we don't wanna have an <coughs> oops reaction in January saying, oh, we need additional money. <laughs> uh, we, we're, we're starting that conversation now so we could provide that type of information to uh, not only our colleagues as leads, but uh, also our, our deputy director as well as our leadership team and saying, hey, if there are additional funds, we could tell you right now where, you know, not today, but in the near future, way before January and before these implementation plan workshops are over, where those gaps will be and what type of support they will need. Um, and we're mindful uh, of that, and and we're also, you know, like you mean, there's some ACBOs that are, like you said, for the first time uh, doing this work, and I think when they got awarded, they're like, oh, okay, this is great, but now the work really needs to happen. Um, and so we're also managing that as well, is okay, great job on, on having a, a great proposal, but now we have to put, you know, uh, put the work on the ground. And so one of the other challenges that, uh, separate from the ACBOs, is with the counties too, right? So we're not just looking at just from one lens, it's we also have our county partners. Um, some of those challenges with our county partners are, are things that are outside of our framework. Uh, as an example, uh, earlier today there was a conversation around the exemption that our offices hold in regards to how we can put things out for bid or, or not. Uh, unfortunately, that clause was not extended to our county partners so if they have a threshold of an amount 
And if our contract exceeds that amount, they automatically triggers an RFP for them to put out publicly. And so some of those are some of the challenges some of our county partners are going like, hey, even though you're giving us $25,000, uh, our threshold's $10,000, so anything over that has to go through a, a competitive process. And so that creates this, uh, this ongoing cycle of like, okay, how do we, how do we get you there? And so I, I think we are also mindful of those realistic expectations, not just from our ACBOs, but also our county partners. So a lot of conversation at the committee level, the regional lead level, the ACBO or county level or both, you know, CBOs underneath them. I think some of it will come to light in the schedule of the workshops coming up. So another reason for all of us to try to attend and maybe afford an opportunity for those closer to the ground to communicate to us as an alternative to up the chain of command, if you will. So uh, Carolyn and Regina want to just do a quick time check. We're going to conclude this about two minutes ago, but we can wrap these up with these last questions uh, because we want to be respectful of Mr. Fontenot's scheduled uh, speaking time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This may be also more of a, a comment than a question. Um, unfortunately, in our state, maybe the fastest growing population, which will be a hard to count population, is the homeless. Um, many of us live in that space and work in that space every day, and based on the recent counts, the numbers are going up. And um, unfortunately, by March of next year, we may see an even greater uptick. Um, I understand from, I think it was um, Adriana, that uh, one of the demographics that was missing in terms of a statewide CBO uh, was one focused on homeless. I know the implementation workshops are coming up. It just seems to me that's going to be a big gap in understanding how to reach that growing uh, population. And I'm wondering um, from the regional managers if you're giving some thought uh, for your workshops on how you might fill that gap. It will be a regional approach, approach through consortium, through local partners, like for example in LA, the LA Homeless Services Authority, but many, many others. So it, it will be a local approach. Um, uh, generally, we, we have determined based on research, conversation, et cetera. And I actually wanted to, um, well, I know you, you all have more questions, but just acknowledge um, Marcy Kaplan was gonna give a brief update at the appropriate time after questions on the sector outreach work um, and how that is additive and supplemental to the local regional work. So I'll be very quick, but, oh. Secretary, I wanna respect the time. So I was just gonna respond on top of Carolyn's question and, and speak to what we've been doing with staff around how to make sure that organizations serving uh, people experiencing homelessness and housing instability are included in the process, but we can definitely do it during the sector conversation. And I just wanted to make sure that, I don't know who else would want to make themselves available to this or to you, um, but the people who were left out that we identified earlier, zero to five, African Americans, homeless, all the veterans, the people who we you know, kind of identified that did not apply, that um, you guys kind of identified, we probably need to figure out how we're going to invite them because I'm assuming that if they didn't apply, then they don't feel like they should actually probably come to these meetings. So I think in each region, there should be a list that's a robust list of, of invites and engagement. And I have just one uh, quick question uh, from the, the, the master schedule I saw. Strategic plans from CBOs were due on the 31st of May. Uh, is every CBO accounted for uh, or are there CBOs and or regions where their plans were not submitted? Uh, for regions four, five, and six, the ACBOs have submitted their strategic plan. Uh, currently, I'm reviewing all of them. Right. And just I just want to make sure if they're in. I, I'm right. not expecting they, they them to review to finalize. Of, but of that date. Okay. Yes, for Southern California. Okay. We look forward to the review and feedback. Uh, all right. There's still a uh, sector <laughs> update to uh, be provided here, if we can do so quickly. Okay, hi, thank you everyone, I'm Marcy Kaplan, I'm the sector's outreach manager, thank you for your time today, and I'm gonna go very quickly. Um, I don't know who's doing the slides, okay. Okay, we can. Um, so as Adriana mentioned, the sectors is 
another way in how we reach the hard to count. These are the targeted sectors in addition to the education sector that we are focusing on, health services, labor, faith-based, business, corporate, um, technology and innovation, the entertainment industry, and um, rural communities. And the priority sectors reach people where they come for services, so whether it's the local church, um, gross, where you buy your groceries, um, or a local healthcare clinic. Um, and it really follows the model of our trusted places and trusted messengers that was effective in past census um, efforts that, we, that, the, that the state of California has uh, led. Um, and we can go to the next slide. And the goal of the sector's outreach is to leverage California statewide sectors, leaders, and influencers within to support outreach efforts to hard to count populations. Um, and through this effort, I'm working to, in targeting statewide entities, networks, and associations um, that have a broad reach throughout the state. I'm working together with uh, our regional, uh, working together with our regional program managers to identify if there's any key sector partners in their regions or any innovative work around sectors happening, and also how I can work with the regional program managers to plug in um, statewide sector partners that have regional networks as well. Um, and the different stakeholders um, that I've identified that I've been talking to through sector outreach have been through participation in past census outreach efforts. They serve um, large, large, they broadly serve hard to count communities. They have a large statewide infrastructure and reach and they're recommended by key partners and from some of you on the committee as well. Um, so for the health, faith, and labor sector, um, given the opportunity for a small pool of fund distribution, I'm, uh, I have recommended that um, we move forward in terms of funding and anchor organization for those um, three sectors. And uh, the benefit of anchor organization is um, they have the ability to serve a large number of hard to count populations. Um, they have an existing statewide and regional infrastructure and um, have a high impact reach with limited dollars. Um, an anchor organization um, can be effective in helping to develop specific toolkits for a sector that any um, organization within that sector uh, could utilize. They can provide trading opportunities um, within the sector and also um, on-site activation events and questionnaire assistance through um, sector partners. Um, and for the business tech and innovation and entertainment sectors, um, those are another key sector that the state is focusing on given the broad reach um, and trusted relationships with hard to count communities. Again, we're working with um, statewide partners. Um, they're not necessarily, the outreach through those three sectors is not clumped together, it's just clumped together on this slide. Um, but I'm working in targeting uh, large companies and large networks and associations that reach hard to count. We are coordinating with um, the Secretary of State's Office for the Democracy at Work program, coordinating with the US Census Bureau's National Partnerships Program and the Census Open Innovation Lab um, and the effort that they're doing with the business community. Um, and then just thinking creatively in terms of how we can um, reach the hard to count through um, public utilities or companies who hire in the gig economy, um, and telecommunication providers and how we can provide um, additional broadband access or you know, mobile Wi-Fi um, to communities. Um, and then focusing um, outreach within the entertainment industry, um, particularly focused on um, influencers who reach hard to count communities um, and also tech and innovation entities um, through social, you know, different social media outlets um, to really focus on countering mis misinformation. Um, I'm just going really quickly, <laughs> sorry, so hopefully. I, um, and then we touched a little bit on the rural sector and um, I'm hoping to focus more on that effort, but um, it is one of our priority sectors and looking at ways to really identify the cross collaboration among our other sectors. So, um, you know, where, where there are business networks in rural communities or faith partners in rural communities that have reached with hard to count populations um, and also working together with regional program managers who serve rural communities. And I know we don't have a lot of time, but we were hoping if there's other feedback on sectors, you know, that you think we should be exploring more. And I went really quickly, so hopefully I <laughs> can. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you for being quick. Uh, I have a proposal. 
because uh, there's probably some questions, some comments, and some feedback to offer. Uh, how about we go to Mr. Fontenot's presentation next, line of questioning, because I think he's got to be somewhere, and then we can come back to questions and comments for the sector update. May I make an announcement really quick? Sure. For those of you who would like to make public comment, there are public comment cards in the back. If you could please fill one up and bring it up to us. Thank you. All right. That sound okay? That sound doable? All right. So write, write those thoughts down. Don't want you to forget. But let's go ahead and hear uh, from uh, Alfonso O from the Census Bureau with an update. Good afternoon, Secretary Padilla, committee members, Diaz, and your staff. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today to provide you with an update on our plans and progress toward the successful execution of the 2020 Census. First, I want to thank the committee and each of the participants here in this room and throughout the state for your commitment to focus on ensuring that we together achieve a complete and accurate count of all persons living in the state of California. At a high level, we have three primary goals for the 2020 Census. One, conduct a complete, accurate count of all the people living in the United States to ensure that the responses that people give us are safe, secure, and remain confidential. And three, make responding to the census convenient and easy for everyone. Let's examine in detail what we're doing to ensure the successful completion of each of these goals. As Secretary Padilla referenced in his opening remarks, cyber threats are a major concern to the integrity of the 2020 census and to combat that risk, the Census Bureau has a robust cybersecurity program in place to protect the information we collect, process, and store in our devices, in transit, and in our IT systems. In addition to following federal IT security standards, we've also partnered with members of the federal intelligence community, including the NSA, the FBI, and DHS to ensure that we are aware of and defend against intrusion or infiltration of our systems. Following industry best practices, we have designed our systems with layered defense to protect our networks from external threats, manage and secure data inside the network, and enable our ability to immediately isolate any portion of the network if an anomaly is detected. This design enables us to assure you that your data is safe and enables us to continuously sustain service, preventing disruptions to our system while ensuring our readiness to respond against increasing and sophisticated threats is a never-ending effort. We continue work with cybersecurity experts to ensure we stay abreast of critical knowledge, advanced techniques, and up-to-date technology to protect your data. As a matter of data security, we do not disclose our specific encryption methods, and many of our defenses are invisible to the public. However, I want you to know that we have a strong and resilient security measure protecting every respondent's information. Not only are your data safe and secure, as I just described, but your data are also confidential. Everyone needs to know that federal law protects census responses and answers can only be used for statistical purposes. There are no exceptions to this law. The Census Bureau will not share an individual's responses with immigration enforcement agencies, law enforcement agencies, or allow that information to be used to determine eligibility for government benefits. All Census Bureau staff take a lifetime oath to protect your personal information, and any violation by Census Bureau staff is subject to a penalty of up to $250,000 and or up to five years in prison. This slide gives you an overview of the various parts of the Census operation. I'll give you a brief summary, then explore each phase in detail. First, we build the address list and validate the Census Master Address File. We do this by verifying every address in the country. This is our address canvassing operation. Then we motivate people to respond. We do this with a paid advertising campaign, a social media campaign, and personal contacts from community trusted voices and partners. As trusted voices, you can play a role in helping people know that participating in the census is safe, for them to participate, beneficial to them, their families, and their communities, and over $650 billion a year is distributed to states and communities based on census counts. The next phase is self-response. This is an opportunity for people to complete their census information. They can do it online, by telephone, or on paper, as they've done in prior censuses, and they can complete it in a number of languages. 
We want to make sure to count people living or staying in non-traditional housing, such as dormitories, nursing facilities, prisons, and other facilities where people live long-term while receiving care and services. We call that group quarters. We also have a program to help us count people experiencing homelessness. Some people will not respond on their own, so we follow up with them by sending census workers to visit their homes or apartments and collect their census information. This is non-response follow-up. And finally, we tabulate and release the statistical census results, first to the president and then to the country. Let's spend a moment and look at each operation. When we say establish where to count, we mean identifying all addresses where people could live. To do this, we will conduct a 100% review and update of this nation's address list. Address list development for the 2020 census started with the 2010 census base. As with previous decades, we rely on the U.S. Postal Service's delivery sequence file as the primary source for updating and maintaining the master address file. Assuring that residential addresses to which the Postal Service delivers mail every day are included in our address database for the 2020 census. We process the DSF the delivery sequence file twice per year, adding 5.3 million addresses to the map since 2010. Additionally, this decade, we have employed a suite of ongoing processes to acquire new addresses, maintain and update information about addresses that were already in the math. And through our imagery-based in-office address canvassing, we detected changes to the housing landscape and identified issues that needed resolution and review. In addition to biannual processing of the DSF and our in-office address canvassing operation, we have acquired address information from tribal, state, and local governments through our geographic support system programs. Our ungeocoded resolution project began in 2017 and has geocoded over a million addresses to census blocks. We conduct the boundary and annexation survey annually to collect information about selected legally defined geographic areas to ensure that all addresses are geocoded to the correct legal jurisdiction. The local update of census addresses, LUCA, and the LUCA appeals process provides an opportunity for tribal, state, and local governments to review the Census Bureau's address list for their respective jurisdictions. Local government partners provided over 3.4 million new addresses to the Census Bureau during the initial review phase of LUCA this decade. Our new construction program is available to local governments to provide addresses for housing units built after LUCA and ready for occupancy by Census Day. Additionally, count review is conducted in collaboration with state demographer members of the Federal State Cooperative for Population Estimates and provides an additional opportunity to review counts of housing units prior to 2020 census and update as necessary. Each of these programs and processes serves to validate addresses in our master address file, correct address locations, and provide addresses that may not be included in any of the other address data sets. Taken together, along with in-office address canvassing and in-field address canvassing, this suite of programs provides multiple opportunities for the Census Bureau to develop an accurate address list. The result is that the master address file is more complete and accurate right now than it has ever been before. These in-office processes have provided the ability to detect and manage changes to the housing and address landscapes in ways that were not possible last decade. For the 2020 census, we'll need to field verify only about a third of the nation's addresses, about 47 million addresses. In past censuses, we had to send workers across the entire nation to verify 100% of the addresses in the field. Let's look at California for a minute. Overall, as a result of DSF, LUCA, and other address update processes from fall 2018 to spring of 2019, there have been an increase of 5.5% in the number of addresses in the master address file in California, up from 14.37 million in fall of 2018 to 15.16 million in the spring of 2019. Over half, 58.7% of that increase was in Los Angeles County alone. We saw an increase from 3.59 million to 4.06 million addresses in the master address file. There was also an 11% increase in the number of addresses in San Francisco. It's important to note 
that some of this work is still ongoing and we need your help in ensuring that the map is up to date as possible. Of the 539 eligible governments in California, that's functioning tribal, state, and local governments, only 82 have agreed to participate in the new construction program as of May 29th. The deadline to register for inclusion in this program is less than two weeks away, June 14th. We sent out emails to every government within the state on April 1st of 2019, and on May 10th, we mailed letters encouraging every non-responding government to respond. We still are well short of the 539 eligible governments. They can respond to our new construction program online right away with www.census.gov programs-survey, and it's a long sequence of things, but going to our census.gov website, Governments that have not responded can respond now. We invite them to respond because we want to make sure that we are not missing new construction addresses in any county. It was surprising when I pulled the numbers and see that only 82 of the 539 governments had done this. It's a much easier registration than LUCA. Basically, they come in, they use the ID that we sent them. The government official who is the designee designates who will be the contact person and we move on from there to make sure that we incorporate all of your new addresses. So this is very important that we get people to uh, join the new construction program. Beginning in August of 2019, less than three months from now, we will have listers walking the streets verifying the address list. Our listers will knock on doors and ask about potential hidden housing units, basement apartments, converted living spaces in garages, or other places on the property where people may be living that are not on the address list. This operation will wrap up in early October. We just need you to let people know that we will be on the street, we will be knocking on the door, and we will be inquiring. We do not report this information to zoning boards or any governmental units, but it's critically important that we find these critical hidden housing units. At the heart of our efforts to motivate people to respond on their own is our integrated partnership and communications program. This program uses a variety of tactics such as paid advertising, public relations, and partnerships to promote the 2020 census and encourage self-response, preferably via the internet. In 2020, we're using proven techniques from prior censuses, such as paid advertising, statistics in schools, partnership, and working with trusted voices in local communities. But in addition to that, we're infusing it with modern approaches like social media, digital advertising, and targeted advertising to particular audiences. We conducted extensive research last year to learn what type of messages motivate people to respond to something like the decennial census, what might prevent them from responding, and where we are most likely to reach different types of people. This research included a survey of 50,000 households and 42 focus groups across the country with diverse participants and has informed our communication program. This research combined with other Census Bureau records was used to inform our advertising strategy, which in this new digital environment presents a new opportunity for advertising that we have not been able to use in past censuses. Specifically, for the first time, we have the abil ability to directly drive response through digital ads that connect viewers to the online response tool. In addition to using digital and social media, we'll also be using traditional media such as print, TV, radio, outdoor, and event advertising. By integrating digital and social media with traditional media advertising, we'll be able to tailor messages to specific geographic and demographic groups. The advertising strategy is agile and allows for rapid adjustments in areas where we observe low response rates. Our continued monitoring of campaign data will ensure that we are adjusting our advertising to conditions that we observe on the ground. The Census Bureau is working closely with our advertising agency, Team YNR, and their media buying partners who will specialize in outreach to diverse groups. Our multicultural partners will play a key role in our advertising strategy. These partners already have strong relationships with local media vendors that they can leverage when we're trying to reach our target audience. 
These partners have been providing input to the media plan and will be executing media buys at both the national and local level. Central to reaching our hard to count populations is using local media to reach these populations. More than 50% of our media buy dollars will be invested in local media. In April, we held two media vendor days during which vendors could learn about the advertising program. Over 200 vendors participated in person and over 2,000 watched the internet broadcast. We received over 1,600 proposals from local media vendors, which is very exciting because these vendors are best suited to reach some of our hard to count populations. Our final media buy plan is expected in the fall of 2019. The self-response period begins in March of 2020, and every household will have the option to respond online, on paper by mail, or by phone. 95% of households will receive their invitation to participate in the census in the mail. Approximately 5% of households, those who do not have traditional mailing addresses, will receive their invitation when a census taker personally drops it off. These are in areas we call update leave because census workers update the address information and leave a census packet. These areas include areas that have experienced natural disasters, that have been disrupted um, in terms of events like wildfires, earthquakes, and floods, and the historical address layout has been disrupted by those events. We will have census workers actively canvassing those areas and electronically map spotting locations. The remaining households, less than 1%, will be enumerated in person by a census taker on their initial visit instead of being invited to respond on their own. We'll call those areas update enumerate. Those are areas that are very remote and do not necessarily receive mail, such as parts of remote Alaska, parts of remote Maine, and select American Indian areas. I want to reiterate that everyone will have an opportunity to be counted in the 2020 census. As I just mentioned, 95% of people will receive their invitation to respond to the census in the mail. These invitations will begin arriving in mailboxes on March 12th, 2020. We'll be sending up to five mailings and reminders to households that do not respond. People who live in areas with low internet connectivity or who by their demographics will not be less likely to respond electronically, will receive a paper questionnaire in their first mailing. That's approximately 20% of the addresses in the country. Every household that has not responded by the time we start our fourth mailing will receive a paper questionnaire in the mail, and those will start arriving on April 8th, eight days after Census Day. Again, every respondent will be able to respond however they choose online, by mail, or by paper, phone, paper form. The objective of the self-response operation is to maximize response through a robust contact strategy and multiple response options. Using the internet as the primary mode of response for people who choose to respond using modern technology will make it the first time that the internet will be the major method for counting the population. However, this does not exclude people who may not want to or cannot respond over the internet. The 2020 census is designed to be easier to respond to than any prior decennial census in our nation's history. Everyone will be able to respond anytime from anywhere. Regardless of how households receive their invitation to respond, they will still be able to do so online with a 508 compliant application with a desktop computer, a laptop computer, a mobile device, a smartphone, or on paper by mail, or if they want, over the telephone. One more advantage in this decade, as I mentioned earlier, is that for the first time, people can respond without using an identification code that we have already provided to them. We call this non-ID processing, but it might be better to think of it as real-time ID processing. When someone types in an address over the internet, we will automatically match that address to the master address file, and then we'll take the response. If we can't make an immediate match, we'll do that work later to reconcile that address, including sending field contact if there are questions on the entry. Those will go out during the NARFU operate, the non-response operation. This is huge for us. It means that people can respond anywhere, anytime, 
using their smartphone, tablet, computer, or mobile device. It also means that you, the people who support the census, our partners, will be able to encourage people to respond at events right when you're talking to them. In the past, people needed to go home, find their paper questionnaire we mailed to them, and then fill it out. Now they can respond the minute they're encouraged to do so. We have not been able to do this before. We think it's a great opportunity. Additionally, for the 2020 census, we'll have the most robust language program we have ever built for our census. In 2010, respondents were able to self-respond in English and five non-English languages. In 2020, respondents will be able to self-respond in English and 12 non-English languages online or through our bilingual team in our telephone call centers. When using our internet response instrument, all questionnaire content, including help text, will be displayed in each of these languages. Each of these languages will also be supported by a unique telephone number that census respondents will be able to call and provide responses over the phone. Our census questionnaire assistance centers will be staffed by bilingual agents who will be able to answer questions and provide general 2020 support in each of these 12 non-English languages Furthermore, they also can take an interview over the phone. Our first mailing will include written instructions for responding online or for calling census questionnaire assistance in English and in each of the 12 non-English languages. These 12 non-English languages cover 87% of limited English-speaking households in the United States. In addition, we'll be providing video and paper language guides in 59 non-English languages, thereby accounting for 98% of the ling limited English-speaking households in the United States. In California, if there are more than 1,000 limited English-speaking households of the same language, that language is covered by one of our language assistance guides. Our partnership program will also provide language assistance in languages beyond the 59. This will be done by hiring partnership specialists and field workers from within local neighborhoods and who are fluent in the languages spoken at the local level and can work to assist respondents responding to the census in their language. This is another area in which you can assist us. Help us recruit partnership specialists in these areas who are able to speak and help translate the census questions for people in their communities. In addition to the language assistance I just spoke about, we will be sending bilingual mailing materials to areas with high proportions of limited English-speaking households that speak Spanish. We will send bilingual materials to an entire census tract if at least 20% of the occupied housing units in the tract might require Spanish assistance. What this means is these are households where at least one adult, 15 or older, speaks Spanish and does not speak English very well. All of the English language materials will have a Spanish phrase inviting a respondent online and to dial the 800 number in Spanish if necessary. Some groups or persons who require special or extra effort to ensure their representation in the 2020 census will also be covered. Throughout the decade, we've been working diligently to ensure that we're able to connect with hard-to-count populations. As you know, we have specialized operations to assist in enumerating these populations. However, our efforts go far beyond any one operation. Over the decade, as we plan for and design the 2020 Census, we have been considering how to best count these populations. As a result, our effort to enumerate hard-to-count populations is woven throughout our operational design, from stakeholder engagement to forum design to field infrastructure. I'd like to touch on a few of the specific operations to show you the lengths that we plan to go to count these populations. Our service-based enumeration provides an opportunity for people without conventional housing or people experiencing homelessness to be included in the census by enumerating them at places where they receive services or at pre-identified outdoor locations, such as missions, hotels, motels, used as shelters, and places where children stay who are runaways. We will also visit soup kitchens, regularly schedule mobile food vans that visit certain locations to provide food to people experiencing homelessness. In addition, we'll also visit emergency and transitional shelters, targeted non-sheltered outdoor locations where people experiencing homelessness may live in encampments. And this is another area we can use local community organizations to assist 
us in finding and identifying encampments and other locations where people may be living in non-traditional housing, including people living in cars or staying in RVs. We are dependent on your help to find those people. Our enumeration of transitory location operation will be used to count populations that are highly mobile and do not have a usual home elsewhere, such as those that regularly stay at campgrounds, recreational vehicle parks, marinas, hotels and motels, racetracks, circuses, or carnivals. We also have a special operation to ensure that people in correctional facilities are enumerated. And while the census residence criteria dictates that we count prisoners at the correctional facility, for the 2020 census, we'll be making available a bulk geocoding service in order to assist states in their goals of reallocating their own prisoner populations. This will assist California, which has already enacted legislation requiring Department of Corrections to report the home addresses of incarcerated people to the Citizens Redistricting Commission so that the commission may count incarcerated people at home for redistricting purposes. To address areas of the country that are recovering from natural disasters, as well as areas where the majority of housing units do not have mail delivered to the physical location of the address, our update leave operation has a census employee, rather than a U.S. postal carrier, delivering the 2020 census invitation to respond along with a paper questionnaire. While we hand deliver paper questionnaires, respondents still have the option to respond online or over the telephone by calling our Census Questionnaire Assistance Centers. In May 2020, we will begin our non-response follow-up operation. The primary purpose of NERFU is to determine the housing unit status of a non-responding address and to enumerate the housing households at non-responding housing units. During this operation, temporary census employees, known as enumerators, will be knocking on doors, collecting the census information in person from people who do not self-respond to the census. If no one is home, the census taker will leave a notice of visit to encourage self-response. In most situations, enumerators may make six or more attempts at a housing unit to ensure sufficient data are collected to support apportionment. This operation will end in late July 2020. As a trusted voice in the communities around you, you have a critical role to play in helping us reach the goal of conducting a complete and accurate count by helping explain to your community why participating in the census is important. Your efforts in spreading the message and mobilizing your stakeholders to respond to the census will provide accurate data for every community in the state. Thank you for your help and support. You're uniquely positioned to share and reinforce a concise yet vital message. The 2020 Census is safe, it's easy, it's secure, and it's important. You also can reinforce an understanding how responses are a means to shaping the future, including the future of all who respond, their families and friends, communities, organizations, businesses, and governments at all level throughout the state and through the nation as a whole. This concludes my presentation, and now I can answer a few questions. Thank you very much. Let's leave that slide up for a few minutes, because I think the first question is, if there's any questions we cannot get to today because of time, how else we can uh, communicate with you uh, for more information or uh, to provide you additional feedback. So we'll note that a phone number and an email address. Very nice. Uh, is up on the screen at this time. And, and I would just state, if I could, that the your local uh, regional census center, the Los Angeles Regional Census Center, provides both partnership and, and more detailed operational information specific to every area within their coverage area. So they're, they are a great source, in addition to the, we at Census Headquarters being a source of information. Great, great, thank you. A um, couple quick questions that I know are in a lot of people's minds. Uh, we don't know the um, outcome of the matter before the Supreme Court as we speak. Uh, regardless, two things that come to mind between that and some possible final testing. When will the final uh, 
survey or form be available for review, whether it's the paper or the online format for our partners to become familiar with. Uh, we, are, we are hoping that the Supreme Court decision will come prior to the end of this um, Supreme Court session, which ends the end of June, and we expect a decision at that point. Uh, when that decision is out, we'll be able to put out the information for everyone to look at and examine at that time. So I would say early July. Early July. So there's no additional testing post We July are testing, but not testing the format of the question. We are running what we ha have defined as the 2019 census test. And the census test is for 480,000 people throughout the United States. 240,000 will be receiving questionnaires and invitations to respond to an internet um, application that does not have a citizenship question, 240,000 will be responding to one that does. The objective of the 2019 test is to help us plan staffing. If we see differential um, responses by demographics, by area in the country, we then are able to plan our staffing for the actual non-response follow-up by increasing staff in those areas that may require additional efforts on our part. It also helps us plan our media if we need to have heavier media blitzes in certain demographics in certain parts of the country in certain communities. Thank you. I, I find it helpful that you articulated how uh, people will have multiple uh, options for how to participate in the survey. Uh, online is, is new and getting a lot of attention, but there's still the paper uh, option and the by phone option. Um, there's one question that's garnered a lot of attention, and we know on paper we would not suggest, but some people may not feel comfortable responding to every single question. So on paper there's an option for somebody to not answer a, a, a particular question. The way the phone uh, participation is formatted or the online format, will that allow somebody to be able to submit with, without completing all the questions or, or answers to every single question required for a phone or online? If someone's online and they opt not to answer a question, they will receive a soft prompt that indicates you have omitted a question please go back and respond to the question. If they decide to continue without answering that question, the software allows them to continue through the census and then submit their census. Our online operators have the same prompts on their on-screen instructions and the same instructions. Throughout every survey we do, at every census we do, people choose not to answer some questions. It may be race, it may be age, it may be gender, sex, it may be a number of questions. We still expect that activity during this census and therefore their census will still go through and be processed. Omitting questions increase the likelihood that they may be visited during non-response follow-up operation. Okay, understood. Uh, I will uh, bypass the, the hiring question. We talked about it earlier in the day. You need our help, <laughs> uh, not just for numerators, but for many categories. So we're coming office, to that already. The, the local census office can direct you to tracks and areas that they're having difficulty hiring. And those are focus areas that will be very valuable to focus on. Good. So my last question for now, and I know others are waiting to ask questions as well, uh, is this. Uh, it seemed to be not plausible in census is passed, but let me pose uh, a, a potential concern some people may have. As we're doing a lot of outreach at the state, regional, and local level, let's say we have a big census fair, everybody show up and we'll you know, provide internet connectivity if need be. Uh, what assurances do we have that these events that we're gonna be promoting do not become targets for ICE raids or visits? We're in the process of working with the other government agencies to try to um, get assurances from them that they will not use those as opportunities for raids. We're you, still in that process at this will time. Will you keep us posted yes, on we that, will. please? 
that's what I have more questions, but I know others do as well. Let's work uh, uh, sewing, Jesus, Regina, and we'll work our way this way. Um, this is Sewing speaking. I recall with past representative the question around whether it could be tested and having actually people with disabilities test it out for accessibility. And the answers have not been quite, I don't know, entirely clear. It was like they weren't sure, they were gonna go back, they were gonna find out. And I, I maybe it's been answered, I'm still uncertain what that answer is. So it sounds like maybe post decision, there's gonna be an opportunity to test it out. Because I think all of us, in order for us to speak about it in a way that's concrete and real to folks that we need to reach out to, we need to play with it ourselves. If we play with it, is there still room to actually make changes on that end, or is it just playing with for us to be familiar, but there's no opportunities now At to actually point make improvements? Time, there are no opportunities for change. Okay. I will go to print on July 1st okay. in the final form that the census will be. The, that, that film is, is waiting for a court decision, two sets of film. Um, we have tested it for 508 compliance in terms of both uh, all of our internet access, and we also have. Um, but I think I think the question is, did you test it with just regular folks with disabilities? Because sometimes usability it could be accessible technically for people who are techies, but it may not be useful for people who are just, you know everyday Americans trying to figure out. So I'm just curious if it was actually tested on just folks in the field to, to see how they're, they're able to navigate it or not and get an input in that respect. And, and I will confess I'll have to get back to you with that answer no, just like all other no. people did. Because I have, I have looked at the data and I've looked mm -hmm. at the 508 compliance regulations to ensure that we were in compliance. Yeah, I've not looked at the, the makeup of the test audience. Right, because we, we've gone through this where it tests perfectly, fits all, you know, and then yeah. when you actually try to use it, it's like, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's gibberish here and there's tags here that doesn't make sense and it doesn't move to the left to the generally, right, you know. And, and I'm not even talking about other languages, I'm just generally, talking about English. <laughs> when we do usability testing, uh -huh. we do it with a broad base of general population, not like our own staff with or disabilities own but that's I my fear check that. yeah I, I don't i do not know that's the true. correct answer and then that. the other question i had is um i'm assuming there's gonna be close because we're interested in getting regina's been saying this is what chris has been, all of us have been saying we're interested in getting that data out so that people can we have folks who may be interested in applying for these position but it's i think we keep what we've been begging you know, like feed us the links, feed us information, and we can use that to get it out to our network. So I'm assuming that you're gonna be in contact with maybe DITAS, and then DITAS, you somehow are gonna feed back the information to us in a very concrete fashion, and that way we, in a timely fashion also, that we can get it out in time for them to actually apply for the job. That's yeah, what I'm I think that, for. as Al said, that working with their regional and the local folks, because they're hiring locally, and they can really identify where that is. So we'll um, get with the uh, MOOS uh, partnership uh, specialists and the recruiting coordinators. Um, and those links are available now. It, it, yeah, and we've shared the links, but you guys want really specific, why. right? I Those think the they, problem is is that you can share the links, but I think I don't. I think that what's happening is that maybe you get, you know, you might get something. I think somebody sent me something not, earlier today for Ventura. Right, they hearing what's happening and someone sent me something for Ventura. And I gotta go back and think in my head, okay, what assets do I have in Ventura to just send to Ventura? Not to my whole database. And so when you say the links are available, there are probably hundreds of millions of websites. People just don't know. So you have to do something to push it out. There has to be a push out um, so that people know that it's there. Because just posting it on a website does not allow people to know. They're just not checking your website like that. Because it's on I, our website too. I, I just yeah. wanna, I mean, I, I was one of the early people who say give it, and I, I have been getting it. I've been getting the, the job postings, job announcements have to you? push out to my network. Okay. And they have been specific and, and detailed. It, it's exactly what I asked for. So I just wanna advocate on behalf of the Maybe. staff from my perspective you, maybe you hit my metric, so okay. thank they you. And maybe I'm just not technically savvy like Chris is, and I need to talk to him and go, how do, you know, maybe you need to help me out. And then the, the, the third and last question I have is, 
I, I, prison population is probably more well known, but I think my fear, the less well known are developmental centers for people, developmental disabilities are housed, uh, state hospitals where people with mental health disabilities are housed, board and cares for people with multiple disabilities are housed. Do you know if there's a plan? Is there um, understanding, knowledge, you know, even if it's not spoken here, that there are other, you know, housing facilities um, of other populations that will require, you know, an account as well. It, oh, no, definitely. We have those. I just mentioned a few. But mm -hmm. we have all those um, care facilities in our group quarters, including facilities that we have to exercise security around for battered women and things like that. They're all part of our group quarters operation. The reason I brought up the prison population specifically is the issue in the prison population has been where to count prisoners. Mm -hmm. And census says we count people where they live or stay most of the time as of the reference date, which is April 1st, which meant prisoners get counted in prisons. Some states, right now that we have six, including California, want to use them for redistricting purposes in the right, place from. they came from or right. were incarcerated from. Yeah. So we've developed a tool to enable the states to be able to take our tool and re geocode those people so they can redistrict them the way they want for state purposes. For federal purposes, they will continue to be counted um, where they are on Census Day. But for all those facilities, yes, we have programs where we're working with the administrators to be sure that we do complete counts of people who are receiving special treatment or have special needs. Okay, all right, thank you. Right, I want to bounce back to the hiring question and just give you a quick example. We are in the process of hiring for address canvassing. Address canvassing is a smaller operation. It starts in August. We'll hire approximately 50,000 people around, across the nation. The pool of people who have applied for that so far is 410,000 people that have applied for that following the census website using our online assessment. So we're getting good responses, but the problem that we have, if I run it by county, I find counties where there's zero. And, and I find a sequence of counties where there's zero. That's where we're relying on local partners to help us recruit people in those counties. So we didn't stop recruiting just because we're at 410,000, we only need 50. Uh, we started targeting our recruiting more and narrowing our focus more. And the local census office, the LA Regional Census Center can work very closely with each of you to identify the places where they have needs. And I'm just thinking that maybe in those areas or those counties that you're talking about, maybe there's an advertising strategy that you may have to look at in those actual counties. Yes. This is Thank you. I have questions, actually, for both uh, presenters. I'll begin with Marcy. Um, I'd like to follow up with you afterwards to talk about how to connect with the health sector. There are some clinics in the Central Valley that are very eager to participate in this effort, and I'm glad that you mentioned it today so we can touch up on it. But I also have a question regarding the uh, labor union uh, presentation that you also included here today. If you could elaborate a little bit more about what you're seeking to do with the labor unions, uh, because there are some labor unions that obviously the membership base is fundamentally hard to count population, whether it's the janitors among others. Uh, so if you could elaborate a little bit more about what strategy is being followed with the labor unions to understand more adequately what the state is doing in that respect. And for Mr. Albert Fontenot, um, one question. Um, you just mentioned right now, repeated again, that this summer in August, uh, you're going to be having the listers going to neighborhoods. Uh, is there, does the Census Bureau uh, contemplate any type of media campaign to inform people that this is going to be taking place? Um, and I ask this for two reasons. One is obviously to persuade people that if there is someone coming to knock on the door, that they are going to uh, be represented in the Census Bureau. And the other reason is because we already have at least one or more examples of fraud of people representing themselves as Census Bureau representatives and asking people for information that has nothing to do with the Census. For example, um, a few weeks ago, and I shared that with both Census Bureau representatives in the state of California, Anditas, among others, um, that in Merced, uh, we received um, a call from a contact uh, that serves 
uh, the Lao community. And what that person informed us was that a family, a Lao family, had someone come to their home saying that they represented the Census Bureau, they were part of the census efforts, and they were asking them about their immigration status, their income, among other things that have nothing to do with what the 2020 census is all about. So if there is going to be a number of people coming to uh, homes in, the, in August, is there going to be any media campaign to inform people, or is, or is that just going to be done without any media effort at all? I'll go first and answer that, if that's okay. Uh, right now, there is no media campaign planned for address canvassing. We normally do not run a campaign because the core responsibility of the address canvassing operation is just to verify the address. The secondary responsibility is knock on door, find out if there's hidden housing there. So we generally do not run a paid media campaign related to address canvassing. There is a campaign out at the moment for hiring um, but it doesn't reference what you're talking about here in terms of address canvassing. But I will give you a caveat on people who knock on the door and ask other questions. We are conducting some over 90 different surveys for other parts of government all throughout the decade, throughout the year. So people could come to a house from the current population survey and ask questions on unemployment. Uh, that goes on. The unemployment data that is published monthly comes out of the work we do on that survey. The American Community Survey, which used to be the census long form, is conducted in every county in the United States every month of the year, where we're doing over 500,000 people a year. So we have people out there that aren't asking 2020 census questions, that are legitimate census, census employees asking legitimate survey questions. So I would, we, we do it for health and human services. We have it done for crime and crime victimization surveys. So there are a lot of those surveys constantly going on and we don't stop those during decennial years. So there are other activities that could be legitimate census activities going on right now. Do any of them ask for um, immigration status? Um, no. None of those surveys ask immigration status. We don't ask that in any of yeah. our programs. So that would be a fraudulent yeah. and what survey. I, they do ask, the American Community Survey ask citizenship and some of the others ask, ask those kinds of questions, but they don't ask immigration status. Yeah. And what I mentioned uh, that I shared with Itas and the Sister Bureau reps as well, is that in this particular case in Merced County, the person that came to knock on the door um, was being a very, very aggressive and hostile towards the family. So there was a lot of intimidation going on. So that's the reason why I'm calling, uh, I'm mentioning this to you because if it is gonna be taking place, there is already that fear about the citizenship question and everything else that's taking place. Um, and if there are going to be listers going around to neighborhoods, then some awareness has to be transmitted uh, to the community so there is that, uh, at least fear can be diminished a little bit. Yeah, right now the entire plan for that is for non-paid public relations information through media, but not paid advertising. So that's something I can go back and talk to our communication staff on. Tom? Yeah, as a quick follow-up, I, I hope, Al, that you will but go could back. Could I get my uh, other question answered by oh, uh, Marcy Kaplan, please, before we, we go? just follow up afterwards, too, on, on that with the health sector as well? I mean, I, I'd be curious to hear the answer, actually, as well. well let's, let's get through the session with Mr. Fontenot first, and then we'll come back with the sector presentation, do follow-up questions. Tom. So Al, I would, I would ask you to go back and talk about this, because I do think this is a different age. There's no such thing as normally anymore. And we are seeing this phenomenon of people impersonating census officials, whether they're doing 2020 or the American Community Survey or all of the other surveying. So I think just long-term for all of those efforts, it behooves the Bureau to get some education out in the community about how to verify who's from the Census Bureau and to dismiss those who are not. I think it also points out the importance of currently pending legislation in California that would uh, basically make it a crime to impersonate a census enumerator. And I think it's a question of what the federal government will do if it becomes more and more prominent that there is impersonation of census enumerators doing any kind of survey uh, across the country. I think currently that it's a violation of federal law, but 
but I think yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's a question of enforcement, right? That's How much enforcement or investigation is happening when this occurs? And hopefully, it's okay. No, 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 you're fine. Legit, <laughs> legit enumerators, Mr. Pompano. Legit question. enumerators. How are they identifying themselves? Do they? Is there a specific script that they follow? A they is there a, is there a badge they wear? Me, but they have a badge. Okay. They have a specific right. census badge that identifies. Can you take a picture and share it with? Uh, yeah. My, my badge. Oh. You don't want to blur it out because yeah, you, you want people to like. To <laughs> you have to know, but not like get it out too wide. Right. right. <laughs> So, all right, there's a whole we, we generally post and send out information how to identify a census enumerator. Yeah. It's on our yeah. website. Well, I mean, it's it's on there now, but we'll get it out for broader distribution. Thank, thank you. And uh, just to follow up on uh, uh, Mr. Sine's comment, it's not just about enforcement uh, on the back end, but training on the front end. So with that, uh, Regina. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just funny that I'm sorry. I'm trying to take my notes. Sorry, they got a little wet. <laughs> um, quick question for you about, I think you talked about the um, emails to emails and letters that you sent to the counties about um, um, them updating addresses. The, the uh, new construction program. I mean, I'm sure that this is Carolyn's real expertise, but I'm just, I'm just going to say maybe there's some phone calls that probably need to be made to contact with those people so that um, um, that you're actually touching them. And then, second, in your opinion, what are the best ways for our state contractors to be effective in getting folks to answer um, the census? Um, I think. Uh, to answer your second question first, the best ways for a state contractor is to enhance our communications on the safe and secure nature of the census, the importance of the census, um, the availability of doing it your way, if I step on somebody's trademark by saying do it your way, but, but you can basically do it your way, you can do it on paper. And, and one of the challenges that we've had is we have so much hype and talk about the internet census that people fail to realize that people can fill it out just like they did in 2000, 2010 on a paper form and mail it in if that's their desire. That's available. I am printing enough forms to make sure that we have forms in the hands of anyone who does not respond. What we have found, however, from our tests and from the American Community Survey, which uses um, internet modes, a lot of people, the majority of people, will tend to respond online. And they'll um, tend to use either their smartphone or computer and respond to the census. Our issue is we want to make sure we don't leave out the rest of the people those who don't have that opportunity. So we're trying to reach out. If you could help us get that message out, help us communicate that message, help us recruit and hire. One of the biggest <laughs> things you could, and I could say that a thousand yeah, I times. know you keep saying it like a monster jobs. I know. Hiring, <laughs> over hiring a half a million people a year from now. Um, and all the assistance we can get in those areas uh, are critically important. One, you, I, I we're going to send out some what partners can and cannot do to support the self-response and to support the 2020 census. We're going to be sending that out in the next couple of weeks. But giving you some examples, uh, provide language assistance. Work with us on the languages that we do not have in our 59 languages that have language guides and language information. Um, help disabled people step up and be able to respond to the census in ways that perhaps they may not be able to get to locations. They may not have the equipment at home to do it. Uh, provide access to computers for those communities that don't have access, either through libraries, conference, public events, community centers, healthcare facilities, uh, places of worship, shopping areas, uh, at VA hospitals. Um, those are critical areas that we feel that we can gain value by your assistance. What we're going to ask you not to do is don't knock on doors and attempt to collect data. I think that confuses people, it leads to more opportunities for fraud, and we, we feel that, that we, that may actually <laughs> discourage people because it elevates their concerns because different people are now coming 
proposing that they are the Census Bureau, representing the Census Bureau, knock at the door. So we are discour strongly discouraging that type of activity. You think that that's, and I'm not sure how all of the contracts read for, for the folks that are awarded statewide, but I thought that was gonna be a lot of what they were gonna be doing. So you're saying don't do that. That's what we're saying, yeah. We feel very, very strongly about that. Um, oh, and also a couple other don'ts. Wait, and one other question. Don't collect data and fill it out for people. Well, this is the other thing that, I, okay, so don't collect data and then fill it out for people, but you said something about computers, and I don't know if we ever got an answer, a firm answer, on if, let's say, um, MALDEF gets a contract and um, they want to go into communities and these folks don't have access to the internet and they then have an iPad or iPads or computers to start um, getting people, you know, let's say it's 5,000 people to make sure that they fill out their census. Is that gonna be a red flag? Because I don't know if we ever got that answer or response. We will, we realize that that's a very valuable uh, way to get people to fill out their census. That's one of the reasons we have non-ID processing for census, so they don't have to have a census ID when they do that. We will see that come in from one IP address and be able to distinguish that from a fraudulent input, from, from a, a fraudulent input. We've worked on that, and that's very important to us. The answer is yes, do it. We'll be able to input those as part of the census. And I think, if I'm understanding the question correctly, there's a fine line between taking somebody's personal information and then you know, trying to fill it in later, or utilize, use it or abuse it later, versus assisting somebody in filling out or, or, Let the or person submitting fill out the census. The information. Um, don't take their information and you fill it out. I mean, you can answer questions for them, like what. That you can lend them your tablet. You can assist. That's correct. But that's different than I mean, the same thing is with paper. I mean, just because we've gone on uh, internet, we had the same situation in 2010 with paper. Can people fill out for people? No. But can you assist them filling it out? Yes. So that has not changed from 2010 to today. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John. I thank you all for your thorough update. I wanted to circle back on the topics of homelessness and hiring that my colleagues brought up, uh, particularly around oper hiring for operations that are designed to count populations of people experiencing homelessness. Um, my question is, like, uh, for the service-based enumeration and the enumeration of transitory locations, uh, how is the Census Bureau partnering with service providers to ensure that people who are familiar with the conditions of homelessness or are experiencing homelessness firsthand get census jobs and are hired as enumerators? Um, that's an issue that each of our local census offices, the regional census center, um, could be able to answer directly. I mean, we've given general instructions for the regional census centers to do that, but each location has different dynamics with the local community organizations to make sure they're offering jobs to those people who have a way to come and participate in helping us with the census. There are people from that community, and so the best Answer for that is really working with the Los Angeles Regional Census Center. Julie Lamb is the regional director for the Los Angeles uh, Censor Center. Uh, Luz Castillo, who is the coordinator for our partnership efforts, who is here uh, with us, is also critical to ensuring that we're making that connection with the communities, but they can do that. That's, I don't know the details of how they're gonna do it in their specific communities, but when I was Chicago Regional Director, we did it in multiple ways depending on what the situation was and who the, who the community organization was. So, so you would have to, you know, to get more specifics, we'd have to work with them. Chris. Yeah, I just, I wanted to comment, uh, very early in your presentation, you, I thought I heard you say that you were working with the FBI and Department of Homeland Security, and I just want to let you know that that does not instill trust and confidence in the communities that most of up, us up here serve, um, because the very people that our communities are afraid of happen to work in the Department of Homeland Security, um, and we know of instances where some of those departments in Homeland Security have built in back doors and hacked government systems and hacked into state databases to get at the information they want to use to do their jobs. And so just a point of 
advice maybe is that in your presentation um, to folks who want to be a trusted messenger, uh, that does not instill so much trust. We have a, a balance to run there. I, I get it when you start talking about those organizations, but on the other hand, they are the foremost experts on cyber and cyber attack prevention within the federal government. And therefore, if we are to ensure that the cyber protection side of our efforts are maxed out, we have to be in collaboration with those kinds of agencies to do it. Uh, we have no other government resources to ensure that we can, can protect our cyber side of our, our business. Understood, I'm just saying there's a give and take. I know, it's and, a hard, that's a hard and, line. And that. it's, it, it, but it's, it's where our communities are and, and there's a give and take. So if there's a way to message that, um, that builds trust without taking away from trust, then you know, I think finding that balance would be important. I got like 10 text messages when you said that. <laughs> okay, I, I hear you. Coming back uh, to the left, Nick, and then uh, Gerald, and then we're gonna try to wrap this up. It's almost four o'clock, the time we were scheduled to adjourn, but we have questions for the sector presentation and public comment that we will get to as well. So, so I've been working in the LGBT space now for going on eight years, and then one of the um, surprising lessons that I initially learned um, we talk a lot about bullying and, uh, and youth bullying, but in fact, on campus, um, you're more likely to be bullied by an adult. And our current political climate, um, with all the hiring and all the points of contact um, that the employees are going to be having, um, what training um, and what policies are in place to make sure um, that the employees are using proper pronouns? Proper pronouns is something that we're in the process developing the training language for because that's a growing area of concern and interest in the LBGTQ communities and we're trying to make sure that our people are sensitive to that. That's part of the sensitivity training, but we're in the process of developing this as we speak right now. I mean, I had a meeting Friday with our coordinator for our uh, Pride Month activities and, and we were talking about how we made sure during Pride Month there at Census Bureau headquarters we're using the correct pronouns and conversation and that's also something that we're tr working on training because we understand the sensitivity of that to the communities. I appreciate that, uh, but just be cognizant, um, especially in this current political climate, that there will be adults, um, even with policy, even with training, um, who will deny that respect simply because they politically disagree with the person's right to exist. Yeah, we will be aware of that, thank you. Yeah, um, I have a simple question for you, I, I, and that is uh, where and how do you count uh, military service members if they are posted overseas um, or if th they are in uh, basic training? Okay, military service members who are posted overseas fall in two categories, deployed or assigned. If they're assigned overseas, they are counted in their home of record that they have listed with the military. If they're deployed, they're counted in the area of the base from which they are deployed. Let's say Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Let's say I am stationed at Fort Bragg, okay. and my home of record may be Chicago, Illinois. If I'm assigned, the military classifies me as assigned to a duty station someplace overseas, then I would be counted in Chicago. If they deploy me someplace, by their definition, we use the military's definition of where they are, then they would be counted in Fayetteville, North Carolina. How about somebody in the Peace Corps? Same thing with the Peace Corps, basically. But the Peace Corps is always a sign. They're not, they don't have what we call deployment. So they are right, counted right, at their right. home of reference okay. from a Peace Corps standpoint. But we have a clear definition of our residence criteria for every particular status, including thing, and it's posted on our website. But yes, that's how we manage the military. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. 
last couple of what I believe are super quick questions, and then we'll, we'll move on. Uh, in your presentation, you mentioned the multiple attempts uh, at contacting a household to ensure participation. For the most part, it's digital first, but there's some households who will get this, the paper form first. Who will get the paper form first? Um, those people in areas that data from the American Community Survey from the FCC have told us have low internet connectivity. Uh, and those areas that our demographic data from other surveys tell us because of their age or and generally, age is one of the determining characteristics, like if it's a senior village area, they will have less propensity to use the internet. They will, so, that 20% will get the, so, so in the, the first mailing a questionnaire. So will the picture of that or maps of that be available to us to help inform our outreach? Not yet, because we're still but, defining that. But prior to prior the to, forms and postcards yes. arriving. Yes, okay, great. Number one, number two, um, if non-English, non-Spanish speaking households want a paper form, will one be provided in their language of choice and how can they request it? Uh, we will not be providing paper forms in other than English and Spanish. So the options for non-English, non-Spanish speaking households is what? Telephone. Uh, working with a with a translator into an English form or the internet. All right, that's a whole another session we can be having. Okay. But I wanted to get that uh, on the record. And then the last item, I guess, is more of a request than anything else. Uh, aside from the security, privacy elements of uh, the digital elements of the census here, we've made reference to misinformation that we will certainly be up against as you're trying to communicate important information at a critical time. Uh, I assume that's an opportunity for the Bureau and the state to coordinate and collaborate on how we um, counter misinformation. Yes, that is an opportunity for us to collaborate with the state. In addition to that, we are working with some of the private sector um, Electron, uh, organizations in that space to develop strategies to counteract misinformation. Uh, we're working with Microsoft. They have a program to work with corporate and government um, industry participants to counteract that information. We're working with some of the other major um, private sector players also to try to counter that. Plus, YNR, our contractor, has as part of their mission a, a counter misinformation strategy in terms of looking at the dark web, looking at information on the web. Dennis and I were just sharing some frightening information put out by a, a neo-Nazi organization in terms of misinformation on, and we're already, that one has already been escalated up to our legal people at Census and came out, we saw it last week and it was immediately sent up there and, and then we reach over to enforcement branches of government to ask them to step in and enforce where it steps across the law. Right. And all the more reason for our outreach team closer to the ground level identify the most trusted, respected voices on good information to uh, all residents. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fontenot. I know it's been a long day and you are on the schedule this uh, evening, but uh, we appreciate you being here, sharing the information that you have. We look forward to a follow-up, both through your California staff uh, and when appropriate to you directly. Yeah, directly. Thank you very much. Right. I appreciate thank you. appreciate your efforts and, and the fact that you care that you and us together do a great census and a good high-quality census. All right. Thank you. Let's uh, return then to the previous agenda item. We had Q&A for the sector outreach update pending uh, questions, comments on the sector outreach update. Now's the time. <laughs> Lisa. Sorry. So uh, the, the question was about um, Intel. How are we going to ensure that people experiencing homelessness or housing instability or living in unconventional housing are going to be counted? What I wanted to acknowledge is I've been talking with Marcy and David and, and Casey from Alameda and Jesus um, and just really 
putting our thoughts together. There's a lot of opportunities. There isn't a statewide alliance on homelessness. However, there's a lot of locally connected, regionally organized opportunity for us to connect up the dot statewide. There's continuums of care in a lot of your communities. And so we're very interested in been talking to the uh, Didas and her team as well in identifying um, different ways to connect people into the, the local workshops right now, but also if there are more, if there is more funding available, identifying a way to really connect those resources in a more meaningful way um, to ensure an, uh, a complete count. And we know, and Carolyn acknowledged, um, you know, the point in time virtually across the state, homelessness is increasing. And even not more disturbing, but also disturbing is housing instability um, and pe people just because of their living in poverty are falling into homelessness now. So, um, you know, we're, we're experiencing unprecedented uh, change, even with great work happening in California. And um, we're very committed to working with the Complete Count folks, uh, with all of you and um, the, the sector partners and those of you that are already working locally and regionally to connect these dots and make sure that the folks that are, uh, you know, are the trusted messengers, are providing service, are um, working in community, are experiencing homelessness already, have the opportunity to be part of the solution. Other questions, comments? I just wanted to repeat my question, <laughs> my request to Marcy Kaplan, if she could elaborate a bit more on the strategy with the labor unions. Thank you. Thank you. And that's, um, I've been in ongoing conversations with the California Labor Fed and some local union in LA County also, in addition, plugging in the Central Labor Councils with um, our regional program staff and getting them plugged into local count committee, local complete count committees. Um, and also exploring ways, um, given the different types of unions, um, you know, which ones are serving more hard to count, but also how does that cross over into our other sectors? So for example, with nurses um, in the health sector and um, with all the work we're doing in schools, or for, and in addition, um, public um, employee unions, for example, in LA County, a local SEIU had put, um, put the, in their MOU that they were gonna be working on census. So how to take some of these examples of what's happening regionally um, and working together with these regional conveners like the Central Labor Councils um, to identify more of what that strategy will look like. So I, I would really enjoy talking with you more about um, other you know suggested um, unions to focus on or um, regions within the state as well. Other questions, comments? Thank you for this update. And uh, as with the other elements of outreach to be continued, keep up the good work. And uh, we'll be seeing you at a lot of these uh, workshops over the next couple of months. All right. Uh, that, members of the committee, concludes the items noticed on our agenda. We do have public comment here before we adjourn an opportunity for members of the public to bring forward questions or comments to the committee for our consideration. We have at last count 11 public comment cards from folks that are present and additional comments submitted electronically. So uh, if we can uh, maybe call them by name, have folks come to the microphone that you see out front and uh, try to limit to about two minutes per person, and uh, while, while they begin to queue up, uh, if we can remind them how anybody can submit written comments at any time by emailing who? Okay. <laughs> All right, if I could have you line up on either side of the microphone as we call your name. Those who are providing public comment in the room. If you submitted a card for public comment, uh, go ahead and come on up. Instead of calling you, just come on up. Yep. Form a line, but please introduce yourself uh, as you begin. And I believe there's clocks right by the microphones uh, that are time for two minutes. Please get in line and then identify yourself. You'll have two minutes to speak. Thank you. All right. In front of the mics. Good afternoon, my name is Doritha williams Florna. I'm, I'm with the California Black Health Network, and I appreciate the sentiments of the committee regarding the undercount of African Americans across the state. As a matter of fact, PBS NewsHour did a report just a few hours ago that stressed the importance of 
um, counting blacks and Latinos and listed California in particular as a city that, as a, a state where the, the likelihood or risk of um, undercounting African Americans is quite high. And so I worry about the limited outreach um, to the black community through one organization. The California Black Health Network has conducted statewide outreach act activities across the state with multiple organizations across um, several counties. And we know for a fact that trust is an issue and access is also influenced by trust. And we believe that a multi-sector, multi-organization, multi-pronged approach is the better strategy to use. And we um, appreciate the opportunity to work with you in designing that type of strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please, over here. We'll just alternate back and forth. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mike Kutel, and I am representing the uh, ACBO for Region 1, which is Sacramento Region Community Foundation. We have one of their staff here present as well. Um, and so thank you for providing us uh, time to speak with the Complete Count Committee today. Uh, we appreciate the hard work and the staff and of the Complete Count Committee and Census Office that are dedicated to um, such a com complex and vital effort. And so uh, we would like to provide some feedback on a few key items, uh, the first being the updated language access plan. Uh, we appreciate and fully support the revised guidelines for the state language access plan. Um, our CBOs provide services, education, and leadership uh, within the hard to count communities each and every day, and they are truly the experts in providing language access for many of the HTCs. And we would be foolish to limit our outreach with standardized, onerous requirements for all of our diverse communities and community needs. Such requirements are not only costly, uh, they do not actually get us closer to a complete count. The new plan allows contractors and CBO partners the ability to provide outreach strategies and activities that are tailored for each community with the most appropriate and successful in-language outreach strategies and tactics. Number two is on the state requirements. Uh, this is a very complex campaign. And moreover, it's the first time the state has uh, taken on such an effort. We understand requirements are being developed and would like to stress that any new requirements for contractors be uh, streamlined and not overtly onerous. Uh, contractors and partners need time to understand and address the requirements in a thoughtful manner, especially considering um, budgetary impacts. With ample time to discuss and integrate uh, community partner feedback, we are more likely to achieve our goals and uh, for a complete count. Uh, for the implementation planning workshops, uh, workshops need to, to provide a clear overview of roles, requirements, and the state's strategic plan on key actions, including timing of meetings, trainings, and other activities. And so, unfortunately, we couldn't get through all of this, but again, thank you for um, allowing us time to provide our thoughts and looking forward to working with everyone for a complete count. Thank you. Can she submit the rest of her comments for the record? Yes. Yes. Uh, this is the one. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Judy Robinson, the 2020 Census Manager for Sacramento County. Thank you all for the uh, hours and your dedication um, on this important project. So I have a combination of questions and some comments. Um, and Mike, who I apologize if I didn't hear this, but one of the concerns expressed by the Sacramento Region Community Foundation is the necessity to have a, turn, a, a very quick, swift turnaround on uh, payment of invoices after deliverables have been made. CBOs cannot cover um, and, and leverage their own funds in making those payments. So I just really wanted to reiterate that it was discussed earlier. Um, so some of the questions is, we haven't heard an update of the LUCA appeal process. I know letters were sent from around the country on how onerous the proposed appeal system uh, process was. Recommendations were to go back and to adopt the 2010 appeal process, but we've not heard anything from that. So that's, that's point one. Um, two is, what is the state's position going to be on not canvassing, given some of the comments that were made earlier today, particularly since it's in our strategic plans? Um, we would like to suggest a help desk, a chat bot, something that gets built into the media and marketing contracts, so that that is something that the uh, questions, answers can be put on kiosks, can be put on websites, 
same information gets disseminated across the state, it's consistent, it will especially help our rural communities that have no capacity to do this and prevent a lot of other duplication, misinformation, and, and so on. Also having that be digitally and supported by phone in at least um, 12 to 15 languages. And lastly, we would like to, uh, we're working very closely with uh, UNICERA in planning the June 17th, our Complete Count Committee, planning the um, IPWs, now that we've heard that enough today, we can use that acronym. Um, so you're all invited. I know there are ways to get around the Brown Act. And um, Secretary Badia, we would love to invite you to make some welcoming remarks on June 17th if you will accept this invitation. Okay, I will check my schedule. I think it's looking good, but let me confirm uh, in the next day or two. Perfect, thank you. Okay, thank you. And we're taking notes on all your other questions and suggestions. So, next speaker. Hello, my name is David Banuelos, and I'm a uh, U.S. Census Partnership Specialist here in Sacramento, one of my uh, teammates, uh, one of seven teammates. Uh, my question really comes from the community. Um, as I and we, as Partnership Specialists, engage with communities, they are asking for a simple marketing tool. Um, and when, uh, the, where the thought came from was the comment of the I Vote sticker. Where uh, What was being proposed is a maybe a very simple I Support 2020 census that every business can put in their window. So as you walk down a hard, a hard to count community, you go past the taqueria, you go past the bread store, each of which have this universal sign saying, we all support the census. Um, again, knowing that many of these hard to count communities need to hear this reference many, many times. So again, that trusted uh, local business owner may be that one entity that actually makes that influence. So more, sorry, idea. more of, a, more of a, a comment. Thank you. All right. Good idea for our clearinghouse. <laughs> Next speaker. Good afternoon. My name is Tony McAnally. I'm the executive director for the California Community Action Partnership Association. <laughs> Community Action was started in 1964 by President Lyndon Johnson as the federal government's method of combating poverty in America. We're funded through the CSBG grant process. But that being said, that puts us in a very unique opportunity. I represent 60 community action agencies across the state of California. We are mandated in every county in America to have a community action agency. We've been trying to engage with the Complete Count Census Group for quite some time and have, don't seem to be able to figure out how to make that happen. We are in the homes of 10,000 plus hard to count individuals every single day, 2.7 million a year but we don't seem to be able to figure out how to connect with you guys to help leverage that opportunity. And we would like to, so I'm here today to tell you that, that we really wanna be part of that to help make that happen. We work across the board with low-income families, which means we have folks that are veterans, we have folks that are experiencing homelessness, we have families that have young children, we have obviously low-income people across the board. We have LGBTQ populations, everybody that needs help is coming to community action agencies we wanna be a part of getting this word out. We're already a trusted messenger for 2.7 million households in the state of California, but we can't get anybody to engage with us. So please, we would like to do that. If I can get somebody to reach out to us to help us do that, we wanna be part of the solution to make well, this happen. Well, thank you for being here. We're establishing contact and we'll see you at a lot of these workshops coming up. All right, you have the schedule, please share. Next speaker. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Pamela Rodriguez, and um, as an immigrant from a low-income family, I just wanted to add a comment. Um, you know, having experienced the fear that we've been talking about throughout the whole day. Um, sorry, I don't mean to get emotional. I don't talk about this often, but um, I would just like to suggest that perhaps you guys could use uh, resources like Facebook and Google um, and Apple to be able to not only send a link to the questionnaire, but to really educate people on why this is so important. I think that that's, you know, the heart of everything is why should I put my family at risk, which I would probably never do unless I knew that this was for the greater good, right? And I think that that's what really needs to be put out there is, hey, listen, if you actually tell us who saw living in your house, and I shared this with Tom earlier, but I grew up in a house with 13 people. And would I ever actually tell you that? Probably not, right? But if I actually logged onto my Facebook and saw an not an infomercial, but maybe like a whiteboard uh, marker video that actually explains why it's so important, then maybe I would have actually clicked on the link and filled that out. So just wanted to share that. Great idea, thank you. Next speaker. Oh, okay. 
There we go. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Harjeet Singh. I'm an organizer with Jakara Movement, which is a community-based organization that works with and represents the Punjabi-speaking community throughout California. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank California Complete Count on their work with the Language Access Plan. They've taken input from various groups to update their plan, um, as well as to ensure that it's clear and allows for in-language outreach strategies for various communities. Um, Many community groups, including Jakar Movement, are excited to begin this work. I'm personally looking forward to the challenge of, from scratch, creating Punjabi resources, um, because Punjabi is one of the top 12 spoken languages in California. Based on our ongoing engagement, we have many outreach strategies that we know would be effective in hard to count communities. We just want to be ensured that the access plan allows us the flexibility and the support um, to implement these strategies so that we have the flexibility to use strategies that we know that would be effective. Additionally, a complete count will require coordination from the state and there need to be many opportunities for groups um, throughout California to be able to collaborate through these events, meetings, and workshops. Uh, I do not want to see a lot of the same um, things being repeated in various regions, so if we could have more collaboration, we can avoid a lot of duplication. And furthermore, as we eventually get into enumeration, I believe it's vital that we hire enumerators from various diverse language backgrounds and not just the three to five that are traditionally most represented. So if we do expect to have follow-up in these hard to count communities, we do need to have more enumer enumerators that speak many of these top 12 or even you know top 20 languages that we see. Thank you. Thank you very much. And on that last point, now we all get to be uh, recruiters to fill the various uh, jobs at the census. Good Next speaker. Uh, my name is Casey Farmer. I am the executive director of Alameda County's Complete Count Committee. And I just wanted to start by reiterating what Judy said from San Sacramento County, that a centralized easy help desk will really ensure that all Californians can get the answers that they need, as well as just really not provide the runaround. This is gonna be confusing enough. We need one centralized place to support all Californians. Secondarily, I'd like uh, continued clarification about what partnership really means. For example, it's exciting to see all the statewide partners and partners that will continue to be brought on, but what will they be doing and what does that mean for counties, what we do not need to be doing? What are their deliverables? How do those affect counties? And how uh, can counties learn about what those statewide outcomes are gonna be? I, I hope that's a large component of these upcoming implementation planning workshops. And we also can, uh, need additional clarification from the Census Bureau. What, what, how are we gonna create one song sheet that we're all singing from? And while I work very closely with our partnership team, it's still not clear what they're gonna own, what we're gonna own, what our CBO is gonna own, and we need that clarity of lanes, if you can use that analogy. And most importantly, I'd like to continue to emphasize the need to have a much more comprehensive plan than is what currently planned for counting people experiencing homelessness. And there are just significant gaps. While you've heard an extensive presentation, and we have before, about the operations plan for counting these populations, the new data is out in most counties, and in Alameda County, we have 8,022 people experiencing homelessness. So the Census Bureau needs to be cognizant of those numbers, how much they have risen since the last census, and how they have to factor in how many people it will require for us to do that, that tonsil, the targeted, non-sheltered, uh, outdoor locations. Um, our point in time count, having volunteered myself, required 650 volunteers to count those people. So we, it's, an, it's a numbers game and it requires a lot of preparation. And a lot of our folks don't access the services by, the way, by way of group quarters or service-based enumeration. Uh, additionally, you'll, you'll know that there's a lot of non-traditional housing, uh, commercial spaces where people live. For example, Ghost Ship in Oakland. I know for a fact that there are dozens of those types of living facilities that are commercial. They're not going to receive any census information because they don't have a residential address. So that's gonna take, they do not want people from the Census Bureau knocking on their doors. Um, so we need to get really, really specific 
and I continue to ask the state for that pressure on, on behalf of counties, on behalf of communities, on the Census Bureau to expand that plan because right now it's just not going to count everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much and we'll see you at the next workshop. Next speaker. Good afternoon. I'm Sam Reeve with Community Connect Labs. Community Connect Labs has been providing census technology to California counties for the past two years. We appreciate the state's funding for our census Q&A help desk chatbot and are continuing to expand its functionality to support multilingual question assistance and plan to make it available throughout the state. We believe that appropriate tech tools can be a force multiplier for good. The same technology used by businesses to motivate people to buy things can be used to motivate people to, to complete the census. Technology can help remove or lessen many of the barriers to participation discussed in this meeting today. We believe that we should leverage this technology to make it as easy as possible for individuals across the state to complete the census and have their specific questions answered by trusted messengers without having to scour cumbersome or daunting official census materials. Census outreach technology can be built for multiple languages, be easily scaled, and made available to all counties and nonprofits. It enables the state to achieve its goals of consistent messaging and reach into every region of the state while reaching individuals where they already are as well. Technology also enables counties and nonprofits to capture data, reduce duplicate data entry, and seamlessly integrate with the new SWORD API that the state created, ensuring accountability across organizations. We've spoken to counties and nonprofits throughout California. They tell us that these multilingual text tools that answer people's questions can automate reminders and nudges to respond to the census without boots on the ground. These tools are needed. As the leader in technology and innovation, we hope that the state will continue to make tech tools available throughout California. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I believe that's all the uh, requests for public comment of folks who are here in person. We do have that have been submitted online. Should we do a summary of those, or how would you like to do this? Well, I do have I do have two anonymous ones. Okay. Comments. Let's read them into the record. And then one who dropped and she had to leave. I'll read hers first. Esperanza Guevara from Chirla and Census Policy Advocacy Network. Chirla, on behalf of CPAN, believes that the language and communication access plans lockup reliance on IPWs to identify gaps means that IPWs will need to be truly inclusive of all communities. To ensure this inclusive inclusivity, we recommend IPWs be widely advertised to stakeholders. IPWs include relevant contractors. Three, the entire IPW should be open to stakeholders and the public at large. And four, written notes from IPWs, including draft gap analysis, should be publicly posted. So that's her comment. The first um, anonymous comment is, I would like to see a collaboration with the big four who have access to immense client data and reach almost all HTC populations. Tech companies, including Facebook, okay, <laughs> sorry, who have access to immense data client and reach almost all HTC populations to reach the ATC, HTC. To in today's world, a viral marketing campaign is vital to reach these communities. Has a partnership with such companies started through or been thought about? If so, what's the status of those conversations? And finally, the third anonymous one. When funds are allocated to ACBOs, ACBO will allocate these dollar amounts to their subcontractors. Do you as RPMs, specifically in Region 9, Orange County, have or know of any oversight plan in place to keep track of how those dollar amounts being used by subcontractors, outreach materials, canvassers, et cetera? If yes, could you elaborate the plan? If no, will there be one? Those are the ones in the room, and I will, um, the questions should go really quickly. Can someone share the efforts, plans for census outreach to the African, uh, African American community? especially since this hard to reach population is historically undercounted. Two, how are we working with service providers and agencies in the homeless, houseless community to reach this particular demographic that is also hard to reach? Question three, California should also share with other states any detailed confidentiality information. Texas, Arizona, and Florida 
Latino communities would greatly benefit from it. Four, has anyone received money from the CCC office or the outreach contract? Five, when can we expect to see plans from statewide partners and how they plan to integrate services into counties? Or when are the most, uh, and when are, or when are most of their strategic plans due? Six, I am with the Chinese media organization. I saw that the media buy scheduled for September 2019. Will the advertising media buy be handled by the contractors or is it done by Census California 2020 internally? Seven, to clarify, the Region 9 IPW is in the Orange or Anaheim County Office Building, or is it at the Orange or Anaheim County Office Building? The information that was shared with us shows the location is Anaheim, but the information provided in the slide in this presentation shows Orange. When is the soonest that the, number eight, when is the soonest that the indigenous language materials will be available for outreach efforts? Also, for Community Co Connect Labs, which tools from their five tools will be available for use? Number nine, if someone wanted to volunteer for outreach or other efforts on behalf of Census 2020, how would you advise them who should they contact? Number 10, how are the locations determined for the various implementation workshops? The only IPW in my county, Orange, is located at a government office and I am concerned for some community members who are wary or distrustful of government won't attend for this reason. Number 11, has anyone contacted CalVet as a possible CBO partner for the 2020 Census Project? Number 12, when will the CC office send out checks for the first two deliverables? 13, this was directed at Ms. Brown Wilson. Will the data of HTC population by block level be available on SWORD? It would be great to have that information available in the platform. 14, at Ms. Katagi. It would be great to have members of the committee provide an update to the education sector calls. Thank you for looking into that. 15. What other follow-up actions are being planned for the new construction program? Is this one person? No, these are all the questions gathered from the chat. So she's on question 15, so these are 15 yeah. different people. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> seated in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> question 15. What other follow-up actions are being planned for the new construction program? Is an extended deadline being considered? Emails and physical letters are great, but I know that many tribal communities respond better to phone calls. And the final question, number 16. What are the deliverables, outreach plans, of the Latino Black Partners for the California Census? Beyond CBOs, who else are contractors for multi multicultural outreach in California? And that is all of the questions that we received via email and through the chat on the WebEx. Okay, so I don't think we're gonna be, or we're prepared to answer every single question in detail today, but we got a good sense of what's being uh, asked or suggested. Uh, Dita, Sradiana, if there's anything that really stands out that you want to respond to at this time, that'd be great. Uh, otherwise, I think maybe we can work together to get responses to all of them over the next 24 or 48 hours to the individuals who have been submitted and or on the website. How does that sound? That sounds great. Okay, yeah. anything stand out for no, I think purposes we're, of today? We're gonna debrief and make sure that our whole team um, can really uh, answer those questions and be sharing that. So um, I will comment just about the chat bot. We have uh, been working on one internally um, that we're hoping to share soon. Okay. I remember when it's just an informational question, there was a second one, I can't remember. But the statewide CBO strategic plans were also due on last Friday, Mar um, May 31st. 31st. So we have received all of them. There was another informational, I don't know, Laura. It's just <laughs> information, I can't remember. But we will work on these. Good, okay. And the schedule of the workshops that are coming up are all on the website, so Anaheim versus Orange or anything else, we'll the website information is the current accurate information. Yeah. Right, okay. Well, good, robust public comment, both in person and electronically. Members of the committee, is there anything else before we wrap it up for today? I have a closing comment. If, if not, then yes, and stay tuned for when the next meeting will be. 
Uh, we have a tentative date, but it's not set and it certainly has not been noticed. Uh, Ditas, anything in closing? So just a, a closing comment, I wanna thank the chair and all the committee members for really hanging in here. I found this to be a really useful um, meeting and I'm really looking forward um, to the work we have ahead. I wanted to just make a comment to my staff and thank them for their support. I wanna lay it out there just in the terms of numbers that we have over 150 contracts that we are doing to get the dollars out. So, and we only have two contract people working on that. So, so just as we think about why are we doing stuff statewide and how we do a consortium to work on some of those gaps, that some of our limitation is if we keep adding tens and twenties of other contracts, it gets a little bit unwieldy. But my staff is here to work through it and work with all of you uh, to make sure the dollars get out there quickly uh, and they're accountable and that we, you know, partner to get a complete count. So thank you. All right. And I, in two, in closing, will want to thank you and your entire team, uh, not just for your work here today, uh, but for the great foundation that you've laid over the last, uh, well, more than a year. Uh, I want to acknowledge my staff, um, Lizette's up front, Lizette Mata and Sam and the rest of the team for uh, kind of, I think, fitting in seamlessly in a uh, getting things ready for today's meeting and beyond. I won't reiterate everything that's been said repeatedly today. The challenges are great. The stakes are even higher. That's why we'll, we're here and it'll take all of us uh, and our extensive networks to make sure we count every Californian in 2020. So until we meet again and at workshops in between, thank you all very much. Eaters.